Um, first of all, welcome everybody to our January 26th commission meeting. It's uh, second one of the year already. We're almost through the end of January, which is hard to believe. Um, and uh, congratulations to our hometown Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It was an exciting weekend. It was fun to watch and fun to be a part of the excitement. So anyway, uh, we'll start a serious meeting with just that. Um, before we get going with the meeting, we have one of our commissioners who is, is not feeling good, is at home, uh, and, and would like to participate. And so we as a commission here have to take some action. And I'll just turn that over to Jewel to give a brief explanation for, the re for, our, for our residents' sake. Um, so as everyone is aware, this is a sunshine meeting, and under normal circumstances, um, those participating in the meeting must be physically present. However, the law does recognize um, limited exceptions uh, for appearance remotely, such as Commissioner Seal is proposing today. What needs to be done here is for those of you, we have a quorum physically present, so what this board needs to do is to make a determination that circumstances exist that warrant Commissioner Seal appearing remotely today. And, and without going into details, Commissioner Eggers, I think that you've already described what those circumstances would be. So again, the county commission today would be taking a vote to determine that there are exigent circumstances that warrant Commissioner Seal appearing remotely. And I do recommend uh, that if you get a motion and second that you open it up for citizen comment before you vote. Okay. Okay. I second the finding of good cause okay, to allow Commissioner, Commissioner Seal to appear virtually. Okay, Commissioner Long made the motion, Commissioner Flowers uh, seconded it, and uh, w uh, I'm assuming we have no comments here on the dais. If we do, please raise your hands. And we'll go to the public. Um, is there anybody in the audience here who would like to comment on whether, um, any comments about Commissioner Seal uh, appearing remotely for this meeting and participating and voting? I'm just giving a few minutes in case there's anybody in the other room that had any comments. But I'm not seeing or hearing any. Um, and uh, could we check online as well, please? At this time, if there is any member of the public who wishes to comment on Commissioner Seal appearing virtually for this meeting, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And uh, Mr. Chair, it does appear that we do have one individual who wishes to comment on this. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Mr. David Waddell. Uh, Mr. Waddell, um, when you are muted, if you could please state and spell your name and state your address for the record, you will have three minutes to speak, sir. Honorable Chair, Commissioners, County Staff, County Administrator Burton, and all the people of Pinellas County, God bless us. I uh, completely support Karen Seal being able to appear remotely and uh, continue to help guide us. Um, she's been an inspiration to all of us and uh, let's all keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Tom, did you wanna come forward, please? Yep. Somebody that was in the other room came forward. Please come forward, state your name and address. You've got three minutes, Tom. Yeah. Uh, Tom Rask, Unincorporated Pinellas County. So I haven't been here since, uh, um, I don't know if you can remove your mask while talking. Go ahead, okay. while you're there. Um, I don't oppose um, the uh, Commissioner Seals at remote attendance, but the issue here is that um, the, the governor said that er, uh, that you could do this, but he referenced a uh, attorney general opinion from Ashley Moody that said that um, if there is, and I'm paraphrasing here, if there is legal authority to do that, she didn't cite any legal authority. The count, the commission, sorry, the governor didn't either. Um, the governor's approach through COVID has been that when he has specific authority, he finds it in chapter 252. And he points to the exact subsection of the subsection where he finds the authority. When he doesn't have it, he points to chapter 252, all 26,000 words of it, and says the authority's in there. So my concern here is that decisions by 
uh, public agencies are later going to get thrown out. Um, I don't know if there are any court cases right now, but I noticed there's this tap dance going on about um, the powers that the governor has given public agencies during this pandemic. And that's the concern I wanted to put into the public record, and I'll be putting other concerns into the public record later. It's, it's very important that any decisions you make aren't later overturned by a court of law on the basis that uh, there was no legal authority. I, I think, let me just add, I think that the legislature should have given the governor the authority to do these kinds of things, but I can't find that the legislature did. If, if you can find it, tell me where you find it in Chapter 252, Florida Statutes. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have any additional comments, Jewel? Um, the, only, the only thing I would add is that this is um, the action that you all are proposing to take. What I would say is it's not, um, it's really not related to the powers that the counties or the state have under 252. It really is not related to the pandemic, but for the fact that there's heightened sensitivity over people that feel ill <laughs> and the possibility that they could have the virus. Um, so this really is the same action that this county commission has taken in the past when there have been commissioners with health issues. So the only thing I would say is that this really isn't related to your powers under 252. This is a more general legal analysis under Sunshine Law. And again, not so much related to the pandemic, but for the heightened sensitivity that exists in the community in regard to folks that have flu-like symptoms. Okay, thank you, Jewel. Any uh, other comments here? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. You are welcome to attend and participate and vote as normal. So, um, and just for the for any, everybody's information, the state of emergency uh, will be, we're gonna have a couple of presentations here shortly. Uh, it will follow that. Um, and then a citizens to be heard will be immediately after that. So just in case you are on the line um, or whatever. So I just want to make sure everybody was aware of that. And um, let's see, I'll go ahead and do the proclamation for human trafficking. Um, oh gosh, thank you. I'm gonna start over. Um, we're gonna do an invocation first and we're gonna do the pledge second and then we'll start where I was. So. Um, if Bill, uh, if Bill Asasso from New Path Community Church in Lailman could come forward with our invocation. Thank you. And, and then Janet Long will lead us in the pledge. <clears throat> okay, let's pray. God, thank you for this beautiful county that we live in, best one in the country. Thank you for the leaders that you've appointed over us. Sometimes it's hard to govern, hard to make the right choices, right decisions. So God, please give them your wisdom today, your direction, your guidance as they serve all of us. And give everybody impacted by these decisions a great peace tonight that our county is gonna be better off tonight than it was this morning because of what happened in this room. You can help us with that and we're asking in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America All right, well first we're gonna talk about um, human trafficking and this is a proclamation that's gonna be given to several folks here shortly. Um, clearly one of the things that is just probably one of the most horrendous things that permeates our community here, our state, around the country, and clearly around the world in many different forms. And uh, this commission is always 
been very upfront and supportive of any of the proclamations that support this. This time of the year is an opportunity to highlight something that goes on year round. And, um, and so much so that, you know, it goes on and we don't even know what's going on. Uh, the, the, the activities, obviously, but also the efforts to combat those activities. Um, and so, uh, but today we're just going to give some attention to it uh, uh, with the uh, Super Bowl around the corner. And one of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the ugly part of that is that around Super Bowls, this tends to raise its ugliness a little bit as well. Um, but so with that, um, I'm going to have first, if uh, Paul Valente, uh, the director of our Office of Human Rights, and Doug Templeton, who's our chief investigator for Pinellas County Consumer Protection, if they could come forward, and then I'm going to read this proclamation that probably does a better job of explaining really the, 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 the situation that faces us daily. It is far too easy to come on up, gentlemen. It is far too easy to believe slavery to be an incident of bygone eras instead of today's reality for millions of people across the world. The United Nations Global Report on Trafficking of Persons for 2018 reports that human trafficking has increased 38% since the United Nations first started collecting and reporting such data in 2007. It is well documented that, that the cities which host the Super Bowl see a marked increase in human trafficking activity leading into Super Bowl Sunday, almost all of which <coughs> shamefully relates to trafficking for sexual exploitation. The city of Tampa's hosting of Super Bowl 55 on set Sunday, February 7th this year, obliges the entire Tampa Bay region to exercise an even greater awareness of human trafficking to help guard against trafficking activity. Consequently, many victims of human trafficking are trafficked for the purpose of being forced into unspeakable acts of sexual abuse. Florida consistently ranks as one of the top states to receive calls and tips through the National Human Trafficking Hotline and victim of human trafficking in Florida are trafficked from all corners of the world, including China, Thailand, Vietnam, Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica, and Micronesia. Micronesia. In, in March of 2016, Pinellas County's Board of County Commissioners enacted its own anti-human trafficking ordinance to help combat, the, combat this pernicious evil. In 2019, the state of Florida enacted Chapter 2019-152, an act relating to human trafficking to likewise address the evil of human trafficking through the state of Florida. Pinellas County Com Consumer Protection continues to inspect adult use establishments, massage establishments, and specialty salons performing nail services under the ordinance to ensure they comply with the ordinance's notice and posting requirements to provide information and hope to those who may be victims of human trafficking. In 2020, Pinellas County Human Services became a member of the newly formed Regional Tampa Bay Human Trafficking Task Force, which focuses on education, rescue, and enforcement. And now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that January 21st be recognized in, as Human Trafficking Awareness Month. We encourage all Pinellas County residents to join us in the fight against human trafficking by reporting concerns to the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office or other law enforcement or to the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 188-373-7888. And so I'll ask Paul, I'm going to give him the proclamation. If we'll come forward. Commissioner, how are you? Good, good to see you. Let me put my mask on while we do take some pictures here. Sure. Come on up. Can join us as well. You can hold it. I certainly will, sir. Thank you. So, Paul, and you, you and Doug, want to say a couple words, please. First of all, I'd like to thank the board for their support and the continued support. Just like to say thank you to the board for their continued support. I'd also like to thank the citizens and the public uh, for their continued vigilance, um, as this is a community-based issue that we can't solve without them. So um, 
you know, with the attention that's on the Super Bowl and leading up to that uh, Human Trafficking Awareness Month, um, it's important to keep vigilant about this issue because it is a, a year-round problem that we need to look into, we need to address. Um, so we ask that public um, be aware of the indicators for human trafficking, make sure you know the resources that are out there, um, the different organizations that can assist victims, as well as um, know where to be able to report violations of this so that law enforcement can investigate. Mr. Chair, uh, honorable members, um, we, we appreciate your attention to this most tragic issue and your support of this and other human rights efforts in Pinellas County. It truly means a lot for our office. I want to commend my colleagues from Consumer Prote Protection for their work and, of course, partners in the law enforcement community who are really on the front lines of um, saving people from the tragedy that is human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Appreciate it. I um, also wanted to um, invite uh, Pastor Bill Lasasso from the uh, Florida Dream Center forward, and um, I'm going to present this uh, proclamation to him as well, and then I'm going to give him a few minutes to, to say a few words. Whoop. Let me do this backwards. So come on over here first, and we'll, we'll do this. You hold it. Let me mask up. Barbara. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner. Couldn't see it. Yeah, it's just okay. I'll open it up. Appreciate it. A few words. Thank you. In the year 2020, we had 88 contacts from around the state and around the country about survivors that needed help. We have 30 in our program right now in Pinellas County. Didn't all come from Pinellas County. We have 11 waiting. Our survivors range in age from six years old to 56 years old. One girl was trafficked since before she was one. This means men are paying to hurt women, children, and babies. We have trauma-informed care, of course, wraparound services, including food, clothes, job searches, housing placements. We even have to teach them life skills, though. How do you write a check? How do you pay the rent? How do you cook? And survival skills. What are you going to do when you walk out that door tomorrow and you see a man that's hurt you? What are you going to do? Health and wellness. We have to train them how to eat, how to do exercise, things like that. Therapeutic classes that are top-notch, even for families that have been impacted by human trafficking. We're flying one girl to California in about a month to have her face rebuilt. And, you know, rescue is the first step, and it's fabulous. It must happen. But after that, guys, they're not free. They're hopeless. They have no skills, no training, no education, no support generally from family or anybody else. So some of our goals include suicide prevention, drug relapse prevention, run, running back to the bad guy prevention, all the way the other end of the spectrum, successful, independent living. And man, that, that's a beautiful thing. When we give presentations on human trafficking, they're not just awareness and statistics and demographics. They're personal, intensely, painfully, and sometimes wonderfully personal. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the things that you do and your organization does every day. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and then finally, I'd like to have uh, Major Patterson come up and uh, accept the proclamation as well and uh, say just a couple of, of, of words. She, she will be giving a, a presentation here shortly um, uh, and, we'll, and in a minute, but I just wanted to give her the proclamation as well. Major. Sir. Nice to see you. It is nice to see you as well. Thank you. Barbara. Yours? Thank you, sir. Yes, yes, a few words. Um, this I'm isn't right. the presentation yet. This okay. is just if you wanted to say anything, or do you want to wait till we do the presentation? Um, I can actually wait until okay, we do that's the presentation. Fine. Thank you. We'll see you right back up here in a few minutes. Okay. Okay, um, uh, Major Major Patterson will be back up shortly. Uh, Doug uh, Templeton, if you'll come forward um, and do a, a, just a short introduction uh, for, for the major. Uh, and then follow, uh, following that presentation, uh, Teresa Hibbard is here also, and she would like to make a few comments 
uh, to us this, this afternoon. So with that, uh, Doug, come on up. Microphone is yours and thanks, Jay. Good afternoon, commissioners. I previously provided you with an update at the November 12th meeting on consumer protection's role in our efforts as it pertains to the human trafficking public awareness signed ordinance. Um, since that time, we've been working with marketing communications to raise awareness of the potential for increased human, in human trafficking activity in the Tampa Bay area ahead of and during the Super Bowl events. The communications being utilized combine information from the local task force with resources from the Department of Homeland Security's Blue Campaign. Blue Campaign is a national campaign dedicated to responding to human trafficking concerns to include educating the public, law enforcement, and industry partners to recognize the indicators of human trafficking and how to appropriately respond to those cases. We began leveraging these resources on National Human Trafficking Awareness Day, which was January 11th and they'll continue to be disseminated by marketing communications up to and including Super Bowl weekend through various outreach efforts. The public educational messages that have been posted thus far have resulted in 70,000 impressions or people who've seen the posts along with 2,000 engagements such as comments and shares. We have additional posts scheduled to go uh, out through the Super Bowl weekend. We've also released a press release yesterday as well. We shared graphic materials for social media and information about the new Human Trafficking Task Force app that you hear a little bit more about from uh, Major Patterson. Through the community outreach partners, we've shared bilingual information and materials for Spanish-speaking media and Vietnamese community partners as well. The Tampa Bay Human Trafficking Task Force that we're a member of has met twice since we last met in November and has finalized their plans for the Super Bowl. They're coordinating with several NGO partners on outreach and response efforts throughout the week leading up to Super Bowl. There's also been a large push for the use of the new app that the task force created uh, leading up to and during the event where law enforcement will be able to respond almost immediately to any uh, anonymous tips that come in through the app. Um, Major Patterson is here with St. Uh, excuse me, Major Patterson with St. Petersburg Police Department is here today. She'll be providing us with an update on the task force and what's happening in Pinellas. Um, at this time, staff recommends we stay the course and continue work with this task force and its numerous partners working on this effort that's going to continue on beyond the Super Bowl. Uh, the grant that the task force was awarded was a three-year grant. There's still several years left on that. Um, however, we do plan to keep an eye on the grant funding. We'll be sure to update the board for any funding consideration. Thank you. Major Patterson. Again, welcome, Major. It's good to have you here this afternoon and sharing a few things of, about what you're doing. So, again, welcome. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the proclamation as well. I'll get right started and go into the next slide. There you are. So I always like to explain what human trafficking is. Most of the time, people in the audience do have an idea, but just for some clarification, I usually go over the statute. So Florida State Statute 78706, it is the human trafficking statute. Human trafficking means the transporting, soliciting, recruiting, harboring, providing, and enticing, maintaining, or obtaining another person for the purpose of exploitation of that person. The legislature finds that human trafficking is a form of modern day slavery. Victims of human trafficking are young children, teenagers, and adults. The legislature finds that the victims of human trafficking are subjected to force, fraud, or coercion. The purpose of sexual exploitation or forced labor. Force, fraud, or coercion is not needed for a juvenile case. So these are some of the statistics that we have had, the task force. And the task force consists of local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies, as well as NGOs or service providers. But these are the statistics for just the law enforcement agencies. So sex trafficking, member agencies opened 107 new investigations. Member agencies reported 34 resulting arrests from those investigations. Member agencies also reported 79 potential victims involved in those investigations with 10 of the victims identified as 17 years of age or younger. There were seven new investigations 
and we identified 15 potential victims for labor trafficking. So this is the app that Doug spoke about. The Human Trafficking Task Force has a TIP 411 app, and it is exclusively for human trafficking. It is a way in which citizens can report human trafficking or anything that looks like human trafficking to the tip line anonymously. We have an administrator, which is me. I am the administrator of the tips. I receive them day, night, evening, and I answer them right away. Those tips are forwarded to the member agencies that are participating. If there is an agency that's not logged on or tip participating, that tip will go to their communications center, and then I forward the tip to the detective as well. We actually have the app there. It's for iPhones and for Androids. And let's see if I'm good at laser pointing. And there it is right there. So that's the app that Doug spoke about. We've had a lot of tips, and they've all been forwarded. So I really like that, and that all agencies have an opportunity to use that. This is the brochure that we have also put out for the task force. The front of the brochure, it talks about human trafficking as modern-day slavery and also has the National Human Trafficking Hotline on it with the number, and I'll repeat it, I know you guys have heard it, but I like to repeat that number as well, which is 1-888-373-7888. This is the information contained inside the brochure. It gives you a lot of service providers' numbers that can be easily accessed. Also, on the back, we also have the TIP411 app, and it explains how to actually do it or perform it. You text HTTF plus your tip and then that number on the bottom and then it comes directly to me and I answer it as soon as I possibly can. Non-governmental organizations, which is what I have been speaking about, are service providers. They are very important to us. Sailor Freedom partnered with us on the grant, but we have the Florida Dream Center created uh, Salvation Army and a lot of other organizations, approximately 15 that are part, a part of the task force. So community partners are pivotal to the success of law enforcement, proactive action against human trafficking. The NGOs directly partner with law enforcement to provide immediate on-scene services for victims of human trafficking. NGOs oftentimes provide wraparound care for the victims to include those services that Pastor Bill spoke about, trauma-informed counseling, case management, shelter housing needs, vocational skill training, medical and dental needs, and legal assistance and guidance. So we partnered with Sailor Freedom on a transportation training that was offered to HART. We provided every person that operates a bus in Tampa training on human trafficking. It took several months, but we got through every driver. We had a lot of positive feedback from that. So that's one of the activities that we partner with the service providers on, and it was very successful. So lastly, again, the human trafficking resources, Polaris, the phone number again, 1-888-373-7888. Also mentioned here is the blue campaign and the hotline, not hotline, but tax number for the, the fax, not fax number, website or email. email there you or, go, no, email website. for it. That's the website, I'm sorry. Somebody could have helped me out. Web but yeah, email for that. And lastly, my information, Natalie Patterson, phone numbers and email. Thank you. Does anybody, uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for being here and, and sharing what's going on. I, you know, it, we've seen this so much in our community. And I remember when I was in the legislature, Senator Dockery was a champion on this issue back in the 2000s. And we found we had a case in Treasure Island where there was a house. Remember you remember case. that case? Yes. Where pe the neighbors didn't know what was going on in the house right next door. It was basically a, a prison in this beautiful home on the island. And we see the stories about the major arrests where, you know, We'll have a major press conference with the rest of Johns that have been trying to connect online. And we're hearing about the resources available for recovery. I, I guess I'm looking for how, how do we stop its supply and demand? How do we get in front of it? How do we get to the demand part of it and get in front of that to stop the demand earlier, cut off that part of the whole chain? Um, otherwise, it seems like we're just continually chasing uh, an endless thing here. It feels like that, but the tip, the tip lines. 
calling in anything you see suspicious or not. If you don't do a tip line and you call a communication center, you ask for dispatch, they'll dispatch someone. If you're not asking for dispatch, they'll see, send someone. Human trafficking is a serious crime and people want to eradicate it. So if you see something, you call it in. You know, like what they say with drugs, you see something, say something. Same thing, you see something, say something. If it's suspicious, call it in. Have somebody look into it, investigate it. If you're not satisfied with it and some, it's still occurring, call it again, again, again and give the additional information. You have to call it in. You have to be proactive in that manner. Thank you. Commissioner Peters. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to mention this because um, uh, Commissioner Justice is correct. Um, when it was in Treasure Island, it was like a prison in a beautiful house. However, and correct me if I'm wrong, many, many women and girls, the way they're held now isn't in prison in a house. And what, the, um, what they're doing is they're, they're getting these girls addicted to opiates and heroin. And that's how they can control them, if I'm correct. I assume I'm yes. correct on this. So they can control these girls by getting them addicted to a drug and they have to have, they have to have that next drug. And so therefore they will do, and they're forced to do whatever they, their captor wants them to do because they don't have a choice. They're, they're addicted to these drugs and that's, that's how they control them. So, um, so when you're looking for signs, you also have to look for things like that. Um, someone who all of a sudden is doing drugs that may not have done drugs before. So it isn't necessarily a prison in a house. And I just think that's an important information to share for people that might be looking for signs. So, uh, officer, I'm sure you have more to add to that. Yes, ma'am, that is correct. That's a part of the coercion. You get somebody strung out or addicted to the narcotic, and they're gonna do what you ask them to do because they want that narcotic. It's hard for women to detox. It's hard for guys to detox. It's hard for people in general to detox off of those narcotics. So if you are holding someone or you're coercing someone into doing something for something for narcotics, they're gonna do it because they want that drug. Thank you, Commissioner Peters. Any, anybody else? Well, Major, thank you for your yeah, year-round effort. Uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. And, and for being a part of the task force that is elevating it just because of the Super Bowl, but you know, the importance of, of what we're talking about. But it's obviously a battle that you wage every day of the year. And thank you for, for all that you do. Really and thank you guys it. for having us. Yep. Have a, have a blessed day. You too, thank you. Uh, Teresa Hibbard, come on up. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Fellow commissioners and Administrator Burton. Thank you again for acknowledging January as National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. Thank you for the proclamation. Thank you for all that you have already put in place against this horrible crime um, against our most vulnerable people. And I thank you especially for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Teresa Hibbard. I live at 308 Druid Road West in Clearwater, and I've been a member of Pinellas County resident for over 30 years. Uh, January of 2019, as a public policy and administration student at St. Petersburg College, I was encouraged by my professor to attend a salon talk on human trafficking. And, you know, I knew about human trafficking, and I'm ashamed to admit, probably more so from the movie Taken, I had a perception of what it was going to be like. But when I attended the salon talk, I had no idea. My eyes were open, much as yours have been, and much as you've heard from our wonderful law enforcement officers, our non-government organizations, about how horrible this is. And it is a dark subject. It's an unpleasant one, and it's not easy to talk about, as you can tell. Um, so I committed to doing what I could to bringing it to people's attention. And I, again, thank you for what we're doing here in our, um, in our county towards it. Um, what I am here to ask you to do today is I am asking um, for your support to a collaborative and community-wide effort in the fight against this crime by establishing a Pinellas County Commission on Human Trafficking. I understand we have an amazing task force, and again, thank Chief Holloway for all his work. I'm thankful for our sheriff and for, again, our law enforcement and all of those who make their commitment to this. I want to partner with you. I'm not coming to you. I know you must get a million requests for people wanting and needing, and I am not asking for you to do all of this. 
I would like to partner, I would like to do whatever I can. And the re one of the reasons that I'm asking this is, as you know, um, as legislative leaders, as policymakers, you're the one that can affect the long-term changes in um, what could happen ar around human trafficking. It would also show our long-term commitment, again, to the eradication of human slavery in our county. Um, our task force is going to be great. We've seen a Clearwater task force come and go due to funding, um, and funding is a challenge. Again, a long-term commission will go alongside, will partner with, will be a collaborative effort. It also acknowledges in another way and elevates the credibility that you all have already established in your stance against human trafficking. Um, it's a proactive measure. You know, we were talking about the Super Bowl and we want to uh, make the Super Bowl. It's exciting. I mean, I think I read in the history that uh, hometown is, gets to play in our own stadium on a Super Bowl. And you know, there was a big press release yesterday about the excitement and the people coming into town. And it is excitement. And to talk about this in conjunction with that is hard. It's, it's a downer. But uh, I appreciate, again, you, you bringing this, uh, allowing us to talk about this. The other thing, um, we would not be starting a commission on human trafficking from scratch. Our neighboring communities to the north and to the east have established their own, so there are some uh, some things that are already in place. Uh, I know um, Pasco County established theirs six years ago, and um, Hillsborough County established theirs in 2019. They just started meeting in 2020. It would also just be a potential bridging for any, any gaps that may um, exist. The commission would act solely in an advisory capacity to the Board of County Commissioners, and the County Commission would retain the ultimate authority to decide on and govern any executed efforts on the matter of human trafficking. During previous meetings, many of you expressed an interest in taking a greater public stance against human trafficking, and so I am asking and I'm used to asking because I'm in fundraising for a full-time profession, but I am asking you to use your legislative powers and resources to help protect our most vulnerable citizens. You heard Pastor Lasasso say six to 56. The creation of this new commission on human trafficking would be in the best interest of the county and its citizens by serving to promote, protect, and improve the health, safety, and welfare for all the citizens of Pinellas County. Thank you again. I'm happy to entertain any questions that I might be able to yeah. answer. Okay, Commissioner Long. Thank you so much, Mrs. Hibbard, for that very eloquent ask. My question to you is, what does that look like in your mind, a commission on human trafficking? It it would look like, and again, I think it would be important to have a conversation and again, establish what it looks like for Pinellas County. We are our own distinct community and need to represent our community distinctively from Pasco and Hillsborough. I think it would make up a, a large sum of people represented from all over the community that, and all over the county to include um, law enforcement, uh, judicial, um, some of their NGOs, and they would create task forces. Um, for example, Hillsborough County, they chose to meet six times a year as a whole, but they identified four areas where they would like to um, put their efforts, and so those other four subcommittees meet on the off months. And I'm willing to do the work. The body, uh, the, the work has got to come from the people that are on this. This is not a, um, this, this commission would not be a, just to come and add this to your resume. This would be something where people are engaged and who want to work, who want to come alongside who want to be um, an extension of the, the work that you are already doing to help with this, um, to eradicate this. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, uh, anybody else with questions? Thank you uh, for coming forward. Thanks for your passion on, this, on the subject matter. And uh, clearly, we have a lot of partners that we're working with now, as you pointed out. And so I think to have a conversation in a workshop setting uh, about whether or not adding another element, and that sounds wonderful, it sounds great, but I just want to make sure we have Absolutely. all of those pieces and Absolutely. get their input on it, but just great. Thank you so very Thank much. Thank you so much for your consideration yeah. and for your uh -huh. time today. So, Bye -bye so but Mr. Chair, yes. huh? what would be our next step then? But I just said, I think we need to have a workshop on the topic and and see the, what, the par what partners we have now and what they're doing and the, the distinct role that this group would play. I mean, you, you want to have that distinct 
role that it plays within Pinellas County, as you said. It's, we're different than other counties, and so we want to make sure we fit it. Barry? If it's a pleasure of the commission, I could have staff do a, a staff report, look at um, what they're doing in Hillsborough and Pasco, and it bring to it at a workshop for discussion some ideas and thoughts regarding you know how to move forward. I think that's a great idea, and it clearly it'll be the Super Bowl will be in our rearview mirror, but it's like we said, it's a year-round thing, and it'll be here for years to come, so we need to start doing everything, well, continue doing everything that we're doing. So Thank you. And Thank again, you. I would be happy to participate in any way that you would find meaningful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. It. Okay. Um, we are going to move into the uh, local state of emergency. I know Barry's got some things he wants to present to us, and then we'll hear from the public after that. Uh, commissioners, I can't. Uh, if I can, uh, real quick, Paul Valente, uh, the director of Office of Human Rights, is going to be leaving us uh, for another position. And so, before he scooted out of here, I just wanted to take a moment to thank him for all the work that he's been doing. Um, I just recently found that out, and so um, I, I know he was going to be quiet while he was here, and it obviously was on a somber topic. But uh, did want to um, offer, you know, all of our thanks to him for everything that he's done on this and many, many other topics. Paul. <laughs> it better be a really good opportunity. We're going to miss you. Come on up. Mr. Chair, honorable commission members, um, it is. Let me assure you that. But this is, <laughs> and I appreciate that very much, uh, Administrator Burton. But um, I'm going to take privilege here to say how immensely satisfying it's been to be a civil rights practitioner in Pinellas County. This is a really special place in large measure because of the support, the work that my office has from you all by way of funding in support of what we do, as well as the human rights boards members. Some of uh, Commissioner Seal, who's uh, participating virtually as one of my board members, uh, some of our constitutional officers, as you know. And um, so I can't thank you enough. I, uh, you know, in this career, we have conversations with colleagues in many face jurisdictions where their work is anywhere from a valued to tolerated to viewed as a menace or an animus against. But here, that's never been the case. This is a, a, Pinellas County is a truly special place, so it was a bittersweet decision, but it does allow me to advance my career at the federal level, and so I felt I had to take it. Yeah. But my, my thanks to you for your commitment to the cause for which our office exists. Thank uh, you. Thank you for, uh, for the residents, for the service you've provided the residents of Pinellas County, and uh, we wish you best, best wishes in your, thank you. in your new endeavors. Appreciate um, that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Yes. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say congratulations, and we're going to miss you. Uh, you and your office have tackled uh, some of the hottest, most controversial at the time issues that we've faced as a commission since I've been on, and you and your team have done it with passion and professionalism, and uh, really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate that. Anybody Thank else? You. Okay. Well, best wishes again. Thank, Thank you. you. Talk to you soon. Thank Good you. luck. Thank yeah. you. With that, Commissioners, um, item number three is an extension of the local state of emergency to February the 5th. Um, I'll ask Dr. Cho to come up, provide a brief summary of uh, where we stand, some of our um, um, numbers, percent positivity, and, and give you a little uh, history on our trends. Um, and then we can kind of outline some of the recent uh, activities uh, regarding our vaccination program. Good afternoon. Hey, Dr. Cho, welcome. Um, starting off with some of the trends, um, we have seen a slight improvement when compared to the last week. Our uh, seven-day case count is at 366. Our seven-day percent positivity is at 7.1%, um, trending uh, at least in the last 10 days in the right direction. Uh, however, we're not still at the lower levels that we saw in the fall. In terms of our deaths, uh, we're at 1,255, 67% of which are coming for those older than 65, and 62% coming from our long-term care facilities. Uh, one of the other major factors that we do monitor, uh, it does include the hospital capacities, um, the bed capacity in ICU uh, is doing okay at 19%, 22%. However, we are still seeing a pretty significant amount of COVID-occupied uh, beds and um, uh, hospitalized individuals, as well as those in the ICU at 350 and 80 as of this morning. Um, we do have these weekly hospital calls. Uh, they um, 
are continuing to see um, a, a lot of volume within the hospital facilities staffing, especially in more of the specialized care units, uh, most notably in the ICU. Um, is a little bit of concern, a little bit of relief through um, travelers as well as um, uh, those um, uh, OPS um, overtime staff. Um, I, I know from an EMS perspective, and I, Dr. Jameson can probably speak on this a little bit better, they are continuing to see that kind of volume in terms of uh, ambulance transport as well. I can s stop there or I can uh, move on to the vaccine. Is there questions regarding our trends? Um, we can move on to the vaccination um, yeah. efforts. So you okay. start and then I'll, I'll chime in. Okay. Uh, so in terms of a vaccine efforts, uh, again, referring you to the Florida Department of Health webpage, they do have these county specific reports, something that I do watch daily. As of this morning, uh, as a community, we have done 63,916. Uh, so again, that is a collective effort of the works of the hospitals, the health clinics, uh, the health department, the, the fire paramedics, the, uh, the, um, among other groups. Uh, doing that, um, the the paramedic uh, uh, points of di dispension, uh, the pods have been going well, uh, with all four community sites uh, ongoing at this point. They're doing anywhere from two to two uh, 2,200 vaccines a day. Uh, so a huge effort on, on the on the work of those uh, fire paramedics. They're doing a, an amazing job, and uh, we appreciate their support and partnership. Um, in terms of the long-term care facilities, uh, the nursing home has been offered now um, in the third week, uh, third offering of the vaccines. So the nursing homes have been um, offered the vaccines for those uh, interested to both the residents and staff. Um, in terms of the ALF, uh, still a combined effort with the CVS um, Walgreens Federal Partnership as well as CDR Health. I think they did about 80 uh, of the long um, ALFs last week. And we're just getting confirmation that all of the ALFs have been offered and covered at this point, and I can I can uh, get you that information and get back to you. Um, the scheduler, uh, we have uh, um, working again with the county as well as um, uh, we uh, had a vendor with CDR uh, Health. Um, they there was obviously some issues on Saturday. Um, uh, the one of the problems was that the platform that they use nationally is a national program called Salesforce. Uh, there was some downtime even before it went live. Um, we have spoken to the vendor uh, over the weekend as well as today um, or, or yesterday um, and asked for a, a corrective action. Again, this is something that we don't want to see. Um, uh, but once they did go online, uh, again, a, little, a few hours uh, than, um, than what was intended, at, at, um, that the vaccines and the slots, the 8,000 slots were um, taken up in about 45 minutes. The continued challenge I see in terms of the vaccines is the supply issue, and it comes not necessarily at a state level, but at a manufacturer pharmaceutical level, at a federal level. From what it appears uh, here in Pinellas County, our share um, over the last two weeks, and, and, and probably uh, at least for a few more weeks, it looks like we're averaging about 8,000 to 10,000 vaccines here in, in Pinellas County. So when we get those, we do schedule them. Um, and move forward, but again, with a, a population uh, that meets that um, uh, that priority group of over 250,000, uh, at ten, even at 10,000 a week, that that uh, that would take an exorbitant amount of time. So, we're hopeful that the other uh, vaccines in the pipeline, the Johnson and Johnson, will ramp up and maybe get their EUA a little bit faster. I just got word from Dr. Jameson that he did hear that they may be uh, applying in the next few weeks for that EUA, um, just to, and and whatever. Uh, at a federal level, they're, they're doing with the Moderna and the Pfizer to ramp up any of the productions. But again, it becomes a supply issue um, for at a federal, state, as well as local levels. Let me stop there. And uh, uh, Dr. Cho, real quickly, if you could just talk a little bit about the, um, the first dose, second dose, and the priorities that you see unfolding in the next few weeks. Is it, certainly the efforts coming through the DOH and our partnership with you are now going to be entering that second dose stage. And I certainly would think that that would be a priority if that's all we had. And, and just, so if you could speak to that, please. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I know there's been some chatter about just doing the first dose right now. I know the governor is committed. And from a medical standpoint, uh, we do recommend that second dose. This is how it was studied. This is how, how those major studies for Pfizer and Moderna. Um, again, I, I think I spoke on this. The importance of that second dose is both from an efficacy level. You, it's more effective with the two doses. And beyond that, too, there is probably a, a better longevity. That we, I know there's a better longevity with the two doses. Um, so I, I think it's important. And I'd be 
concerned if we deviated from that. With that being said, uh, the main vaccines we've had here in Pinellas County has been Pfizer, um, which uh, the optimal time to get that second dose is 21 days out. Uh, the ACIP guidance, this is from the CDC, um, they do recommend you can, it has a range of uh, four days before that 21 days, uh, so day 17 to six weeks out, but um, ideally 21 days, and that's what we will be striving for uh, here in Pinellas as well as in the state of Florida. And again, just we're, we're, we're talking about the, the vaccines that are coming through the DOH in partnership with the county. Yes. Okay. And if I can add just a couple of things to, to the presentation. First, the, the issue that occurred last Saturday, there was communication. We were pushing communication out as, we, as soon as we heard that, but it wasn't from the vendor where people were going. That created a tremendous amount of frustration because people didn't know. They're going to the vendor's site but yet there was no information made available for them to see that there was a technical problem. And then, you know, then there was a time lag from when they restarted the system until when they could take the registrations. So that need, we, we're working on that. That needs to be fixed and the communication wasn't where it needed to be um, on the, at the vendor's portal where people were going. And, and we apologize for that, period. But the one thing that we're still having a problem with is we set this up as an interim measure to be able to run these pods through uh, from an overtime basis with our fire paramedics, leading to the other supply chains, just like you would get when you get a flu shot, Publix, your doctors, and other and other supply chains. But the states aren't not getting the vaccine to be able to distribute through those other supply chains, and it's creating a real a real problem because that now 95% of the people that come in to try to get that that spot for a, a vaccine are, it's, are not going to be happy because they're not going to get it. We have 8,000. 8,000 total doses for new slots this last time and a lot of people that wanted it. So there's a real issue there. We're working on a couple of alternatives. Is there a better way to just contact the registrations and have people filter back in to that? Looking at, but the real issue, which uh, Dr. Cho and I have to take a, a call with the state here at three o'clock, is to find out where they're at, the state is, with building out those other supply chains. Um, that would be a much more convenient way for people to get uh, the vaccine and, and sustainable over a long term. So we're, we're working on all those uh, things simultaneously to try to make the user experience better. Um, but there is a national supply issue and until we have a better idea of, of how that's going to be built out, there's, there's going to be challenges. Commissioner Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have a couple questions if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So first thing, it's kind of a statement, and Barry, I just want you to confirm it. I've been telling constituents when they call me or email me that if we get the supply, if we get a large supply, Pinellas County is prepared to execute and ensure that we can get through that. We have the ability to take those four pods and expand it and so forth. I just want to make that said clearly on television. We could for a period of time. Yes. Um, and, okay. but, and right now the fire paramedics have stepped up. I just want everybody to be aware that's not the optimal long-term solution. Right. Um, but yes. But we if could. we got 100,000 doses, we have the ability. I just want to make sure I'm telling the right people the right thing. If let's say we got 100,000 doses, we have the ability to ensure that everybody's going to get their vaccine. I don't know to what, how much we could ramp up. Okay. So I, I, I don't. If you told, if you said 20,000 or 30,000, I would feel more comfortable. When you okay. go to 100,000, I would have to refer back. Uh, to Dr. Jameson and our and, and okay. what the capacity is to deliver, because a, as you also know, we're 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 putting first shots in the arm, but we also have to plan out two you know three weeks from now to be able to do the second shot. While that capacity is used up, we won't be able to do first shots. So that so, leads me into my next question. So we're going to run in we're going to run Thank into you. some timing issues okay. as we start staggering these. So um, I, I have a couple of just general statements, but I, I again I, this stuff I just want people to hear. Um, so, Dr. Cho, you said this morning on the call um, that you feel it's important that we get that second shot, and I like the analogy you used with antibiotics. And just for the benefit of people watching, can you repeat sure. why it's so important to get the two shots versus what they're doing in other countries where they're only doing the one shot? Right. So, so again, going back to the studies, those vaccines haven't been studied beyond the t uh, with just one shot in terms of the long term. So uh, using that antibiotic analogy, you're, you guys are familiar with multi-drug resistant organisms. If you half treat an infection, you have that higher propensity or higher chance of developing resistance. 
Similarly, if you don't have, you have a less effective vaccine, what you do is put a strain on various um, variants and strains out there that you could be actually, um, there could be a, 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 what they call vaccine escape or in, 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 immunology ex, uh, escape, where you could be generating those um, uh, more of those strains that are resistant to the vaccine. So again, that it goes back to the importance of getting those two shots. Thank you. I appreciate that. That means a lot to me that you said that. So I have two other points, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Um, so the next one is when you, when you have your call, um, some of our poorest seniors live in the HUD uh, uh, housing, and, and some of these HUD housings have 80, 90 seniors, and they're not in the ALF, and they're not in a nursing home. So they're among our poorest seniors. Many of them are disabled and don't have the ability to, to be mobile. Um, and um, they don't have access to technology, so they have no way to get on a portal. And so is there any way we could talk to the governor that once they're done with the ALFs, we'll start looking at the HUD senior living facilities? Um, because they, they are probably the poorest of our seniors and they have no access. Right. Um, and so that's just kind of a comment I'd like you to take with you. Uh, keep it on the back of your mind, at least on your list. I'd appreciate it. And then the other one is if we can do uh, marketing because um, it's my understanding we've had, you know, someone under the age of 60 that had chest pains but was afraid to go to the hospital and didn't go. And by the time the ambulance got him there because he waited too long, he, he didn't make it. Um, same thing with appendicitis. People are waiting. Heart attacks are waiting. They're not going to the hospitals. Um, and, and unless you, and maybe Dr. Jameson knows better, um, I believe the hospitals have done a good job at isolating COVID patients. Um, but we still are having a problem with people being afraid to go to the hospital, and I'd like to see some of our marketing materials possibly um, talking about it's safe to go to the hospitals. If you feel chest pains, don't wait, don't, don't stay at home because people are dying at home or they're dying in the ambulance because they've waited too long. Um, so Dr. Jamison, if you're hearing that, if, if that's true, um, and I'm hearing that from the hospitals, if that's true, can we work on marketing campaigns so that we don't have people dying that don't have COVID, that they could, their lives could have been saved? Absolutely. So people have had some concern about going to hospitals for months now because of everything that's going on, you know, understandably so. Um, I would reassure folks that every hospital has strict uh, policies and procedures in place to try to uh, separate out those with COVID from regular patients. Uh, and, and I don't think there's any significant risk uh, that folks should defer care for a, you know, emergency condition. I think uh, we should be very clear about that. If you have an emergency medical condition, please uh, access the 911 system, seek care immediately, do not delay it. Um, we have unfortunately seen people make that decision with some poor outcomes. I know that the hospitals have messaged on that and, and I agree we should as well. Thank you. So if, if maybe Barbara could take a look at that and, and include in some of her messaging that if the hospitals are safe, they have great uh, cleaning preparations and it is safe to go to the hospital, it is safe to take an ambulance ride and, um, and please not to wait if they're sick. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for all you guys do. I really appreciate your work. Thank you. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, and I agree, Commissioner Peters. And I've seen, I don't know whether it was Bay Care or Tampa General, they're running those kind of advertisements as well. Uh, my question is about the, um, and I know you got to run to get on your call, the, the policy making and the authority, Pinellas gets 8,000 doses, and I, and I know it's anecdotal and it's more frustrating to hear it anecdotal from my cousin in Hillsborough County got this or that, or, but who is setting the policy? Is there any prioritization? You know, my neighbor lives in Alachua and they're doing it over 85 and then 75 to 85 or whatever it was. Is it a uniform policy statewide? Is it county by county by health departments? Who's making those decisions? Or am I just hearing anecdotal stories? So, uh, so what we do is we, um, we refer back to the executive order, um, the 65 plus healthcare workers, first responders, um, uh, long-term care residents, um, uh, long-term care residents. Uh, I, I have heard other counties that, um, doing a little bit differently, but, but largely it should still be focused on, on those priority areas. So um, with the amount that we're getting, the eight to 10,000 and, and generating 2,000 a day at these um, fire paramedic pod sites, that's where we're our primary right now, at least temporarily until other avenues are, are sort of set up, but uh, that's what we will be our, our primary distribution. Uh, and uh, I think there was a question as it pertains to the second dose. It does become an issue when we have to uh, go on to the second dose um, because then it may be tied
tied up for another two or three weeks while we're doing second doses. So I think it's more, it's important to look at other avenues, whether it's healthcare providers, um, uh, the publics, other pharmacies to, to doing it. Because ultimately, I think we want, we want to get to a place where we have multiple partners um, uh, administering and making access to the vaccines. I think that's the long-term goal, as, uh, whereas these pods, uh, although very efficient, it should be a, a short-term sort of solution for the time being. So when Pinellas receives 8,000 doses, we gave 8,000 first doses, and with the assumption that we're going to get 8,000 matching doses, in three weeks to line up with those people. Right. Yes. And so, and maybe you'll know after your call, if you can clear up, the, the White House made a statement about Florida not using half their doses. The governor pushed back on that this morning. Maybe we can get an answer on, it's, it's really, it's just communicating to our public about, so that we know, they know what to expect and they know what to believe and, uh, you know, and it, it's, it's uh, fast and furious out there as far as information spread. but. It, just being able to share the facts with folks um, is becoming a challenge these days. It, it is, and you know, when we first started this, you know, we saw a lot more doses going to hospitals, it was going to pharmacies, it was going to a variety of sources. So we were one of the distribution channels. Um, and, and, and I think that they run into supply issues nationally um, because like this week, the hospitals didn't get a resupply for first doses. They received the second dose uh, for their patients. So. Those are, those are challenges that I think everybody's trying to sort out. And then, and again, it could be after your call of, and however y'all want to figure out, but who is actually making the decision about who, in Pinellas County, what resident gets it before? What's a healthcare worker? What's a first responder? As we're talking about firefighters, EMS, law enforcement, where does that all break down? And again, I don't need an answer right now if you don't have one, but, um, just I, these are the questions I get asked every single day, all day long, and I don't have a good answer for them. Uh, sure. Uh, again, um, I have to refer back to the executive order, those, uh, the groups that I listed. Where it falls, in, and it's not necessarily defined right now because it's not included in the executive order, but those under the age of 65, those with chronic health conditions, those that are part of the essential workforce, including law enforcement, they would fall under 1B, and we're currently in 1A. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the comment about, you know, the marketing on getting treatment for other issues, I think, is really important. Um, the communication online to tell folks that, like, for, let, I'm just assuming this week that, that we, you know, we may get some additional uh, right. vaccines. We don't know yet. Um, and it's not the third week for the first sets of vaccines that we did. So we will be, we have a plan for those eight thousand or six thousand or whatever we get in but the following week when we get those six to eight thousand a comment online that says this week there will be no scheduling for new vaccines but rather most of what our what we're getting is going towards you know the second doses it's going to be really important to have that continuing weekly string right. of communication so that people don't get frustrated the other the last thing I, and the last thing I wanted to say was that and I heard your explanation this morning about the three hour delay today and that one I think um, just want to make it clear uh, it went down real early real quickly and um, apparently they could have been up in 15 to 20 minutes but they may have had additional problems so they wanted to ensure this is what I heard you say they wanted to ensure that when they did go back up live that we wouldn't have that problem again and unfortunately it took three hours to get to that certainty for them Right. to then go live and it did work at that time but again the communication right. to our folks who are just so frustrated they get lined up to do this on Saturday morning and then this happens and then they don't know what's going on they're trying and they try they probably tried up till two o'clock and they gave up and that is the exact moment that they should have been trying right. when it finally came live again so um, I and again I know they're working on some different aspects of this system but the communication has got to improve. Okay. It just has to, or we're just going to have continued problems, regardless of how we tweak the system. So, we completely agree, commissioners. Um, we were we were Barbara was communicating out. The president of the company was on the line with Lourdes. I mean, they were they were very hands on, and they were putting out information on our website, but not on the company website, where which is where people were at. Um, so, I we completely agree with your statement. The communication needs to occur, and we're going to make sure that happens. Any other? Questions uh, for
for. I know that Barry, you, and Dr. Cho have to go. Uh, Dr. Jamison, can you hang out? For, are you going to be in that call too? Uh, up to the, Mr. Burton. No, no. We, I think we can handle that. We're, we're just gonna... in case we have any other questions sure. that come up, that sure. would be great to have you here just for a little we'll bit longer. Yeah, and, and uh, Secretary, um, and at the, the end of this, the line, so, uh, yeah. at the end of this input, then Barry, we'll get that motion for continuing the state okay, of emergency. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I have uh, three folks in house that uh, would like to come forward and uh, make a, uh, take their three minutes. Um, and first on that list would be Dom Bowler. Hi, Don. Welcome. Hi. Okay. According to Florida Statute 382.008, a death certificate must be filed within five days after death prior to final disposition and in accordance with this chapter or adopted rules. Looking at the week of 1220 through 1226, the death certificate deadline would be 1231, or if weekends and holidays excluded, January 5th at the latest. Since January 5th, the death tally has increased six separate times and increases in five other previously reported weeks. One can conclude the daily reported death counts have been projections, not actual, especially considering Florida Statute 382.002 and the Florida Department of Health established death certificates are public record without cause of death. Cause of death becomes public information after 50 years from date of death and are considered confidential prior to that time. Cause of death may only be issued to the decedent's spouse, parent, and if of legal age, child, grandchild, sibling, or anyone who provides a will or other legal document, preventing any recourse to verify the provided statistics. Headlines declare more than 3 million deaths in 2020 given the additional deaths caused by COVID. According to the CDC, 2019 had 723.6 deaths per 100,000 with a population of 328,200,000, totaling 2,374,855 deaths. 2020 with a projected 9.7 per 1,000, population of 331,002,651. The projected death is 3,210,726 and 835,871 difference, yet COVID accounts for 393,000 increase by the end of the year, leaving approximately 442,871 additional deaths as a result of not the virus. Since January 1st, there have been 11,109 cases. Hospital beds at a daily average of 345 is 3% of positive cases, and ICU at a daily average of 75 is 0.68% of positive cases, rationalizing the likelihood of hospital overflow to be minimal, if not at all. Norway directly linked 13 deaths of individuals 80 years and older to, vac to the vaccine. Norwegian Medicine Agency found the number of incidents not alarming and in line with expectations, adding it is quite clear these have little risk with small exception for the frailest patients. If COVID is higher risk for complications and death in the frailest portion of frailest portion of the population for whom all measures and orders were implemented, how can a death be pedestaled on one hand yet disregarded on another? Thank you, Don. Um, Dr. Chris Slininger. I think I said it right, but if not, please correct it. Thank Welcome. you. Uh, Dr. Chris Slininger. Slininger. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm actually here uh, just on invitation um, uh, from actually Don Bowler. Um, I wanted to come today because I, I really, I, I kind of feel for you all. Uh, you've been uh, an incredible burden has been placed on your shoulders to manage something that you can't see, you can't identify, you can't point out, you can't track really, only by the statistics of those who are involved. And so, although I'm kind of standing here opposing this idea of an emergency order, I'm, I'm very much on your team in that I think that there's another side of this coin that can help strengthen this community, which is to strengthen the wellness, the health and wellness of the individual popula uh, the individuals within the population. And I was thinking about how to explain this. And, and you know, if you were commissioners in a rural county, and in this county there was a bear and it was attacking citizens and a couple citizens died, you can have one of two choices. You can say, hey, all citizens, until the bear dies on its own, we're going to lock you all up, uh, stay in your houses, and you will be safe. And you probably will. But you're also shutting down everything. If instead you take that population, you say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make sure you're all armed, well-trained, 
and identify a bear and the bear's patterns. And then if you spot that bear, shoot that bear dead and go on with your lives. And you're freeing the population because everybody is equipped and able to handle the encounter much better than they were before. If we continue to lock down a population, and I'm not just saying you, I, I, I understand this is a frustrating position for you to be in, but if we continue to do that, we can actually cause serious detrimental effects, not just to the economy, but to the well-being of people, their relationships, their mental health, and even their physical health. So I'm coming here today really to, to help encourage, take another look at, at how this may be approached, not to disregard some of the safety measures that you're already doing, but to implement possibly um, an, an inspiration and an educational uh, platform to be able to empower the community, inspire and empower the community to take personal responsibility for bolstering their own health. So if there's an encounter with this or any future virus or bacteria or anything else we could see or not see, they're much better equipped to handle that encounter. You're actually setting the population up of this county for a, a better future, a better now and a better future. Because now you have tools, you have equipment, and you have the knowledge you need to be able to make a difference in your life and others. We keep saying it, we're in it together and I do this for you, but really it starts for, with doing it for ourselves, to strengthen ourselves so that we're ready for whatever encounter we have, we may have, and I think it would make a huge difference if we could implement a program like that in this county. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate those You're comments. You're welcome. Okay, um, the last person I have in the room uh, is Tom Rask. Hi, Tom Rask, Unincorporated Pinellas County. I came here to talk about some other things related to this uh, local state of emergency. But uh, Dr. Cho referenced issues on Saturday. The county administrator referenced issues and challenges, well, as well as somebody who sat at the computer. It was a fiasco. Um, you talk about, uh, Chairman, about uh, improved communications. We need not just improved communications, we need improved performance. Um, I received emails and texts encouraging me to go sign up, and I have two elderly parents, both 80, divorced, one high risk due to asthma and diabetes, and sitting there being unable to book anything, not receiving any texts or uh, emails from Alert Pinellas, who had encouraged me to go there, staring at a screen that says CDR Health Pros. There's nothing professional about this. You can't cover this with marketing, okay? You need performance. And I received an email from a doctor at uh, Bayfront, the Baycare system, said they haven't received any vaccines since last Thursday. We have the White House, the federal uh, level was mentioned. We have the uh, Weiss, uh, White House uh, Press Secretary Saki of uh, United for Ukraine, if you remember back then, um, indicating with her comments that maybe this is going to be a red state, blue state thing. So we need vaccines out for those who need it. It's a joke. And in case you doubt me about what's happening at the federal level, you're all politicians. You know how this works. It starts with the messaging and then comes the action, the uh, partisan action. Um, I also wanted to pick up on the comments that the county attorney said, yes, this meeting is not pursuant to Chapter 252, but you have had completely Zoom meetings. And in another agency, I know, not your circus, not your monkeys, but PSTA, this afternoon, their site was down. So as their lobby is closed, you have a meeting there tomorrow, as their lobby is closed, people cannot come in and see the physical notice. They also can't see it online. Question arises, has notice been given of the meeting? These are important issues, and I hope the county attorney agrees with me. You've had fully Zoom meetings, fully remote meetings, and those in the past, this agency. And my concern is that your decisions there will be overturned. Finally, um, I don't have time to cover everything I wanted, and I'm not going to be able to speak during the Citizens Be Heard, but you've all seen these notices that the sheriffs put up all around the county, blue paper. It says this business must require face coverings. And he references ordinance 2014. Well, read the ordinance, it doesn't say that. And all patrons must wear a face covering indoors except when seated in dining and practicing social distancing. Again, I don't have time to go through the ordinance, but that's not what it says. This reduces respect for law. 
Okay? You want people to respect the law, you do this. If you don't respect the law, you've got to run. Okay. Uh, Kat, uh, could you check online to see if there's anybody uh, that wants to speak to the state of emergency? So, Mr. Chair, I do have one individual who pre-registered to speak on the local oh. state of emergency. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, Mr. David Waddell. Uh, Mr. Waddell has already raised his hand in the Zoom application. So, uh, Mr. Waddell, when you are unmuted, it, you will have three minutes to speak on this item. Uh, once again, hello, everybody, and uh, we're in a real pickle. Uh, what we have to have here is unity. Uh, we can't get upset or mad at our mistakes. Uh, we're not going to learn anything. We're not going to gain any ground. Like I said before, John Wayne ain't coming. We're on our own. Uh, we got FEMA coming. Hopefully we got some local money for you guys. Dr. Cho, I know you got thrown in the blender. Thank God you came out alive. Um, what we need here is a real uh, logistical, coordinated, communication-oriented effort. Uh, I signed up, and I went into the birth date field. It would uh, not allow me to get into the actual field, but I had a pop-up calendar and had to hit the back arrow all the way back to 1958. So we got to correct that. I wasn't allowed to take my friend or the person that is I'm a caregiver for with me. It would be convenient to do that. We can kill two birds with one stone. Um, I am 62. I am not 65 yet, but I have underlying conditions. There was no option for that as well. I did get a prescription from my doctor, but this platform is not allowing that. I did call the number, I got into the queue, and there were 2,000 calls, and they said they'd get back to me. No one's called me back. So again, we got the birthday field to address. You got to be able to take a friend or a spouse, you, you know, one appointment, and then the next one goes some other time. And for 65 and under, uh, I've had cancer twice, and I have DVT. COPD, and uh, I'm currently recovering. Um, I'll know where I stand February 1st, but we have a logistical nightmare. nightmare. I'm prior military, and I can't figure out um, how we're not getting these shots into arms, and we don't have a plan. But God help us, and God bless you. Um, are we still going to have the citizens to be heard as well? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, and God bless you for the work you're doing. Thank you, David. Cat, anybody else uh, online? Uh, at this time, if there are any members of the public who wish to comment virtually on agenda item number three, the local state of emergency, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, we do have one individual who has raised her hand. Okay. Um, Ms. Karen Mullins, uh, Ms. Mullins, uh, w when you are unmuted, if you could please state and spell your name and state your address for the record, you will have three minutes to speak, ma'am. Good afternoon, Commission. My name is Karen Mullins, Dunedin, Florida, M-U-L-L-I-N-S. I'm here to support your uh, vote for continuing the state of emergency. I don't know if you all are aware um, that some of the hospitals in the area um, have COVID patients, um, positive COVID patients that cannot turn return to their ALF or nursing home and are taking up beds in our in our hospitals, which is causing um, some overtime and extra activities at these locations. I do want to say for the record that I was in Morton Plant at the beginning of this month, was worried about contracting COVID um, for that uh, visit, was in for two days, came home and did not get COVID, I'm happy to report. Um, I would also like to make a comment as to the amount of vaccines that we are getting per capita. If we're getting the same amount as Pasco County is every week, there are some 
disparages there. Um, thank you and have a great day. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? There is nobody else who has okay. raised their hand. Thank you. We do have another one. I missed uh, somebody in the audience. So um, uh, would Bob Homan please come forward? And Mr. Cherry misspoke. There was one other hand raised, but we can do it after this. Okay. Hello, my name is Bob Homan. I live in District 5 in Largo. Uh, thank you, commissioners and chairman, for letting me speak today. You stole my thunder for the most part. Uh, I was one of those guinea pigs that went to the website and spent two hours trying to get on the website. Uh, very frustrated, disappointed with that. I did not get an alert, did not get any notice that the website was coming back later, and so I never got a chance to sign up. This is the second week and uh, second time in a row that I've done this. Uh, pretty plain to me that this website, the way it's designed, uh, is not working well. When you have 100,000 people trying to get on the website at the same time, as we all know, it's probably going to crash. So I'm suggesting we either tweak that website to let me go on and get in line and get a number, uh, similar to what you do at Publix. You go to the deli at Publix, you want a sandwich, you get a number, and you wait patiently for your turn. I don't care if my number is 25,000. When I go on that website, I got that number, I'm good to go. Then I get a call later. Somebody says, oh, your appointment's available. Uh, what, you know, when, do you, when can you go? Or here's the appointment time and date. Do you have a problem with that? Then I'd be happy to do that. But as it stands now, it's a race. And these seniors, almost 250,000 of them, half of them can't even get to the computer. They just don't have the capability to compete like that. So I hope you folks will take a look at that and either get the site modified or go to a call center operation. You know, we have the EOC here in Pinellas County, and when we have emergencies like hurricanes, we do what? We set up the EOC. And that call center can be staffed with 10, 20, 30 people and put the number out and people can call in and make appointments, especially those that don't have access to computers. Uh, you did really steal my thunder. I did not get any alerts. So I just wanted to uh, hope that you will give this some serious thought and study and try to improve the way that we are able to get our vaccines done. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. I'm sure you uh, reflect a lot of frustrations that are out there. So thank you for your comments. If you go to Twitter, <laughs> yeah. thank you'll you. hear a lot of them. Thank you. Um, uh, Richard Mann, please. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm seconding everything Bob said, and that's basically why I'm here. Uh, I've been very disappointed by and am continuing to be inconvenienced by what I consider to be a substandard method and or system of signing up to be vaccinated against the virus. We're all aware of the, limited, of the limitations due to a limited number of doses and so forth. That's not my issue. The problem is that there's no waiting list such as a person calls in or goes on a computer once, emphasis once, and then receives an appointment and or a waiting list number. <clears throat> to ascertain that this was a far more desirable idea than having people call back repetitively with no result should not have required exceptional forethought. It should not have required a sophisticated system and even could have been done and can be still be done manually if the will is there. It is an issue of will. Specific complaints, one, the aforesaid lack of a only call once methodology. Two, the appearance, and I can only talk to the appearance, okay? I, I can't talk to the reality. But the appearance that you good people, and you are good people, that you good people may not have attempted to use the system yourselves on a test basis. Three, the agreement that one must agree to in order to use the computer system is unnecessarily onerous and does not give the appearance, again, I can only talk to the appearance, does not give the appearance of having been the subject of negotiation on behalf of our residents. Four, what thought has been given to handling the increased numbers and priorities to be used when the bulk of the populace becomes eligible? Not improving the reservation system will be terrible. Okay, we can all show problems Problem-finding ability is a gift, albeit a minor one. 
but I've been told when possible offer a solution. I can make two suggestions. One, let the folks who are, I think the term is, constitutional tax collectors handle it. I don't know who they are, but they have cause to and generally succeed in handling things like this in an efficient way with the least inconvenience to customers. Or, even better, two, hire me for two weeks at 2,000 bucks a week to get things on the right track with appropriate authority and appropriate county resources and appropriate budget. I won't do the work myself. I expect to bow out before it was finished, but I'll stick around gratis after the two weeks to make sure that everything goes right and the final sign off. Please, please folks, get things started today. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thanks, Richard. Okay, uh, anybody, we had one more you said? Okay. Yeah, Mr. Chair, the, um, there is one individual who has raised their hand on the Zoom application. It's coming under an abbreviation, LWVSPA. Um, so, sir or ma'am, if um, when you are unmuted, if you could please state and spell your name for the record, um, you will have three minutes to speak. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Lindsay Grove. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of the St. Petersburg area. That's what the um, abbreviation is for. And I just wanted to speak in support of extending the local state of emergency. It's important that we continue to be vigilant uh, in public health practice as we vaccinate folks and try to keep um, the spread of the virus down. Uh, these local states of emergency are really, really important to keeping everyone safe. And I hope that you follow the guidance of the Centers for Disease Control and of you know, scientists and other public health practitioners by extending this. Thank you. Thank you, and, Lindsay. And ma'am, real quick, could I get your address for the record? Sure, it's 835 9th Avenue South, St. Petersburg, Florida, 33701. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Chair, there's nobody else on okay, the Okay, thank you. Um, and Barry, I wanted to come back to you. Is there anything else that you have for us um, that you may have learned that was? <laughs> well, it was a good call. So I was actually on, Dr. Cho and I were on um, with the uh, State Emergency Management Director, um, you know, uh, Mr. Motzwitz, and he was um, very supportive of trying to work with us to expand out some of these other locations. So we're gonna be working with them. Um, to where other distribution channels are available. There will be more to come um, following okay. that. Okay. Thank you. Now, just, uh, just as a reminder to everybody, um, starting next week's meeting, please, uh, if you're online, if you want to do that, that's fine, but you're going to have to pre-register to get in. Um, today, in the last meeting, we, we, we went ahead and allowed you to go ahead and come in anyway, just as a kind of a a grace period on it, but we were really trying to get everybody to pre-register and it's five o'clock the day before? That is correct. Okay. And the instructions are online on how to do that. Um, so you can, it can, it's very easy to do, uh, but uh, that'll start in our February meeting. So with that said, uh, are there any questions from the commissioners or do I have a motion to extend? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not really a, a question, but just a comment. Um, the, uh, the doctor that presented talked about everyone taking steps to be healthier, and obviously uh, a, a lot of folks, the early days, uh, we call it the quarantine 15 uh, that a lot of folks put on in the early days of the, uh, when people were staying at home even more. But he mentioned a lockdown, and we're getting emails still to this day talking about, uh, we got one this morning saying, please allow indoor dining. And so it's important for the public to know that we're not in a lockdown. Restaurants are open, businesses are open, and so, Again, it goes back to, it's really important how we communicate with folks um, so that everyone knows kind of the status of the day and where we're at. So I just wanted yeah. to make that comment. Yeah. And with Thank that, I would move approval. Okay, we have a motion. A second from Commissioner Gerard. Um, I don't see Commissioner Seal. And, and I'm here. I know, but I'd like, I'd like to make her, she needs to be visible when we vote. As long as we can hear her commentary and her vote. Okay, just want to make sure I, I got that right. Well, there you are. <laughs> Good to see you. Do you have any comments or questions, Commissioner Seal? Okay, there's a motion on the floor and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. 
All right, we're moving on to citizens to be heard, and we do have several of those um, here. And so we'll start um, with David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Hello, Good David. Good afternoon, commissioners. I hope Karen feels better soon. Thank uh, you. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. To my speculation, George Washington and Queen Elizabeth share the same great, great, great grandfather. George's great grandfather, John Washington, came from England. John was a naturalized subject of the king. Through English common law, he received 5,000 acres of land, a land grant through Thomas Culpepper, a friend of Henry VIII. John grew tobacco for the British and was a member to the Virginia House of Burgess. John was also, uh, John also murdered six nearby Indian chiefs and when Governor Berkeley criticized him, John denounced and replaced the governor with his cousin, Nicholas Spencer. George's great grand, George's grandfather, Lawrence Washington, served as a sheriff in colonial Virginia to the Commonwealth of Great Britain. As a trained English lawyer and a bicameral member of Parliament, he served the Chancery Court of England here in this land. He also was a member to the House of Burgess, which is a private joint, private joint ventured stock under the Royal Charter. The father of George Washington, Augustine Washington, was also a common law sheriff and a colonial militia member to the House of Burgess, holding the title of an informal landed gentry. He worked with the Principio Company to supply pig iron to the British to make cannonballs, killing civilians on both sides of the coin. George Washington, our first president, the man who chopped down our cherry tree. He was a slave owner and a surveyor of, watershed, of watersheds. He mapped rivers, lakes, and streams. George Washington was a royal appointed counsel of the state. He served the Commonwealth to the Virginia House of Burgess as an informal landed gentry. As an undercover British sovereign, Washington did not want the formal title of being a king. He wanted to be a god, claimed as nature's god in the Declaration of Independence. When Paul Revere said the British are coming, he failed to say that they were coming in the form of 14th Amendment water jurisdictions, where, if read carefully, is seen as a birth of choice in George Washington's farewell address, clearly stated as the legislation of the British brethren in the Declaration of Independence. This is where the insurrection and unwarranted undertaking in and of this country began, as enumerated from Article I, Section 2 of this Hamilton's first Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Nancy Obar Obarski. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Nancy Obarski, 708 Beach Trail on Indian Rocks. I was here uh, two weeks ago, and I'm back. And I'm back to hopefully provide you with uh, a little bit more insight into why the beachfront owners are, are resisting signing the beach easements that the county's requesting. Many of us feel that the Army Corps easement is nothing more than a land grab. The fact that they've dredged up an old law from 1986 that hasn't been enforced in 35 years speaks volumes. In my 24 years on the beach, I've never been asked for an easement until now. However, in 2018, a handful of owners in the southern end of Indian Rocks Beach were asked for easements. And even though I wasn't personally affected at that point, I did attend a workshop in Indian Rocks where the commissioners pleaded with the residents to sign. When I stepped up to the mic to ask what the easement said, not one commission member had seen the easement they were insisting that our residents sign. Now looking forward, you know, COVID's made it really difficult to hold any type of community forums on this. But let me tell you about the last one that was held in Indian Rocks Beach via Zoom on September 23rd. Care to guess how much notice we got for such an important meeting? Some people got three days notice, some people got one, some people were same day. I happened to catch it on the city's website five days ahead and sent two emails to the city to all the commissioners with a copy to John Bishop 
asking them to delay the meeting until we could have more notice. I pointed out that the virtual technology was going to be a problem for a lot of our, our older residents. One resident, funny, I mean, he, he always attends meetings where there's beach easements involved or beach activities. He said, does Zoom have something to do with a computer? Because if so, I'm out. He said, my, I don't even know how to turn my computer on. My wife does that, and she's out of town. So he was out, and he's at every meeting. Not only was the forum not re rescheduled as I asked, I received not one response to my email. Meeting attendance was dismal, as predicted. But I got really excited, because one commissioner actually asked, well, just what are the residents objecting to in signing these? It was an astute question. However, it got ignored because 35 minutes of the meeting was taken up explaining to us why we need sand, which we're all painfully aware of. My goal here, three minutes at a time, is to provide you with answers to that commissioner's question of why we're not signing. Figure it out. There's been four easements signed in the last four months, I believe. So if you do the math, you need 240 more easements to reach the 100% that the Army Corps is requiring. And at the rate of one easement per month, that gives you 20 years, which is 17 years too late for the next renourishment. Please start asking some pointed questions of the Army Corps. It's our only hope. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. And we are absolutely asking the questions. Okay, uh, next, uh, Greg Pound. Greg Pound, Largo, Florida. I'd like to start off with uh, um, Psalms 146, verse 5 and 6. Happy is the people that hath, that hath the God of Jacob as their help, whose hope is in Yahweh, the God of Israel, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things therein, which keepeth truth forever. Keep it, he, he loves the truth. Okay, um, for the public, band.video is a website you want to go to to find out what happened to Hank Aaron. Just type in, when you get there, Hank Aaron dies after taking COVID-19 vaccination. And then go, to the, go on Google, look up Fox News, Tucker Carlson, 12521, Democrats sweeping um, for the people act HR1. Okay, they, they passed HR1. That means illegals, anyone in America can vote, no ID. You can vote uh, at any, at, it's, it's so insane, you can't, you can't make it up. And, and um, illegals, it's, it's just insane. And so this is where we're headed is in a system now because of the corruption. First, it started off with our local government. And if we can't get our local government to stand up and, stay, and, and to stand for truth, like we've got this massive corruption to scam you, you got on human trafficking. My daughter's been raped, molested. Um, Jim Palermo, where Robert Guattari and his gang of, of children kidnappers have put my chi children. This guy molested my daughter, and he's still free. And um, this is the stuff is just insane. You just can't make it up. It's almost like if you don't have problems, when you get done with living in Pinellas County, you're going to have a lot of problems. Okay, when, when, you, when you lie, cheat, steal to kidnap people's kids, file false reports, all this stuff is documented. Kathy Corey, myself, when we were on the Juvenile Justice Board for I don't know how many years, sitting on there with everybody, the chief judge from family court and all this other stuff. And you guys have, you guys are criminals. You're criminals and you're liars and you're lying to the people. Why, did, why don't you tell the truth about why Bernie McCabe's in the graveyard? Because he, he went ahead and gotten vaccinated. He took the vaccination. You go find out. You go find out why these people are dying. You find out why 10 people that I know in this area who got vaccinated who are in nursing homes are dead. Dead. Okay? And so what happens, you're not telling all the people that are dying from, the, from getting the vaccination. But you go and watch ban.video. These are videos the government has banned it. The news is not reporting. On Hank Aaron, what happened? And, and just, just look and see what they're doing. So this is what we've got. We've got massive corruption, and the people don't believe the lying politicians. They're liars. Look at the country. We can't even vote. Okay, Pastor Mac Johnson. 
give him a few minutes. Oh, there he is. Sorry about that. Welcome. Uh, I just want to start out and say what a privilege it is to actually be able to stand and say a couple of words in such a great uh, county. Uh, you know, I worked for the county back in uh, the 60s, and I came back and I retired from the county back in the, the late 80s. And actually, I kind of come back because, it, uh, of course, it seemed like there was something that I did not receive from the county. But I come back now because I would like for the county to help me uh, with the work God had called me to do. And, and really, you know, as I look at what God has called me to do, I kind of see it as being like the prophets of old. You remember God would call these men like Moses and Aaron, and he would call uh, all the disciples, which uh, they were the foundation of what the church actually be became. And then he called the apostle Paul and said, Paul, this is the way I want the church to operate. So his last command is what he called us to today. And, and I'm afraid, along with all the other great stuff that we present as a county, I mean, this uh, Pinellas County is just, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, thank you for the hard work. But the bottom line is, it's kind of like everything else that comes from God. Now, if you take and you build up everything you got built and you put God last, well, guess what? That's what it's going to end up being. And I'm afraid I see a lot of what we do in our county, and I see all mankind, but I look at this great work, and it's like God had to do this. I'm just saying today, I really stood because I wanted to say a few words about this COVID thing because I think, I think, I think we're doing a lot of work to try to say this is the way to uh, uh, work it out, this is the way to handle it, and this is the way to do it. But then the bottom line is, how does God say we do this stuff? We're not seeking him anymore. And I'm saying when you study his word, it talks about his people. Who are the people of God? I mean, his people are those of us who are called by his name. And I'm afraid we're not even making that plain anymore. How do you get called by God's name? Well, his name is Jesus Christ. And if you don't start out with him and teaching his last command, his last command was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. So you start out by preaching. Listen, Jesus died for your sins on the cross. He rose again that you might be justified. He came to earth as an example, but ultimately he came to die for our sins on the cross. Now I'm saying here today that God has called me to preach. I'm asking you to preach along with me. Thank you very much. I didn't say nothing about the COVID. Too much, but I'll do it next time. God bless. Thank you for that, Pastor. Appreciate it. Um, I think uh, Tom Rask was here, but I think he said that he was not going to speak. Do you see? Did did he leave? Okay, I don't. I don't. He wanted to speak again in the uh, in this part of the meeting. Um, and then uh, another gentleman by the name of Michael Purdy. Is Michael Purdy here? He had actually pre-registered, but he said he will attend in person. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I do have uh, Mr. Purdy pre-registered for a public hearing item later this evening. Oh, okay, so he's not, uh, yeah. I think it just says item 39, <laughs> which is not where we're at, so thank Correct. you, appreciate that. Um, Okay, um, do we have anybody online? Um, so, Mr. Chair, I do have one individual. I did receive an updated list of those who pre-registered. I do have one individual, Robert Homan, who had indicated that he was going to attend in person for the citizens to be heard. I don't know if Mr. Homan is here. He's not. Did Jerry speak? Okay. Yeah, I think Jerry he spoke. spoke. Okay, thank you. Um, so, we do have two individuals who pre-registered to speak online. Um, the first individual is uh, Mr. Waddell, and it appears Mr. Waddell has raised his hand. Sir, when you're unmuted, you will have three minutes. Once again, hello, everybody. Well, as the first built out county, you got to ask yourself one question. Why are we the first built out county? Well, we're a peninsula, and... Um, 
But boy, it's a great place to live. I have to say, I, uh, I sat on the parks board for a number of years, and uh, uh, what an organization. Um, and we need the people to support our parks like they did back in 08 and 07 when we had to cut the budget and all the people that came and forward and volunteered. Well, now we got the same situation and we're losing the opportunity to get land. So I'm trying to reach out to all the wealthy donors and the people that are environmentally sensitive and try and help us reach the goal of uh, what remains with the Douglas property. And, uh, you know, green space in this county is our most valuable asset. We've got a lot of, of, of frontage on 19, um, and, and that's part of our problem is our planning over the years. Um, we're built out, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, with uh, the help of, uh, um, well, darn it, she worked in, uh, I'm having a, a senior moment, um, in Clearwater, and now she's over here for community development, Carol Strickland. But this county is ripe for the pickings when it comes to anything that involves green space. And, um, Please, I'm reaching out to Mr. and Mrs. Collins um, to work with the county and, and consider the impact that, um, and I'm not trying to toot our horn or make a big deal, but we've got to save as much as we can. And that also includes what's going on up on the Ancloat. Uh, this is a tough mission. And like I said, we're ripe for the pickings and you guys are doing a great job. It's it's a tough it's a tough place to be in. I mean, you made a statement we're going to set this aside and that was almost an impossible goal. And um, two years ago, well, we're in the process and we're learning as we go. And I want to thank you and encourage you. Um, God bless us all. Once again, thank you. Thank you, David. Mr. Chair, the second person who pre-registered to speak online is Dr. Brittany Peters. Dr. Peters, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone so that we can unmute you to speak. Once you are unmuted, if you could please state and spell your name and state your address for the record, you will have three minutes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Dr. Brittany Peters, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, Pinellas uh, Park, Florida. And so I'm actually here in support of you all issuing a proclamation to influence the expansion of Medicaid in our state uh, on behalf of the uh, League of Women Voters North Pinellas. I believe you also may have received some letters uh, regarding this as well. And so I know that you all know the importance of this, uh, Commissioner Eggers with your uh, work with Career Source, Commissioner Peters with your work with the Juvenile Welfare Board, Commissioner Gerard with your uh, background in human services and Commissioner Flowers, um, as you have worked so long on the school board. Uh, so the words that I would like to leave you with as it relates to Medicaid expansion is please to act with intention. The uh, Kaiser Family Foundation recently published in 2020 a review of the relevant studies concerning Medicaid expansion. Um, and again, I'd like to ask you all to act with intention. Of the 404 studies published between 2014 and 2020, many studies found that the state experienced a cost saving by offsetting costs in other areas of the state budget. And again, I encourage you all to act with intention regarding Medicaid expansion. Uh, so most importantly, these studies have found that for our most vulnerable citizens, uh, they have an increased access to care and coverage is increased overall. And so again, I would like you all to act with intention with regards to Medicaid expansion. That is all. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Mr. Chair, we do not have any other individuals who have pre-registered. Would you like me to ask for yeah, citizen please. comment? 
At this time, if there is anyone who wished to comment on the citizens to be heard section of the agenda, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, nobody has indicated that they would like to speak. Okay, thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to um, our, our consent agenda. Uh, there's items obviously five through 22. Do I have a motion for that, please? Is that you, Commissioner Gerard? Okay. Second from Commissioner Peters. Is there any item that uh, anybody like to pull? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask for item seven to come off. Um, and um, should we take that one and then get input on all of them instead of doing it twice? Okay. Sorry. So, so why, don't we, why don't we have that discussion on, on item seven? Sure, certainly. Um, for the benefit of the other commissioners, um, I did meet with the chair last week and asked him if he would pull this item from the agenda just so I could give you a brief update on where we stand um, on this report that was done by the inspector general. I think it was back in 2019. Um, you have in the materials some of the implementation reports. And again, I just wanted to give you an update. Um, some of what we looked at during the pendency of this investigation, um, we agreed with the inspector general and some items we did not. On those items where we did have concurrence, implementation got a bit delayed because our, our resources were redirected due to the pandemic. Um, but what I do want to give the board a report on, on the recommendations uh, where we agreed with the inspector general, and this specifically relates to your process for appointments to the various boards and committees for which the commission makes appointments. So everything I'm talking about is in regard to that process. Uh, what we did take a look at and agreed with the inspector general is that we would um, do a better job on our uh, website of informing applicants at the time that they are making application of any special requirements that may be present for a particular board. So in reviewing all of the boards and committees, again, for which you make appointments, um, we determined, my office did, that none of those boards require a criminal background check. Uh, so with, that is not something that we will be implementing or even informing people of because it's just simply not required. Um, the second issue that we looked at are those boards for which appointed members will need to file a financial disclosure form. You have three boards that fit that category. That is your local planning agency, the Board of Adjustment and Appeals, and the Construction Licensing Board. Financial disclosure, it is the limited form. It is not the very thorough form that all of you fill out. Uh, so for those boards on the pages on your website where a potential applicant would read about the board and get information, we are now going to specifically include information that tells potential applicants if you are successfully appointed, you will be subject to this annual financial disclosure while you are a member of the board. And we're gonna try to make clear to them that it's the limited financial disclosure, not again, the very detailed one that you all have to file. Uh, uh, on that point, could we include that that form or- the, There right? will be a link, okay, a link great, that will take them to it. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, probably one of the bigger changes, although I don't necessarily consider this really all that big, uh, is um, one of the attorneys in my office, Amanda Coffey, put together a standards of conduct form that we are going to ask applicants to read and agree to abide by. Much of what is in there are things that you are already asking your board members to do, to show up to meetings, to come prepared, to treat one another civilly. Um, we also have included some of these items that I'm already discussing, making them completely aware that where financial disclosure applies, you need to comply with it. And by applying to be on this board, you're agreeing that you, that you understand you're subject to it. But we're also giving, we would also be giving with this standards of conduct form, board members better advance notice of things that they would be subject to, public records laws, sunshine laws, ethics laws, for instance, um, they also have to uh, uh, comply with the voting conflict law that you all have to comply with, although the standards are just a little bit different for appointed board members. Um, we have also made it very clear here that they can't accept anything in exchange for their action on something that's coming before them uh, as a board member, which again is something that already 
applies to them. So this is really intended, this is something that we looked at as a result of the Inspector General's report. Uh, it's something that really um, doesn't really add anything to the standards. It clarifies and puts it down on paper so they can read it and certainly be aware of um, any of these special requirements before they apply. And what we are also proposing is that there be a checkbox there when they're making application that says, I'm certifying that everything in my application is true and correct. I have read the standards of conduct form and I agree to abide by it uh, so that they would be affirming to. Uh, so that's really the biggest change as part of our review in um, response to the IG's report. We also are proposing to add some standard language to your applications and the website that informs people of public records requirements and um, ADA accommodations that can be made available if they so need. So those are some of the changes that we made. Again, I asked the chair uh, to have a discussion here because I really just wanted to get consensus from the board. No, nor, no formal vote is necessary, but these are changes that we responded to the inspector general back at the time we did the response, which I believe the response was in 2020, that we would move forward with. So again, with the consensus of the board, uh, we will make those changes to your process. Do we have any questions uh, by anybody here? No, I think it uh, pretty straightforward. Um, then, do you want to? So you don't you don't need for us to take action to confirm? No, I don't think any vote is necessary. These are really just staff updates um, okay. to your process that again really aren't changing any, anything. It is making it more informative. Okay. In a more useful way, meaning in advance for your applicants. Okay. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Um, does any, is there anybody here in the audience that would like to speak to any of the items on the uh, consent agenda? I don't have anybody that has signed up, but. Okay, can you check, please? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do have uh, Mr. David Waddell has pre-registered for agenda item number seven. Um, so Mr. Waddell, I see that your hand is already raised. We're going to unmute you. You will have three minutes to speak. Once again, hello, everybody. Uh, you know, I love this county. I've expressed that over and over, and I take time to care. Uh, but I'm very disappointed <clears throat> in what I'm seeing with the Housing Finance Authority. And I've discovered this over the 15 years when I was exposed to a system that desecrated and decimated and tore our neighborhood to pieces. Um, <clears throat> what's going on right now with these background checks and, and whatnot, it's systemic. It's not just the Housing Finance Authority. And I think the people that know, know what I'm talking about. And this isn't some kind of conspiracy theory. You know, first it was Roger Broderick, and I said, let's put things in place, and he resigned, and let's make sure if you're going to be involved with money. And then we got this next fella here, and it, it's public record. It's Casey Kane, conflict of interest. Then we've got Bright Communities Trust, and we've got Chaff, and we've got Ken Burke. Ken Burke and I have talked. We've got these lawyers, you know, that have been around. Uh, we've got a lack of communication, which equals confusion. Um, we've got an inspector general that gives recommendations. We've got land clearing going on with no permits. We've got problems in Leelman. We've got all kinds of just complete chaos. And, D and BDRS is involved and, and not involved, and that's part of the problem is they're not involved. So. We really need a redress here, and that's what I would like to see. I mean, we've got our pandemic. Let's deal with that, of course. But we do need a redress of community development and building development review services and the Housing Finance Authority. And that's what it's come down to, and that's my observation. If anybody would like to challenge me on this or sit down and speak with me, and I have spoken with many commissioners, one more recently and, and another not too far back from that. And I'm not going to throw names out there, but we've got to clean our house. 
We've got to be effective. We're losing money here, and we've got to bounce back. And by the way, I think legalizing weed is a great idea. I mean, we all could use a joint. Again, I said that, oh, I think back in March. And I told you John Wayne wasn't coming, so that came true. Um, please, Lord, help us. And, and, and I, once again, I want to thank uh, um, um, uh, Chairman Eggers uh, for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, um, in, in true Americans and patriots and people that want unity and believe in unity, you know, that's what solves our problems. We All create right. our own problems is what we do. Thank you, David. You stop doing that. Thank, thank you, my, you. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. God bless you. Yep. Take care. Anybody else? And Mr. Chair, I don't have anybody else who has pre-registered, but at this time, if there is anybody who wishes to comment virtually on the uh, consent agenda, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone. And Mr. Chair, there are not any individuals who have okay. Thank you. raised their hand. Okay. Um, all in favor of, well, actually, we pulled number seven, but we're going to put them back together. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carries unanimously. Okay. We're on to the regular agenda and item 23, agreements for requirements of heavy and light duty vehicles and equipment. Mr. Burton. This is our standard purchases for heavy and light duty equipment. There's a variety of different sources we procure these from. Total expenditures over 12 months estimated at 6.5 million. Any questions for, for Barry? Okay, do I have a motion? A motion by Commissioner Gerard. Second. Second by Commissioner Justice. Um, I don't have anybody that's signed up here. I don't have any cards here. Can we check online for pre-registering or, or let's see if anybody else has checked in. I do not have any individuals who have pre-registered. So at this time, if there is anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 23, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, nobody has raised their hand. Thank you. Um, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, moving on to item 24, which is a change order. This is two change orders. One is with um, Gabriel Gabriel Construction. This is regarding repairs to the exterior of the public safety campus, as you're well aware of, um, estimated in the amount of $3 million. Uh, the second one is for small maintenance, maintenance items for $500,000. Uh, again, these are jock order contracts, so they've been pre-bid and this is the unit pricing associated with these repairs. And, and Barry, was there any a change in the scope of the repairs uh, from the original uh, in addition? Or no, is it, no. Uh, they, they're, they're, they're using the jock order contracts more on the other items, but this is to affect the changes out of the public safety campus, the $3 million one. Okay. Any questions for, for Barry on this? And do I have a motion, please? Uh, Commissioner? Gerard made the motion. Did you? Oh, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Commissioner Peters uh, with the second. And I don't have anybody in, in the audience who registered uh, to talk about this. Uh, Kat? Mr. Chair, I don't have any individuals who have pre registered. So at this time, if there's anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 24, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star 9 on your phone. And Mr. Chair, nobody has raised their hand. Okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> thank you. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item 25, was it's a production agreement with a, a film company for a film called A Taste of Love. I don't know, uh, Mr. Burton, did you have anything that you wanted? I, I did uh, ask uh, Steve. Uh, Hayes from our TDC, our Visit St. Pete Clearwater group, to come forward and maybe speak a little bit about this item. Um, and he's here. There he, he is. is here. And I just really wanted to talk. We got we got a lot of emails this week that talked about, you know, for and against this, but uh, just that maybe the unique nature of this film and, and what it stands to bring and uh, your recommendation. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the, of the commission, Administrator Bert, Burton, I think as you all well know, the COVID pandemic has certainly changed the way those of us within the travel industry are doing things. Whether it's directly related to vacation travel, meetings and conferences, sports, even, even on the film side. And one of the changes that we went through this year is, is going through and looking how we can help create and support more content development that showcases our, our community. A Taste of Love is a hallmark style feature film to be shot totally in St. Pete Clearwater. And there's nothing unusual about that. We've had a number of different hallmark films that have been shot here. The difference is that this now becomes a feature about us a uh, where they're actually going through and it almost becomes a 90 minute commercial uh you know the the old days we used to watch the 30 minute infomercials this becomes that 90 minute commercial where they're showcasing our community and what we have here over the since 2014 we have provided uh marketing incentives uh to over um 35 different programs um and the incentives running uh, 1.7 million since 2014 then generating over 11.2 million in, in local spending. This project, if it spurs additional interest or another project surfaces, allows us to still go through and provide an incentive out for that. Again, this is something to go through uh, for us and be able to showcase our, com our uh, community. The marketing value of this project um, as presented by BVK is roughly about $2 million. So based on what we would help in contributing to this has a four to one return on value just on the marketing side of it. The money is being spent here locally within our, uh, locally within our community. In addition, what is also unique about this is in going to, through to remarket this, to be able to go through and get this in various broadcast channels is then we have the opportunity to recoup revenues from that, which is something we've never had happen before. Again, this would be unique within the film commission um, uh, um, industry. In addition, it also goes through and we're able to take the various footage here and be able to use that in a variety of different uses, uh, promotionally to showcase what we have in our community. I have, uh, I brought in attendance with me, uh, Tony Armour, who is our film commissioner, um, who can also answer any real specific questions related to the uh, project, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I, I know Commissioner Seal, I'm gonna go to her first, and she, uh, let me go, go ahead, Commissioner Seal. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think you answered my questions in part, but um, so we could actually use actual footage from the movie and use it in some of our own marketing efforts, including any commercials that we might do. We're able to use the, that fo the footage that's being uh, put together. Uh, we're able to use that to, in any promotional things that we're doing, especially that that will go through and showcase that we're a filmmaking destination. So again, it's, it's visuals that, you know, again, showcase our, our community. But, you know, I'm thinking of like Dolphin Tale. So um, could we literally say, you know, Hallmark movie, um, a taste of love, blah, 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 in our marketing efforts? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, the other, um, are we allowed to promote the movie? Um, exactly. And what we would do is working with the production company to say, it's, it's in the agreement, you know, we would have a premiere here to showcase what they've done. And then also say, you know, hey, here's this 90 minute movie you can catch. Here's the theme of it. Here's how it's going through to showcase our community after the fact as well. Okay. Um, I know this is difficult to anticipate, but maybe based on past productions that they've done, if we did get 12.5% of the net profits, do we have any idea of how much that might be? Um, I, I don't have an answer to that, Commissioner. I can ask Tony based on his experience, um, mm -hmm. you know, what that, that number might be. Again, that, that would be the, the icing on the cake to have that. Really for us, we're looking at the exposure of the community as a whole during that 90 minutes. So um, I can have Tony come up That's or fine. Please, please do. I've got one last question. 
which is the, um, while Tony's coming up, what is our entire film incentive budget? Does this take all of it or is there more that is in the budget? Uh, we have a total of $1.4 million in, in, in that line. Thank you. Tony? Hi. Hi, Commissioner Sale. Good to see you. It's been a while. Hi. Uh, yeah, to I answer know. that question, it's hard to say. You know, we have 12.5% uh, would be the amount that uh, we could uh, recoup, but it depends on what the overall sales of the film are. So it could be $1, it could be $100,000. They really don't know until, um, you know, until it starts getting sold in international territories, until it completes a domestic sale. There's a whole process to it, and so we're, uh, we're unsure at this point what that could be, but uh, like Steve said, it would be the icing on the cake. We're getting all of this, um, you know, benefits from the marketing value and the exposure and then the, the hiring of local people, um, and then the additional, you know, if we can get a little money back, then that's, that's great. And I'm sure somebody else will mention it, but we have gotten varying, varying emails, some supportive, some not, but a lot of it seems to be based about the minimum wage paid to some of the um, actors and actresses, so. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what that is. That doesn't really sound accurate to me. I know what, uh, what it costs to make a film and nobody gets paid minimum, minimum wage on a, on a project. There are set day rates and, and other things that determine the, the scale of the, the payment. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chairman, also. Yep. yep, no problem. Commissioner Flowers. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Seal, because that was going to be my question. The emails that we received talks about the difference between day rates um, and evening rates, and it asserts um, for the crew, not the cast, it talks about the crew. So that would be the grip and all of those people, not the actual actors, um, at $200 a day or $225 for a 10, I guess they mean a 10-hour shift, which is considered a day rate versus... Um, uh, um, I presume a, a, an increased rate working only eight hours straight time yeah, and uh, leaving those two hours at two and a half. Yeah, film, film budgets are scalable depending on the overall budget of the film. So, for example, if you're working on a you know, $200 million Marvel movie, um, the gaffer is going to get paid $600 a day or $650 a day or something along those rates. You work on something that's like a... Um, and those are union rates, and so those are determined by whatever union... That is IOTC or Teamsters or whatever else. I think what you're probably getting are emails from union members wanting to know if this will be a union project or not, and that d remains to be seen. Typically, union projects are going to be budgeted a uh, million dollars or over, something like this, where it may come in under eight hundred thousand dollars, or typically not union projects. And so, uh, production assistant, you know, who's just a kind of a gopher on set, may make one hundred and fifty dollars a day, but a gaffer could still make three hundred dollars a day, which is still a good wage. You know, for a project like this, so I, I think it's it's you know it just depends on what the crew position is, and it depends on you know whether it's a union or a, a non-union shoot, basically. And what's your proposed budgeted expense for this entire film? Well, it's not anything that we're making, so we're not proposing well, a budget. Well, uh, Yeah, I think it's it's gonna it'll fall between the five hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand dollar range, but it still could go higher depending on what um, potential pre-sales would be, because in, in the scenario like this, what a um, sales company does is the sales company goes out and they try to sell the movie even before it's done based on the, the concept and the content and everything. And so if you know, offers start coming in higher, then the budget can go higher and it can be a you know, full million dollar budget union film. But if, um, you know, if those numbers aren't high, because in the current pandemic world, a lot of the the sales terms for, for film content just isn't reaching what it, what it used to be because there's no theatrical market, and I don't want to bore you with the whole finance of, uh, of films You can bore me. <laughs> when you talk um, about our money, you can yeah. bore me. <laughs> uh, but no, but so, uh, so the budget is, will probably fall in that five hundred dollars to $800,000 range for the production, if that's So if question. we're putting $500,000 towards the production, and the production costs 500000 we are actually paying yes. for the production in hopes that it will be a hit and return revenues that would allow us then to recoup some additional finances that would be somewhere around the, um, I think you said $11 million? Is that what you said? Uh, the Not you, values him. $2 million. <laughs> the overall, um, what we've done on previous uh, projects for the 35 or so projects has been, I think, $11.9 is what the local spend has been based off of those other projects. Um, so as far as you know, where the, where the money goes, uh, they don't get paid 
until after they've shot the film, until after they return all the deliverable marketing items to us, until after they've secured distribution. So we're not paying anything up front. If they don't deliver, they don't get paid. And so okay. that's you know why we're so excited about this particular project is it requires you know, one, they have to pay for it themselves first. So they're going to be paying the five hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars out of their own pocket before they would receive or recoup anything from the county. So there's no no upfront ask from uh, from the county at all. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, the emails felt to me like when I was in the legislature again, and every film commissioner was emailing us because we got them from every county in the state, and some of them, I believe, weren't even from the state of Florida. So, um, so I felt that was kind of nostalgic. Thanks for that. But um, I do have a problem with. Well, first, before I go to there, what what is the is there a guarantee that they're going to use local workers? And if they're going to use local workers, I mean local workers, um, how many jobs is, is there a guaranteed job of local workers? Or are they going to bring in their own team of techs and set makers? And well, this is a this is a local production company that's going to be making. So the the company is based in. St. Petersburg, uh, founded by an ER doctor who's a, a, a veteran, and the company is run by a, a Navy and a Coast Guard veteran, and very well respectable. Been in the industry locally for a long time. Created a lot of projects around here. Uh, um, you know, again, a reputable, respectable company. They only hire local. You know, the only people that would be coming from out of town would potentially be the lead actors that would be in the film. The rest of the actors, the rest of the crew, everything will be 100 percent local. So this will be money that goes into the local economy, hiring local people, giving locals jobs, and supporting local businesses. Okay. So I, I don't, with all due respect, I don't mean to say this offensively, but I don't know that I would consider this kind of a low-budget film kind of in the same category as a dolphin tail. But I, I have a problem if we're financing pretty much the whole 100 percent, even if we're going to do it later. And we're financing 100 percent of this project. Um, we, you know, we're going to have every producer in the whole country coming over here, or even other countries, if we're going to finance the project for anybody that wants to come in and do it. Well, I hope they do. Um, <laughs> and I, I've got real problems with that. Not that we're going to fund the whole thing. I, you know, I, we don't do business that way. We don't do that for other businesses. Um, and so I, I, I'm sorry, but you're not going to have support from me on this one because I don't, I, you know, we're, I, I just don't see us doing 100. percent I, you know, when businesses come in and we do incentives for businesses, we don't, we don't pay, we don't pay them back for the whole thing that they invest. And so you're, I, I'm just not there with you on this one. No, I understand. I understand that. And and to your point, you know, part of the rationale on this is if you were going to pay for a. Um, you know, a full advertising campaign where you're shooting uh, photos and video and putting 16, 90 second commercials together, those can run half a million dollars. And Steve could speak to the cost of, you know, what full advertising campaigns for for four. And so, you know, again, those are for 30, 60, 90 second commercials. And we're spending close to the same thing for a 90 minute commercial. And that's that's the rationale behind that and based off of what a full advertising campaign costs, essentially. Yeah, but when we when we book a commercial, we get to see it and preview it and see what it looks like. This one, I, we haven't seen the script. We don't know if it's going to be any good. We don't know if the actors are going to be any good. Yeah. And what if there's a horrific faux pas in there and we can't use it? Well, we have final cut say over so, the film okay. so that it, we don't have to pay if we don't like okay. the end product. And we have seen the script. I've, I've read the script personally, and it's uh, right in line with all the other Hallmark <laughs> romantic, you know, family-friendly G-rated. But films. we keep saying Hallmark, but it's not Hallmark. Hallmark style in that romantic um, takes okay. place in a small town. Okay. And they, they don't have other sponsors. Boy, they don't have girl. anybody else sponsoring it that's going to help pay for this. They're just depending totally on taxpayer money to do it. No, they're paying for the film entirely themselves. This would just be the enhanced incentive um, well, afterwards. Well, if, if it costs 500000 they're not paying for them. They're just paying for it up front, and then they're getting their money back. So they're not paying for it. I just want to make sure that I understand this correctly. They're going to spend $500,000 to do this film here. And then after it's all done, we're going to pay them the five hundred thousand dollars back. So they've got they got no 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 loss there, no investment even, really, because they're getting all their money back. Right, and that's and that's why we put this forth like that. That was the concept from the from the beginning was was to do this because right now there are no other productions coming to the area. You know, 2019 we had the best year in the 28 year history of the Film Commission with all the film pr productions that we had come to town, and so now. 2020 and now 2021, there's nothing. You know, we've got we've got a lot of great commercial content. We're getting digital media. We're getting music videos. We're getting a lot of these smaller productions coming to the area that are really keeping us busy. But as far as something like this, there is nothing. There is nothing else. And so the 1.4 million that's in the line item for incentives in the Film Commission budget would go unused for the year. And so this is a. I know it's an outside the box, um, you know, thought process, but something we can do to really drive business, drive interest, drive marketing to the area, and you know, do something something kind of unique and. 
um, very worthwhile. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I mean, I, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a creative idea in, in the, um, no money is paid unless all those deliverables are met. So it's not a no risk because they don't know if they can sell it or not. Um, I have a few questions. Um, we covered a lot about the total budget. The $2 million marketing benefit is what they're saying it will be. Um, is there a differential? And I don't know what the, the rankings of, but they can't sell it to the Hallmark. They, they can't sell it to Lifetime. They get down to, and I don't know which has a better audience, so I'm probably just speaking out of turn. They get down to oxygen. They're selling it to oxygen. Is, is, the, is our return or our commitment based on what they sell it for or viewership ratings per channel? How is that kind of? Sure. No, it's not determined on what the uh, what the output is because it could be a Hallmark, it could be a Lifetime, it could be a Netflix. There are a, a wide variety of of platforms out there, so it's hard to say you know what platform it will get sold to. But uh, but BVK in their valuation took into account that it could be any one of those variety ones, and that's that's where that two million dollar average marketing value comes from. But it would be a they've got a criteria. They've got a level one Lifetime Netflix. Hallmark, very different than selling it to the local CW. Yeah, yeah. Well, and local CW doesn't really. You, I know. But, what you, I know what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. But no. The 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 concept is that it would get the proper distribution that would be a wide-reaching, you know, national audience. Um, and there's there's not a there aren't other channels that typically run those types of films. It's not going to run on, you know, FX network or, or other sorts of things. So it's a, it's a, it's a narrow window, but the, um, the sales, uh, agent in Los Angeles who's doing this, uh, currently has 10 films that she's selling to Hallmark and Lifetime right now. And she's the one who's agreed to take this on to sell it because she thinks this will fall right in line with the other stuff. So it's, it's already, you know, set up with a sales company that has a, a long history of selling to these platforms this exact type of film, basically. And then the um, go through a little bit of the the logic. I know it's a little bit in the article, and uh, I talked with staff a little bit. The, for lack of a better term, the sole sourcing that we're using digital caviar instead of doing a typical RFP or something like that. Since they brought the idea. Sure, yeah. So the project was brought to us just like any other film project, any of the other 35 incentive projects. Someone comes to the film commission and says, hey, here's a project that uh, we'd like to bring to your area. You know, what could we do incentive wise for this particular project? So that's how the project came to the film commission. So this is something that's open to any project that would come to the area, anybody that brings a project. But they have to have, you know, several things in place. Do they have a, a track record of being able to produce content that gets distributed? Do they have distribution sales in place? And can they fund the entire project themselves? So any project globally that can bring something to the table like this, we're of course, you know, willing to willing to talk to. It's not a sole source. It's really wide open to anyone in the community, anyone, you know, again, in the world, in the production world that can that can bring a project. And then I know this is this is on the film incentive, aver, I guess advertising side of the the coin for us, but at some point I and I know when you're on the the CVB chair you get to get into this a little bit more, but I really like to see us explore with our economic development folks, how we can stimulate the uh, industry here for our local artists to cultivate some of those uh, young artists that come through, um, whether it's help as we look at our next penny with studios or or. Um, how we do that so that, that those folks don't leave Tampa Bay, that they don't go to Atlanta or somewhere else, that we kind of, kind of, I mean, we're not going to be Hollywood, but we have a potential to do some stuff really locally that I think could be exciting. So um, I think he answered all my questions. Yeah, and, and to speak to that, and something that I, the board uh, the, um, really won't know is because this was just announced at noon today, we were actually just named uh, in the top 25 places to live and work as a filmmaker in the country by Movie Maker Magazine. And that's a result of all the hard work that we've put in over the last you know six years or so. And it's a part of not just our incentive program, but what we've built up community-wise and local film festivals and local industry and everything that we're doing. And I'm in complete agreement with you, I'd love to continue to do more things educational wise, you know, facility wise to continue to grow the business locally, but it's great to see this national recognition that we're going again that was just announced uh, just announced today. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Gerard. You're good. Commissioner Long. Yes, thank you for your very articulate um, 
information that you were able to share with us. That was very helpful. My question is whether or not you're far enough along to know who your leading cast people might be. Is that a secret? We don't know yet that, uh, we don't know that yet after today's meeting, if things go in the right direction, then that'll move quickly and the plan would be to actually shoot this film in March. So really we're talking five or six weeks away from production. They're ready to go, everybody's ready to ramp up and start um, you know, doing this locally, but um, just be the results of, uh, of this vote basically. I'm thinking that whoever it ends up being will probably have a lot to do with the success of the project and you know how successful they are in selling it to a top-notch vendor. So, yeah, because I'm, because the um, the sales company in Los Angeles has done this and has multiple films in production right now, they have actors that they know, Hallmark or Lifetime, whoever like to have in their particular projects, and so they would cast from that stable of actors that they use for uh, for these projects. Basically, that would be the whole the whole point of. Well, as someone who in another chapter of my life worked in that industry. I'm very excited about the project and hope it's going to be very successful for us. You never know where it might lead. Well, you know, you know, I'm constantly getting emails and phone calls from the Safety Harbor Chamber of Commerce when the Love in the Sun shot a year and a half or so ago. Um, you know, it seems like almost monthly or weekly, uh, I get an email from their president that says, we just had another, another couple come in, say they came to Safety Harbor just because they saw us on the Hallmark nice. Channel. And so that's why, that's why you know, we do this, is of course not for people just to see it, but to inspire travel, and it certainly inspired a lot of travel and a lot of notoriety for our area, and we're hoping to continue that. Good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, just a couple questions. One is you talked about the estimated promotional opportunity is what is it two million dollars? What does that mean? To speak to is that what it would cost us to develop something like this? Um, what what is that? So you look at that. That would be if we were to go by that time and get. I mean, I'll just buy that time that value would be about $2 million if we were just going by it, period, right? Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, so if we were going to go buy advertising, let's say we wanted to buy advertising on the Hallmark Channel and run, you know, St. Pete Clearwater 30-second commercials, it would cost $2 million to pay for the same type of exposure that we're going to get from this production showing on a, on a platform like that. And it, in your, it's your all's opinion that this that's uh, uh, it, it BV, does, BV, BVK, does, the um, advertising agency of record for Visit St. Pete Clearwater, has determined. I understand, that. but I'm just what I'm saying is you all believe that this tells our story. Absolutely, yes. I, I'm 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 a little bit like Commissioner Peters right now. I'm it's, it, I'm in an area that I don't know uh, know a lot about, and so I'm just trying to understand that that definitive value that we get from it, and that's. What yeah, I need more. I've been working on this, trying to put something like this together for about a year now, and I wouldn't have spent that amount of time and, and had Steve and, and Terry in our office going through contracts and, and bring it to all of you if I didn't feel that it had that value that we, uh, that we as a community and as a, as a county would see. Okay. Anybody else with questions before I open it up? Thank you. Um, I don't have anybody that registered that's here to talk. Could, uh, how about pre-registering? Anybody pre-registered? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do not have any individuals who have pre-registered to speak on this item, but at this time, if there is anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 25, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star 9 on your phone. And Mr. Chair, nobody has raised their hand. Okay, okay thank I you. I make a motion to approve the, the item, uh, okay. Mr. Chair. Commis Commissioner Long made the motion. Commissioner Gerard, second. Okay, did you get that? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Five to two. Uh, can, uh, Commissioner Seal, I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Were you four? Okay, sorry about that. So it's five to two in favor of the, the motion. And Mr. Chair, Chief. just for the record, could you please let me know who dissented from that? Uh, Commissioner Peters and myself. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, can I ask a request? Um, they may already do this. This is my first time having to make a decision at, at this level regarding the filming industry. But um, if there is an indication that things may not be going the way that they intend or that this film is not able to secure um, 
the level of actors that would move this into um, a positive cash flow where we would see a return on investment. If we could have that information brought back to us prior to an end analysis report of expenditure, I'd just like to know before we read it in the Tampa Bay Times that the film was a bust. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. not saying it would be, but it just yeah. would be nice to get that information. I'm getting a nodding of okay. the in the back. Thank so, you. So yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, okay, on to item 26, which is, go ahead, Barry. This is a ratification of um, my approval and acceptance of emergency rental assistance uh, program uh, from the federal government. Uh, I submitted this. We were successful and received it. This is just a ratification of um, my submittal. So the yeah. yeah, if you could elaborate, that would I would appreciate. Sure, it. Sure, this will provide. Um, we actually received 21.3 million on the federal from the federal government to provide financial assistance for rent, uh, rental arrears, utilities, um, and other uh, related housing expenses. It has all kinds of program requirements. Um, we're working through community partners and trying to define the way in which we can deliver on these services. And once uh, we've uh, firmed that up, we'll bring that back to you. Okay. So anybody who might have heard about this and maybe thinking it's going to start right away in terms of applying and such, what, what's your sense of, of that time frame? Well, I, I don't have a sense until I hear from staff regarding the community partners that would actually perform the, the program analysis. Okay. Um, there, there's all kinds of federal requirements, and so the whoever's going to administer the program, it has a cap on the administrative cost associated with it. So they have to agree to that. They have to agree to be able to do rental, uh, I mean, um, um, income verification and, and other types of requirements. So staffs working with community partners, they're talking through those types of details. Um, staff said they'll have something to me in the next week or two, okay. um, and then I'll bring it back just as soon as we can. Pull this and together. I think there was one thing that made the previous program a little bit easier was when we got we were able to use the attestation form. Correct. That's not allowed. It's not understand. allowed this time. So, so it makes we, it a little more complicated. It makes it a lot more complicated yeah. because we have to have the paperwork to be able to process the request. And what's the time frame for using the funds? Do you did you? It's it's in here, um, but I don't recall the exact date. Um, yeah, by the funds generally expire uh, at the end of as at the end of twenty first, twenty twenty one. Say that again. It says December thirty first, twenty twenty one. Okay. Generally will expire. Okay. Thank Correct. you, Commissioner Seal. And so that's not a lot of time. Uh, we're going to be working quickly to see if we have somebody that will administer this and and then it'll start rolling out the information. That's correct. Okay, but it'll be some time. We'll bring it back. Obviously, soon we want possible. We want to get this as soon as possible, okay. but we, but, you know, but I, it's I, like I just want to manage expectations <laughs> a little bit out there, so if people hear about this, they understand that it is. We all remember yeah. bad starts. Yeah. Um, we want to make sure we have the details worked through, right. and we're ready to go before we make that announcement. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Barry? And do I have a motion for this? I'm sorry. Did I do that already? Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I guess that's what happens when I start asking questions. I lose sight. So we have the motion in the second. Uh, I don't have anybody that registered here that, that would like to speak. And Mr. Chair, I don't have anybody who has pre-registered online, but at this time, if there is anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 26, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, nobody has raised their hand. Okay, thank you. Um, and then all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 27, Barry. This is our air, air pollution control operating agreement with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Um, this is a locally run program, but there's no county match requirement. Okay. Any questions for Barry? Do I have a motion? Commissioner Gerard made the motion. Se second. Did I hear that from Peters? Okay. 
Okay, again, don't have anybody in house, but anybody online? Mr. Chair, may I ask who did the second for that one? Uh, Commissioner Peters. Thank you. Um, I do not have anybody who has pre-registered for that agenda item, um, but at this time, if there's anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 27, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, I do not have anybody who has okay. raised their hand. Thank you. Then all in favor say aye, please. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item 28 under solid waste. This is an interlocal agreement with Pasco County. Uh, this is for mutual assistance in the processing of municipal solid waste in the event either party experiences waste energy um, outages um, for a per period of time. Okay, so, okay. Are there any questions for Barry on this? I need a motion, please. Move approval. We got a motion uh, by Commissioner Seal, second by Commissioner Gerard. Um, no questions. Uh, I don't have anybody that's registered for this. And Mr. Chair, I do not have anybody who has pre-registered for this item, but at this time, if there is anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 28, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, there is not anybody who has raised okay. their hand. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any opposed? Motion carries unit, uh, six to zero. Item 29. This is a fourth amendment to an agreement. This uh, contract provides for the uh, disposal of biosolids, including the pelletizing at our uh, South Cross Bayou um, Reclamation Plant. Uh, this is will allow uh, time for us to develop long-term regional biosolid strategies. Um, and so while they're working on that, we wanna extend what we're currently doing. Uh, what do you mean extend? We're extending the agreement. This oh, is the fourth the amendment to okay. the agreement. Got it. Any questions for Barry on, on this one? Barry, I, I'm assuming that we, all the capacity that we have there is used so we don't have any extra capacity for any of our partners? That is correct. They, they're they looking to be able to regionalize it. If that's successful, then we would go out for an RFP to develop a regionalized strategy on this. Okay. This is, they're currently only able to do um, our local. This is just to keep ours, our part. Our, our current yeah. palletizing okay. operation going. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Do I have a motion? Then I did I, I didn't write that one down. Did Move I approval. Okay, Commissioner Long and Commissioner Gerard second. Commissioner Long made the motion, Commissioner Gerard the second. And I don't have anybody that wants to speak to this item. And Mr. Chair, I do not have anybody who has pre-registered to speak on this item, but at this time, if there is anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 29, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, nobody has raised their hand. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we'll move on to item 30. 30. Item 30 allows um, the uh, Department of Safety and or Medical Emergency Medical Services Authority to uh, submit an attestation form uh, to be able to get $292,000 of uh, CARES Act funding. Okay. Second. Oops. Uh, Commissioner Peters made the motion. Commissioner Gerard made the second. I'm sorry, what was that? Commissioner Long made the second? Okay, sorry about that. Did you get that, Kat? Sorry, Commissioner Long. Um, any questions for Barry on number 30? And I don't have anybody. Is anybody in the audience um, online? And Mr. Chair, nobody has pre-registered to speak on this agenda item, but at this time, if there's any member of the public who wishes to comment on agenda item number 30, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. <laughs> and Mr. Chair, nobody has raised their hand. Okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item 31 out of the Sheriff's Office. Uh, the sheriff has been patiently awaiting our <laughs> our meeting uh, to present to you uh, his plan for implementation of body worn cameras. Um, we have discussed this extensively. He's looked at his operation and what it would take 
to implement you know, body cameras throughout his organization. Um, here he has asked for an amendment that would align his um, the funds for the remainder of 2021 of 3.8 million. However, he's still been working on that and is asking actually for a lower amount that he'll present here. Um, you can see the long-term cost. It will have an ongoing uh, annual cost. And I'd ask him to come forward and present the, and the outline of the program to you. Thank you. Come on up, Bob. Uh, and first of all, let me apologize. I just, I think I was in neutral when I was thinking I should have brought you earlier in the meeting uh, so that you could have, you've been sitting here patiently waiting. So thank so, you. No problem. I uh, appreciate it. So um, this, the request is uh, for a budget amendment to implement the uh, body worn camera program uh, in response to a tremendous amount of uh, community requests and uh, feedback on the topic. Uh, we are implementing a body worn camera program. Um, and we went through a process of uh, selecting a vendor, and the vendor that we've selected is Axon Industries out of Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, we uh, went through uh, a selection and procurement process uh, and determined that Axon was the vendor that best met the needs uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, it's the quality of the product and the services that they offer, uh, as well as the interoperability with other agencies in the area. Uh, Axon is currently providing body-worn camera uh, to the Pasco County Sheriff's Office, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, Tampa Police Department, St. Petersburg Police Department, Clearwater, Pinellas Park. So they're widely used in the area, which will uh, allow for, again, interoperability. Um, we, uh, as we went through the process, went through a field trial, a 30-day field trial to work out all the technological issues, any glitches, bugs. We've been able to do that. And in fact, uh, as a result of that, we've left the cameras in the field because uh, the program uh, went so well with the field trials as opposed to pulling things back. We just decided to leave it out there. So uh, the need is uh, to uh, equip 875 law enforcement deputies uh, with the integrated body-worn camera system. Um, and that includes all deputies uh, from those in judicial operations and court security to the SROs to everybody across the board. So it'll involve all of our uh, law enforcement deputies. Um, the way that the contract works with Axon is it's kind of a hybrid uh, in that it is a subscription model uh, for the monthly services, which includes the acquisition and all of the storage that goes with it. And as you can imagine, there's a tremendous amount of storage. So to give you just an idea, we have been uh, actively engaged in recording uh, with dash cam systems uh, for the last 15 years. And we have right now, uh, our cruisers are equipped with dash cams and we're <coughs> downloading, this is just the dash cameras. We're downloading 17,000 video events a month. So now take that and multiply it and make it a body-worn camera system, and it's going to be a tremendous amount of video events uh, that are being recorded uh, every month. So uh, it's going to be a significant undertaking, and uh, what it requires in addition to all of the uh, technology and, again, the subscription-based model for the storage is also there's upfront costs where you actually purchase the cameras. So the cameras are purchased up front, and they're $700 a piece. And then there's a per deputy per month cost uh, for, uh, again, the subscription that is all the technology, the storage, uh, and the operating. It's a roughly five-year contract, and I say roughly because it's a staggered implementation, so it actually does go into a sixth year. Uh, so we begin, uh, assume, assuming that the funding's approved, we begin March 1st, uh, and we'll complete the, the entire implementation of it uh, hopefully uh, by the end of the summer, uh, and uh, we'll be on kind of a staggered uh, time frame because of that, and then it would end in the summer in August of 2026. So in addition to uh, the technological implementation, it's going to require some additional people. Uh, when you implement something where you have 875 body-worn cameras out there in the entire system, there has to be a system administrator. And then also, uh, again, we talked about the data processing those requests. So we have to add two positions in our records management section and also our public records processing section because the public records requests are going to be significant. We went out to other agencies of like size with what we anticipate to be uh, the same uh, amount of recordings uh, to try and get an idea as to what it will take. And so that's an estimate that we have. I think it's pretty accurate based upon 
the assessment we did. So we have to add five positions. Um, so when you break it down uh, in your packet that you have, it lays out the costs uh, and they are the Axon costs and then the Sheriff's Office costs. As the administrator said, uh, we went through a, a very aggressive uh, negotiations with Axon and we really were able to get the cost down uh, over the last couple months significantly. And those negotiations continued on up until uh, Friday. And so in your board packet, uh, the total program cost uh, for the remaining of this fiscal year, so it's for now through the end of September, September 30th, uh, we were requesting three billion eight twenty nine five zero two. We've been able to get further reductions in that. So the ask is uh, three million four fifty six nine thirty one. So that will be um, a reduction, uh, and the reduction is three hundred and seventy two thousand five seventy one from what we submitted to you. Um, and uh, Axon has already signed their side of the contract. Of course, I haven't signed anything until we get the funding approved. Um, and so I know that that's not going to change. So my point in saying it is, is that uh, we're firm now as far as uh, what the pricing is going to be. In the subsequent years, um, in the subsequent years um, will be uh, roughly about $4.4 .4 million a year in years two, three, four, and five. And then in year six, which is a partial year, roughly about $3 million. Um, and then we would have to renegotiate the contract in year six. We've been able to negotiate that the increases from year six on in, in the uh, renewal would be limited to 3% per year or uh, limited to CPI, whichever is lower. So at least we have an idea as to uh, what the costs would be going forward and we'd be able to cap those under the contract. The, uh, again, the additional cost, uh, when you break it down uh, for uh, the Sheriff's Office um, will be primarily uh, the personal services for those additional positions and then some internal technology costs in that first year to implement it. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, those are the costs um, uh, to implement it. Uh, and. I just ask that you uh, approve it uh, for the balance of this fiscal year and then for the subsequent years that we would work into with the administrator for the budgets uh, going forward for uh, FY22 and beyond. Hey, Bob, real quickly on that 3% or CPI, that the lesser, is that after the six years going forward? Yes. Okay. So it's fixed for these each of these five. These are fixed costs, with the, which you have in front of you, uh, except for the reduction that I just told you about right. that we were able to secure additional reduction. Those are fixed costs from now through year six. Uh, in year six, we'll have to renegotiate, and anything beyond that, limited to three percent or CPI as the max. And Barry, so this is coming from our reserves, right? This this would come from our reserves for this year, and then we would build it in as part of the base budget for next year. We were talking about looking at our two-year budgeting process and uh, building the reserves for this second year so that we would anticipate, we might anticipate a reduction in revenues and would use some of the reserves to do that. So That's obviously correct. this is starting, well, maybe one of several projects that ends up eating into those reserves. I just want to... As, and as, just as kind of an update, when you're asking, being asked to approve such a large um, expenditure out of the reserves, you know, we've, we, um, obviously we're looking at a worst case scenario um, a, as an impact to our budget as a result of COVID. Um, we haven't seen um, as significant of a reduction. If you recall, Mr. Twitty coming and talking about a 6%, you know, impact. We don't believe it's going to be near that. Uh, we're refining some of those budget numbers. Um, and so, you know, we'll be putting all those items on the table when we talk about budget and we do in our budget forecast, I think next month. And so you'll start to see that. But um, from that from that standpoint, it's a good news, but this is an unanticipated an expenditure. And we'll have to factor it all in, but okay. um, we're okay, okay financially. Thank you. And Bob, one other question, um, just real quick. Uh, on policies, uh, as it relates to the operation of these, what discretion do the deputies have because, I mean, there would be some situations where you wouldn't necessarily want those to be on, like if they're interviewing a, 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 ch a child or an underage person or, I don't know. What, what kind of policies? Are they being developed still, or what do you see uh, on those discretions? Well, the, the policy, we, we implemented a policy in conjunction with the field trial, uh, and uh, I think we got it right. We're still getting some feedback from the deputies, and we will... Um, 
set forth a, and put out a, a final policy uh, when this is implemented. But the uh, balance that we're able to strike is between what we're trying to do and capture on video and audio as many of these events as we possibly can against um, privacy interests and certain circumstances where um, discretion should be used in recording. Uh, so there were there are times when it is required to be on, and that would be any time that the deputy is engaged in any type of enforcement action or any planned enforcement action. Uh, with this system, this, the camera system automatically comes on when the deputy's gun comes out of the holster. It automatically comes on when the taser is activated. Um, other than that, they will have uh, discretion, and there are times where uh, they wouldn't have it on. Uh, one of the times, one of the policies, an example, if they're in a hospital, um, you know, you want to respect pa patients' privacy and those types of interests. Um, one of the things that they're required to do if they're interviewing a victim of a crime, and, and not a witness, but a victim of a crime, to make sure that the victim knows it's being recorded, and if the victim as an example, says they don't want it recorded and then they're refusing to have it recorded, then they would shut it off to interview the victim. We don't want uh, the victim to feel, you know, in a bad situation. So we are trying to respect victim rights. Um, but the majority of the policy would require that the events that we are all concerned about be recorded, be recorded. So uh, again, uh, it, it, it will not be on all the time. Uh, but it will be on w when necessary. It also has, the way the system works is, is that it actually, when it's off, it is actually capturing it in a buffer. It is actually capturing going back for a period of time. So if we're sitting here talking and it's not on and then I activate it, is that it will record the last, whatever we have it set for, 30 seconds. So that it, it really is capturing all the time, but it's not necessarily recording. So that's kind of a nuance, and I don't want to, you know, complicate it, but I'm trying to answer your question and explain it. So it's going to capture a lot, but it's also going to balance privacy interests. Okay. But there obviously will be tight. Now, you guys have a, a policy in place to watch those. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, you know, and again, it'll be a work in progress. I can tell you that the field trial and the policy that we promulgated during the field trial uh, was very successful. Uh, the feedback from everybody, from the deputies and from all involved, uh, was very positive. So I, I think we've been able to strike a good balance with it, and so far so good. But again, we'll listen to everybody, take feedback, and it will continue to be something that evolves. Good, good, good thing for residents, but also good thing for our, our deputies as well, I think. I think. Commissioner Flowers. You. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of my questions was going to be what type of feedback were you getting from the officers? Um, I know this has been a discussion um, over a, a long period of time in the community, um, and I want to thank you for participating in those conversations. I know sometimes it got a little tense, you know, but that's what happens when persons are emotional about certain things. Um, but looking out for, as you say, Mr. Chairman, the officer as well as um, anyone else that may be involved. Um, so I'm glad to hear that um, that you're getting some positive feedback on it. Um, the other thing I want to um, draw attention to is the fact that we are receiving some additional discounts um, in, I believe it's page 16 of your financial documents that you provided um, to us um, on any trade-ins um, for equipment or exchanges for equipment and things of that nature, which also includes spares in case a camera goes down or whatever, you have the ability um, to replace those. So um, I'm, I'm thankful for you just having that openness, open-mindedness, and for um, having some sincere conversations, not just with people in the public, but I know the other chiefs, you know, Chief Holloway and, and Clearwater Chief um, have all been in communication about what this means and trying to be, um, trying to be, be very purposeful in your thought process, who you select, why you're selecting them, what the equipment can do and doesn't do, what's the storage, what's the capacity, what's the time frame. So I know that those conversations have been occurring. So thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner Flowers. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, it's, uh, the process of when the light, uh, cameras come on is fascinating. Um, a, you know, gun activated or I know in some departments, if they're in the vehicle, the light, they flip on the lights, that activates the camera. Um, what, what's the, uh, to, it's not really 
what's the length of time? I mean, so we store this. Do we have to store this forever? Yes. That's just. Yeah, it, well, we're, we're going to, you know, consistent with the state of Florida Division of Archives record, record retention requirements is, is that it, it, we will uh, purge some of it. Um, and but there is no limits under this contract uh, with Axon and their storage sy system, which is called evidence.com. So we can uh, store indefinitely, but that's not a good practice, and, and there does need to be some uh, purging of it. Uh, but we'll um, certainly maintain uh, all of it consistent with the public records requirements uh, and then look at it, but we'll set up a retention s schedule that works. Because re remember, again, some of the things that are being recorded are, have no evidentiary value and they really don't mean anything uh, to anybody. And once the, the situation is over with, it could be just a conversation a deputy's having with somebody. And the deputies have the flexibility to have the option uh, to, so I'm setting the base as to when it has to be on, but not the ceiling as to when they can turn it on. And what I've heard from some of them that are in the field trial is, is that they just turn it on all the time because they just rather have it on. So <coughs> they're recording a lot of conversations that are just really just general innocuous conversations. So we don't want to really clog the system up uh, with, with things that have absolutely no value at all. Uh, but we'll keep things under the record retention requirement as the base. And these, these are for your entire uh, force. Are we sharing the cost with the cities that have the contracts? How is that part of the, the deal working? Sharing the cost with the cities? Yeah. The cities where you have responsibility, you have contracts with the cities to provide law enforcement. Are they with normal capital costs or equipment costs? Is that yeah, figured okay. into the contracts? Or Yeah, I, I understand your question now. As far as the contract cities are go, go, is all the equipment costs, there's a formula that we use in the contract, the contract city pricing in those contracts. And there's personal services, there's operating, there's all the different. And so that would get baked in and it depends upon the budget. So for the, the rest of this fiscal year, um, the contracts are already in place. But as we move forward, then those operating costs will get baked into those city contracts. Okay, very good. Thank you. Anybody, anybody else? Okay, thank you, Sheriff. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Appreciate your hanging in there too. Sorry about that. No problem, no problem, thanks. Do we need a motion to approve the? Yeah. You want to yes. if, uh, when, when you make the motion, if we could have uh, the the lower amount, the three million four hundred fifty six thousand nine thirty one. Are we approving the contract as well, or just no, you're just you're approving a budget amendment is what you're you're providing. That's what so we're doing today. That's correct. We're not approving the purchase of, but that includes the purchase of all the equipment. We execute the budget amendment. He has the funds. The sheriff will execute the contract. Okay. So I would like to move a motion that we approve uh, the sheriff's request for an amendment to the budget for $3,456,931 for the purpose of um, implementing his desire to have body cameras for his officers. Thank you. Who is the second? Okay. Commissioner Flowers was the second. And uh, again, I don't have anybody here, uh, anybody online. And Mr. Chair, I do not have anybody who has pre-registered on this item, but at this time, if there is anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 31, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone. And Mr. Chair, I do not have anybody who has raised their hand. Okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, we'll move on to item 32, county attorney reports. Jewel. Um, just briefly, I will give you uh, an update on where we stand with your applicants for the redistricting board. Um, I got an update uh, right around the beginning of this meeting. You have 17 applicants so far for that board. Um, I do have a breakdown of who applied for which districts if you're interested in hearing that. Um, but I also wanted to give a reminder to the public that may be watching that that application uh, is open until February the 4th. And, and Jewel, when, um, will, when will we be making those selections? Uh, we were targeting your March meeting. The board okay. only has one meeting in March, okay. so it would occur at that meeting. Okay. And I can tell you what the date of that is. And meeting. then there, and there is a date by which we need to have those our own selections in or 
What what you'll see is your. I assume that your each of your aides will be looking at um, the applicants with you for your own personal nominations to the redistricting board, and then processing um, a commission agenda item just like you would for any other uh, appointment that this board makes. So I can't tell you since I don't necessarily yeah. uh, get too involved in that process okay. what the deadline is, right. but it's usually a, a couple of weeks before your meeting. Okay. So we'll have seven individual picks and then we'll have four that we pick as a group. Well, correct, but this board will, so each of you nominate a right. member, so yep. you'll really as a board be approving all right. 11, but seven of them will be based on your individual nominations. And I'm told that the meeting is March the 9th. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if, if a commissioner selects is, or has a plan to select one of the people that have applied, if you're comfortable letting the other commissioners know can we do that? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Let me, let me think about that one because so I, I don't want to implicate any sort of sunshine issues because, of course, you are all going to be voting on all 11 of uh, them. I was just trying to. Sure. Well, if, yeah, because if he, if he holds off and we pick in the. Well, there's well, you all have to pick from people that live within your district. So, so. Those of you that cross over the at-large with the single member districts could conceivably be looking at a same person. And I don't know exactly, I, I, I got the email update from Courtney, and I don't know how the applications are coming in. What I see here is you have six at-large applicants and then various numbers for each of the districts. So for instance, if you lived in, I, I'm not even certain whose districts cross over, but let's say Commissioner Flowers and Commissioner Peters districts cross over. So I, don't, I suspect that when an applicant goes in, they just pick one or the other is what I'm guessing. Um, but I can get you some better information on how that process works. But again, some of you cross over, but not all of you. Um, and you do have to pick somebody that lives within your district. And then, Mr. Chairman, yes. what happens if there's no applicants from one of the single member districts? What I would encourage those of you, what I would encourage all of you to do um, to the extent that you may not be seeing, and I do see two districts here that reflect zero applicants, what I would encourage you all to do is to go out and maybe potentially recruit folks that you know that live within your district that you think would be good uh, board members and ask them to apply. And that was, that was kind of why I was suggesting, and again, I don't want to, but there's several under, that applied under mine because I did share it on social, and so I think people just clicked my name because they saw that I shared it. Sure. Um, but I don't know what single member district necessarily they live or whether it's, you know. Let, let me take a closer look at that issue and I can talk individually with each okay. one of you about it. Well, Mr. Chair. Yes, Commissioner Gerard. Thank you. And I just wonder if we could have our individual nominations in a day or two before the others so you'll know, you know. Excuse me? Oh, by the 10th of February. And then February. the whole rest of the list will be available. So, right. So we're asking for our, for our individual picks to be in by February 10th. Right. To Courtney. Okay. okay. Well, well Court, Courtney will know then. <laughs> <laughs> and again, importantly for anybody that may be viewing the meeting, uh, the application uh, process is open until February the 4th. So a, a little bit over a week, so you may expect to see some more applicants between now and then. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? No. Okay. Okay. And move on to county administrator reports. I have a, a few items here today. Uh, first, I'd like to ask Gay Lancaster to come up and kind of give you just a quick overview of the work that she's been doing to turn around um, the contractor licensing department. Um, as you're well aware, uh, Gay has over 40 years serving this community and has done so in a variety of ways. She agreed to come back a couple of years ago to help us with something that she'd been working on before in our contractor licensing department. She's announced that she's going to be retiring again. Um, and so we want to, one, get an update, let her tell you firsthand what, what accomplishments she's been able to do and also to uh, wish her well in, uh, in her retirement. And then we'll move to... Um, introduce you to Michelle. As with anything else, um, you never do anything alone. And um, I've been very lucky to have the support of uh, a wonderful deputy director and terrific colleagues. And I thank you, Barry, for your trust. I thank the board. I guess you've been wondering what the heck we've been up to. And we have some numbers. 
The only calls you ever get are the ones from people who are not happy. <laughs> and uh, we try really hard to get back to you and resolve those complaints, but we can't make everybody happy all the time. We have done some things on the positive side, and I'd like you to know that. Um, as just a reminder, we do a whole lot more than just issue licenses and um, fines and uh, bother people. Uh, what we really want to do is protect the public safety by licensing people, making sure they have the appropriate skill set to do their work, making sure that they are covered by liability coverage and workers' comp insurance, so that we know for sure uh, that when they report to the work site that both they are th and the individual they serve are covered. Side things that we do that we don't do very often but that are really important, one example is the local technical amendment that the board reviewed and passed for the city of St. Petersburg yesterday. Another critical thing that the board does is protect the coastal construction control line. Years ago, that arrangement was made where the, cons the PCCLB was the arbiter of account the local coastal construction control line. And I think that's a critical aspect. We don't get called upon to do that very often, but when the board gets called upon, they give it careful consideration. Amending the uh, codes or resolving disputes for codes are another aspect of what the board does. It's pretty critical when cities and individuals have disputes over their construction. What is our core business? What do we do? Uh, how do we make our money? Um, a lot of people think that uh, the only reason we exist is to charge people and uh, to uh, bother them when they are trying to build a project. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The big desire is to uh, enforce the codes against people who want to contract without a license. If you have someone building your home or doing a project for you and they don't have a license, they're not protected by insurance, they don't know what they're doing, we have not been able to assure you that, that they are working legally. The sheriff has been very successful in some um, busts, particularly related to unlicensed contracting, but it, it runs pretty rampant in this community and a lot of people that we hear from later are lamenting the fact that they have inadvertently hired an unlicensed contractor. Uh, we use 16, 2016 as um, a year uh, to mark when this process of change began because most of you who are here remember that in 2016 there were a lot of stories in the paper and a lot of complaints made about construction licensing. And from that point, uh, I'd like to point out from the chart if we can have the next slide um, that our revenue picture has changed in that five years. Uh, the mix of revenues changed in that five years. From 2016, uh, the admin fines from then until now has remained pretty constant, and those are uh, against typically um, licensed contractors. The citations amount has ex expanded because uh, prior to the county uh, taking over at the uh, middle of 2018, um, we didn't have an enforcement group. We had uh, no investigations, although the sheriff did do a pilot program that was very successful. Uh, now we see a mix of almost equal amounts for um, admin, for licensing fees and citations. So that I think that's a positive step. Um, with respect to expired permits, which are largely um, the admin fees, we provide services not only for the county, but for the city of St. Pete, the city of Largo, St. Pete Beach, and Treasure Island. The relationship between revenue and expenses has also changed. Uh, you see the bad years there where the uh, expenses exceeded revenues. In 2017, when uh, that first occurred, uh, we did have a reserve that was sufficient to cover the uh, expenses at that time. But as the reserve diminished and as the revenues were curbed because we didn't have an enforcement group, um, we had a bad year. And the intergovernmental services fees were withheld by the county in order to help the agency survive until the legislature considered changes to the special act. So um, in 2019, you'll see a dramatic change 
and the revenues increased significantly. And pointing to 2020, even in the year of COVID, we had uh, revenues that exceeded uh, our expenses and were able to survive um, and, and thrive, I think, uh, as we've gone forward. And this year, we have budgeted the amount to repay the uh, amount withheld for the internal services fees. So that's good news. Um, the county coffers are gonna get back what they uh, withheld for us. Now, the, um, I would love to show you the stack of papers that I've been using for my working file for the Inspector General's report, but uh, you, you do know that it's been a long process. Uh, many of you were here when that process started. We requested it. Uh, we requested a thorough review when that was undertaken. And thank goodness for them, the Inspector General came in and provided a thorough review of our, our operation. Um, not very positive, I'll have to tell you. But we were open to change, and as they made suggestions, we made the changes that we could going forward. Um, of that report, there were 235 recommendations. And uh, today, where we stand, or at least we've advanced a little beyond today, but um, only 26 of those 235 recommendations are not implemented in some way. Um, Another 48 are in process and partially implemented. A full 110 have been fully implemented. And um, 20, we have found all acceptable alternatives for them. So the IG agreed that that was fine. Um, and what you'll see uh, in the bottom is that there are 11 that were no longer applicable because the legislation changed, because people left the organization, and those were part of the, the recommendations that they made. 89% uh, fully have been uh, accomplished. Of the 26 that were not accomplished uh, at the time of the report, uh, two have been implemented. Uh, six are going to be resolved through uh, the implementation of Excella and uh, six are not recommended. Um, Twelve are going to be undertaken as we go along. It takes revenue, it takes time to accomplish some of these changes. Uh, with respect to the contractor community, which is our, our next slide, we've undertaken a review of contractor classifications and um, that has been an arduous process. The board has taken into consideration uh, the risk to the public in eliminating cla uh, classifications, and they have um, rejected one or two of the recommendations because city met seed. Uh, excuse me. me. One, excuse me one minute. Could you move that slide one more, please? I think she's on the next. There we go. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. I'm watching this and not that necessarily. <laughs> um, the city building inspectors recommended against eliminating one of the classifications and the board felt that there was a risk to public safety in the elimination of another that staff had recommended. But if you'll take a look at where we are today uh, compared to where we are were last year, uh, there were a total of 87 contractor classifications. Of that 87, 43 are state classifications. We don't have any control over state classifications, and you'll see that that number has only been reduced by one this year, the state undertook a change of one classification. We went from 22 local specialty classifications down to 16 and eliminated 17 classifications that were either duplicated, they had been abandoned. At the beginning in, 20, in um, 1973, when a contractor was working at a job or in a task and the special act was enacted, then they just described themselves and that kind of became a, a contractor classification. Over time, they've stopped doing that and the new applicants have signed on to the specific local classifications. So now we find ourselves going from 87 last year to 63 this year. And the board yesterday acted to eliminate that one final classification that was a, um, one person was in it, and so we reassigned him and issued him a new license. So uh, all the extraneous classifications have been eliminated. Uh, the next piece of work that we've been addressing is the volume of records. Uh, when I got there in 2017, there were two offices fully filled with 45 
bulging file cabinets, files on top of the file cabinets, and 30 years of paper records in existence. Uh, nothing had really been done to address them other than some routine um, destruction of records. But uh, at that point, they were keeping all contractor records. Uh, we've since reviewed with uh, our attorney, the help of our attorney, and have found that we don't have to keep them all forever and are in the process of um, reviewing, prepping, and scanning those records in an effort to um, digitize all of them. There are some historical records, mostly our contractor files, and uh, we will save a lot of money by having assigned a staff person to that process. It is due to be completed in 2023, at the end of 2023. So you'll see that uh, a number of boxes have been prepped. Um, in the process of moving, some were um, discombobulated, to say the least, uh, and they had to be reassembled, and uh, a lot of specific personal heavy work has been done on that. So of all those 40, 457 boxes, we're well along the way to get that resolved. In terms of our collections, a lot has been written about how much is not collected, how much is owed to uh, contractor licensing. We do know that those um, collections can only be pursued for two reasons, in two ways. One is to collect within the five-year statute of limitations the other is to file a lien that lasts for 10 years and then to renew that lien after that 10-year period. For the fines and fees that were uncollected that are older than that, or for which an extension of the lien has not been filed, then that amounts to 36% uh, of the amount owed. I have to take a minute and talk about the fact that to get to this number, required over 100 hours of work by someone 10 times smarter than me, uh, and that's Michelle. And um, she is, uh, um, has brought all that information to uh, a finding of what we'd like to recommend for uh, uncollectible as uh, over a million dollars, a million thirty-nine dollars, and pursue the outstanding balance of a million eight through our collections efforts for which the county administrator has approved. We're doing a good job in terms of customer satisfaction. We've initiated a queueless lineup system, such as they have at Animal Services, and uh, a chat line. And we're heading a lot of people off at the pass in terms of uh, their concerns or questions by dealing with them online. Website revisions and a new phone system have made a tremendous amount of difference, and other changes are on the horizon. Um, we will look forward to the kickoff of Accela in 2021, uh, about mid-year, and we have moved toward an advancement of the county administrator's agenda of shared services and cooperative work, uh, and are moving into a strategic alignment with BDRS, with our investigations unit. Um, all of these enhancements, the data-driven process that we've entered into, uh, have made us uh, more streamlined, more effective, I hope more efficient, and creating less complaints for each of you. Um, I do appreciate the talented uh, colleagues that I've been able to work with and the help of the Inspector General's office to start us out on, on the right path in 2017. Thank you. And I gotta say, Gay took on a real big task. Um, and we, and, and it's not just the licensing piece, it's the administrative capability of managing that office um, and the paperwork and outstanding fines and how do you collect and you know everything going through and so she's she's really did a tremendous job she brings a tremendous amount of knowledge and it was able for us to attack tackle this this issue quickly um, well we appreciate her service to doing that we also appreciate her service with bringing on Michelle and I'll let her introduce Michelle but Michelle worked over in ITI for the last three years doing business process improvements and, and, and it, right up her alley, she had worked with her before, brought her over yeah. and, and really added the horsepower to be able to set up systems in place to be able to accomplish that work. And so, you know, we, we had a smooth, we had a smooth transition. This was a planned transition. Not too often we get to do that sometimes, but this was a planned transition in terms of leadership to continue the work that they're doing 
Um, and again, they've, they've made a lot of progress. There's still more work to do, um, but that's always, you know, the case. And uh, we, we want to wish um, Gay all the best in retirement and welcome Michelle um, and into that, her, ne her new role. Thank you very much. If I may, it has been such an honor to work with Gay Lancaster. She is a tremendous mentor, um, a great leader. She has um, touched every part of this county, and I am so honored to follow in her footsteps. I can never fit into her shoes, um, but I will try my very best. I have to tell you, you're getting a great deal with Michelle. <laughs> She's ready to fly. And that is such a good thing, Barry, uh, having the deputy director in that position. What a benefit that's been. We've been a great team. She's ready to fly on her own, and you'll love working with her. Thank you. Good. Thank you all both. Thank you. Oh, Gay, thank you uh, for uh, your amazing work um, for this county. I mean, over over the years, but this one was a this was a tough one, uh, a, another challenge for you, which you, I mean, you know, just like like you said, there's still work to be done. But my gosh, the the, the, uh, the improvements that have been made are just unbelievable. So thank you for all of that. Uh, congratulations and welcome to the team. Um, and complete best wishes um, thank you and that next phase of your life <laughs> you know i love this county yeah. and this has been probably the hardest job i've ever done for the county <laughs> God, uh, we've had lots of hard times in the past but um this was tough well Very you, uh, uh, you, you've earned a great <laughs> retire whatever that next phase is but thank you again so much my pleasure yeah. sir commissioner. yes commissioner seal. oh commissioner seal thank you thank you um, yes, I just wanted to, I'm sorry I'm not there to thank you personally, Gay, um, but thank you from the bottom of my heart. I remember reaching out to you and saying, oh, would you consider doing this? This is only temporary. We just <laughs> really need your help. And what is it, almost three years later? So, four. Oh, my goodness. Godspeed, <laughs> thank you so, so much. You um, have done a yeoman's job, and we're very, very appreciative. This county is very lucky to have a leadership it does, and I'm proud to work here. Thanks for the tenure. Thanks, thanks Thank Gail. You. Again, thanks, Michelle. The next item I have, speaking of retirements, um, but she hasn't been quite with us 40 years, but <laughs> Daisy Rodriguez, uh, she's going to be retiring in the first week in February. If you don't know, Daisy uh, came here as the health care administrator in 2015 and was promoted to the director of human services in 2018. She's done a great job, obviously, overseeing a very large and diverse department, uh, taking on um, a lot of challenges and areas that are very difficult to navigate. Um, and so we want to wish Daisy a very happy retirement to spend time with her family. Um, she can come on up and, um, you know, and we're going to be transitioning and we will be advertising this, but um, we're going to be um, appointing Karen as the interim human resources director. I wanted you to, if you know. haven't met Karen. Uh, to be able to see a uh, name with a face, Karen, uh, Karen Ketchum, is, she'll be the interim human services director. Human services, okay. um, again, she's been the health care administrator, um, and so uh, she brings a lot of um, knowledge, especially around the behavioral health area. She's been leading that all, all those efforts. Hi, hey, Daisy. Hi. Congratulations, well, I thank guess, on, you. That, uh, on your retirement. Um, I, for, just personally, you, you, you know, I, too many times I've met with you, I said, I'm really high up on the learning curve in this arena. Please be patient with me. And I just really wanted to thank you for the time you gave me personally to, to try to help me understand the scope of what you get involved in. And, and uh, I, I did make some progress, but I've still got work to go. But thank you so very much uh, from a personal perspective. And thank you very much. Best wishes. Thank you. Uh, I just want to I want to thank the board for your leadership, really for the opportunity and the privilege to be a part of this organization and to serve the residents of this county. The human services team is a very hardworking, dedicated team that, you know, they step up <coughs> whenever the call is. I was very privileged to work with them as well. Um, I'm leaving you in good hands with Karen. She has a lot of experience. She's very smart. Um, you know, she'll she'll do a great job. And and most especially, I want to thank Lourdes because her leadership has always encouraged us to be and bring the, ve the very best version of ourselves to the job every single day. So, 
Yeah. Thank you. I'm well, looking forward to more golf, <laughs> Barry, more golf, um, and doing a little bit of bi-coastal living, spending some time with my son in California. So, uh, that's and, what, nice. and what a last year for your, I mean, unbelievable work that you and your team did um, Thank this you. past year yeah, with all it, these CARES programs. It and, felt like a couple of years rolled up in one. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And let me just say also, it's an early retirement. I just, <laughs> I just want to say that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much yeah. again. Thanks Enjoy. so much. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy. And safe. welcome, Karen. Stay healthy. Oh, oh. Commissioner. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Daisy, come here just a minute. Sorry. Uh, my apologies, Commissioner Seal. She just want. I, I, I know. I'm sorry. It's really difficult um, doing this uh, virtually, and you're doing a great job, Mr. Chairman. Um, Daisy, you've just been amazing, and. I just so appreciate, you know, Health and Human Services is one of the departments that um, is very meaningful to me because this is how we really serve the residents that are desperately in need of services. And I can't believe the number of grants, the different programs that you've started. Um, it, you've just done an amazing job. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, if you just stand up, so that way everybody, you've worked with some commissioners, but if you haven't, this is this is Karen that I was introducing. Again, she she's done a lot of all the work on the behavioral health. Um, she's going to be the, serving as the interim director, and so we look forward to working with her. Good job. Thanks, Karen. Um, finally, um, under the Yellow Dot program, if you recall, we brought that to you and, um, and did a pilot with that. Now they're rolling that out um, countywide. So the Yellow Dot program, is a coordinated way of placing critical medical information inside a vehicle glove box to be used in, for, by responders in case of an emergency. You approved a resolution in 2019. We now have the forms, the handouts, of the deliverable to be uh, made available to all of our partner cities that wish to market this program themselves or available directly to the public on our county website. Marketing is going to begin um, producing this and, and pushing this out in early spring. Um, and again, you know, the measures of success is the number of participants in the, um, the uh, over 24 month period. And so we, we look forward to pushing this out and making this available. It's very simple. A yellow dot lets first responders know that there's medical information in, inside so they know who um, and what uh, the, the person that they're dealing with and in their, in a, any underlying medical conditions that they should be aware of. This is the flyer, and we certainly will be again pushing that out in earnest. Um, with that, the final one is um, you have an accomplishments report uh, that summarizes all the various accomplishments. It's available it's, uh, uh, for the commissioners, and uh, I, I'm assuming it's up through all of our distribution channels. And so if you have any questions, feel free to raise it. Other than that, that concludes my report. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Does anybody have any comments on anything he brought up? Okay. All right. Uh, we are moving on to, under the county commission area, a 2021 state legislative program. Um, and I am assuming that Brian is in the room. Brian, you... Brian is in the room. He's certainly available to um, present any items or answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Brian Lowak, Assistant County Administrator. Um, uh, as you'll recall, in December, uh, at a work session, I brought forward um, a proposed 2021 legislative program um, at that time. Uh, you gave me the okay to move forward with one change. That change is represented in the document before you, um, and that is putting a focus on um, advocating for uh, keeping funding for priority projects in the FDOT District 7 work plan. Uh, there were three uh, priority projects specifically um, that were called out there, and right now we are working with our partners at Ford Pinellas and our legislators to come up with a strategy um, to advocate for keeping uh, funding for those projects in the District 7 plan. Other than that, there are no changes. Okay. Any questions for Brian? Um, thank you, Brian. I really appreciate the work you've done. I'm, we have we have good leadership up up, up in state uh, this coming year. So. I appreciated the positive delivery, the positive messaging that we we delivered in our our guiding principles. So, I mean, we have some, we have one opposed in there, but the rest is supporting things that are important to us. So, I really appreciate that effort. Um, seeing um, no questions, do I have a motion for approval of our guiding or, or of our <coughs> legislative program? 
Move approval. Commissioner Long making the motion. Commissioner Flower second. Um, and I don't have anybody on this item either. Did you get the Did you get the motion or in the second? I did, Mr. Okay. Chair. I do not have anybody who has pre-registered to speak on agenda item number 34. But at this time, if there is anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 34, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star 9 on your phone. And Mr. Chair, nobody has raised their hand. Okay. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item, which one is it? Number 35. 35, thank you. Kat, do you, can you, we just have one person, I believe, here. Could you? Yes, so I, yeah, item number 35 is an appointment to the Construction Licensing Board. There were two applicants, but it appears one is not qualified. So there is just one that is qualified. Okay. So do um, I have a motion for Michael Soforelli? Second. Commissioner Peters makes a motion. Commissioner Justice is the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, boop, boop, boop. I got almost to the end without asking. I don't have anybody here that wants to speak to that. Please check. There is nobody who is pre-registered, but at this time, if there is anybody who wishes to comment on agenda item number 35, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star 9 on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, nobody's raised their hand. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carries unanimously. Okay, moving on to item 36, which is just county commission new business. Does anybody have anything for the good of the order? <coughs> um, I just really wanted to say two things. First, um, that uh, we had a really good workshop at Tampa Bay Water yesterday. Uh, there was... Uh, the tenor of the meeting and the positive nature of the meeting was so good. Um, uh, I, you know, we've had, uh, the staff has continued to have meetings with partners like SWIFTMUT to continue improving that relationship. And at the same time, we've reached out to some of the, some of our member governments at the highest levels. We had some co those conversations as early, as recently as last week on Thursday and Friday. Excellent. Um, so I feel like we are kind of in the boat together uh, moving forward. Um, uh, we've got a lot of things that are coming up, and uh, you know we'll see that the, the, the test will be when we get some tough, tough sledding, how, how we work together. But I really felt good. It was very positive. Uh, that was from all member governments. Um, and so I've been critical of some in the past, and there was absolutely everybody seems to be on board. So. Uh, without being overly positive, I was very excited about the the, 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 uh, the meeting uh, yesterday. So uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that. And the only other item um, that I'm bringing, I'm not really bringing it forward. I just wanted to, to let you all know that uh, the League of Women Voters has asked us to consider Medicaid expansion resolution. Um, I frankly um, have just started to learn enough about it. Uh, I had some conversations with Brian I've had some conversations with a couple of other people. And I would just want to know if, if you're, it really isn't our decision. Obviously, this is something that they, they decide up at the state level. But uh, if anybody would like to um, have some workshop on this item, because I, I think there's, I think there's, it's more complicated than it looks. And so I, uh, if there's interest in, in that, um, or what, what's the will of this group uh, is to, con, uh, to look at uh, that Medicaid expansion resolution anybody yes mr peters well i just think it's kind of the role of the state i don't know that we need to spend Say a lot that of again. time I, I'm not since, hearing. since it's a role of the state if we spend time in a workshop to work on that i just don't you know we have no authority on it we have no okay. i i would just leave that one to the state and keep our workshops to our, okay. our good work that we're doing here anybody else Yes, Commissioner Justice. Just a quick question, and if it's if it's not labor intensive for our staff to get this number, um, I'm not looking for them to. Do, but if Medicaid expansion happened as been proposed, what would that mean for our budget? How much money would we have to spend more, or how much money would we save? If if that's not a labor intensive uh, question to get an answer to, 
um, I would love to have that information. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, uh, Brian has been getting some of that work together, and I think he could probably put a, a, let, a note together and give, I guess, a, a summary of some of the... I, I found it really in, in informational uh, and very good, what I, what I was learning, and the question about what, what that really means in terms of budget to the, to the state budget and how it might come around to affect us is could be could be important to understand. So, um, I, I'm, I think it's a good idea to to see if Brian could put some information together. I don't think necessarily for a workshop at this time, but he could certainly. He he's already been working with Daisy yeah. and and with uh, Dr. Cho, and so he can certainly provide yeah. thoughts in terms of okay. explaining what it is and the likely additional people that would be eligible as a result of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. If, from what I understood is that the current program has an income uh, income verification and then a, a, a list of about 10 different groups that qualify. And so, the expansion yeah, would yeah. simply lose that list of people to qualify. So it's, just, it's, it's I think he would be good for him to bring bring that forward in a, in a, a letter to, 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 to educate and to inform us. And then we, okay. if there's a commissioner that really wants to bring that forward into a workshop, we can do that. Otherwise, I think that's a good place to, to start. Okay. We'll Is do that a report. acceptable to people here? Folks? Okay. Anything else for the good of the or Yes, Commissioner Peters. Yeah, I, I just, uh, maybe it's because I don't know the procedure and I probably should have saved this one for Gear, for Barry, but, um, you know, there's been a lot of push on the Science Center and and is, is there, I was just wondering if there's any interest in preserving something like that. And, you know, we've done really good with museums uh, in this county that couldn't we make a science center to be something. I just don't know if it's worth throwing that out there or not, but um, there's been a lot of talk about it and, and there's a lot of history with the science center and I hate to see it go away to more condos. Mr. Gerard. You're, you're, yeah, there you go. It hasn't been fully functional for a long time as the science center, the career source owned it for years and sold it 2019, I think, to St. Petersburg, um, to the city of St. Petersburg. They were going to uh, put affordable housing there. Apparently they're not now, um, but I know they're looking into some things. I don't, I don't know that we need to jump into that. Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think if there's a logical nexus somewhere for us, whether it's uh, uh, STEM or economic development or something like that, if there's a logical spot, I, I would support us being involved at a, a, a certain level. I don't want to, because I don't think it is a, unless someone tells me different, I don't think it would be a museum like a TDC type museum. It would have to be under economic development or science or something like that. But again, I would only support it after the city has found their funding, the private donors, and really the biggest hurdle is they're talking about they put in a, a sizable request out of the state which i think is a is a challenge this year so you know if, if those hurdles were met then then i would be interested in having that conversation um and if i could expand that yeah <clears throat> when the career store sold it to the city uh it was largely because it was in need of massive repairs there, there's the building is not in good shape um, and the intent was for the city to tear it down, not to continue the Science Center, because it really needs probably a couple of million dollars worth of repair. And that, that's what they were going after from the state. And so, I mean, okay. that'll be a quick... Good for them. In a couple of months, know whether the state's interested in that or not. Great. Okay. Okay, yep. Anything else? Okay. I, I'm showing it's 20 till 6. Uh, Mr. We got to grab. Mr. Chair, I believe Commissioner Seal is oh, raising her hand. Commissioner Seal, sorry. Well, um, I'm just giving the forward Pinellas report since you, your office had asked me to do that. Um, basically, the bottom line is we approved the um, FDOT's uh, fiscal 2021 to 2025 26 draft tentative work program. I did want, I'll, I'll send the report to all the commissioners, but basically we were cut about $300 million due to state revenues. And um, one of the biggest uh, delays will be the West, um, West Shore interchange. Um, so 
it's they're hoping that as funding comes back that they will try to put it back in the program but it was a big cut so there's many other things on the forward Pinellas uh, meeting report and I'm happy to send it on to you because I know you want to take a break thank you thank thanks commissioner uh, yeah I've got uh, 20 till uh, Barry can we start at like a little, maybe a little after six 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 ten or something Miss, mr. chair huh? is 20 minutes enough time Mr. Chair, my apologies. I just I just wanted to interrupt for a, for a second. I did have somebody who did pre-register from the League of Women Voters on a non-voting item who's raised her hand. I just wanted to ask how you'd like to proceed on that. Are you talking about on the item we just spoke? Correct. On agenda item number 36 related to the Medicaid expansion, there was an individual who had pre-registered. It's a non-voting item, okay. so you don't have to take no, calls I'll, from the I'll, public, I'll, but yes, I just thought. That's fine. They send a letter in. They can speak before we break. Are you sure? Okay. Yes. I just wanted to yes, ask how you'd like you. to proceed. All right. So uh, this is the LWV SPA. I believe just this is Lindsay Grove. Um, Ma'am, if you could just, when you unmute, state and spell your name for the record and state your address. Thank you. Hi again. Uh, this is Dr. Lindsay Grove. Um, that's L-I-N-S-E-Y, last name G-R-O-V-E. I'm at 835 9th Avenue South, St. Petersburg, Florida, 33701. And I, I just want to thank you for letting me speak. I know you all want to go on a break, so I'll try to be really quick. Um, but we just want both the League of St. Pete and the League of North Pinellas would like to voice our support um, for the Medicaid expansion resolution. We recognize that this is obviously a statewide matter, but being able to pass a resolution like this signals to the state that there are constituencies and governments that are impacted by legislation like this and, you know, we support, um, you know, access to affordable quality health care. And that is a national league um, position. And we believe that health care is a right and not a privilege. Um, we know that the impacts of COVID-19 have been far reaching and systemic. The public health and economic toll of the pandemic will not stop with herd immunity. We need transformative solutions to address the challenges caused by barriers to healthcare access, the cost of healthcare for those seeking treatment, and the economic burden of disease on all sectors of our society. Expanding Medicaid in the state of Florida will help ease some of this burden. Here are some of the benefits of supporting Medicaid expansion for enrollees. They eliminate and avoid medical debt and are less likely to file for bankruptcy and have better credit scores and spend more money in the local economy. Medicaid pays for comprehensive treatment of mental health and substance use disorders, which have increased during the pandemic. Medicaid enrollees report their improved health means Medicaid enrollees report that, that their improved health means that they are able to look for a job and keep working, which, is, which will be critical to Florida's recovery. And for local economies like Pinellas County, Medicaid expansion can reduce the uncompensated hospital care provided to the increased number of uninsured due to the pandemic-related loss of income and health insurance. Uh, provides small, and small business becomes an attractive employer because employees would be eligible for insurance. MedEx facilitates entrepreneurship, which is needed as small businesses reemerge. Medicaid expansion reduces premiums of marketplace plans, and this will be critical as the new administration reopens the ACA enrollment. Counties could save millions of local tax dollars because they would no longer pay for health care of residents who would be eligible for Medicaid, and access to behavioral health care reduces days of incarceration. As far as the state budget, expansion reduces the uncompensated hospital care provided to the increased number of uninsured due to pandemic-related loss of income and health insurance. Expansion states have high, higher employment rates among the low-income population than non-expansion states. Um, and, you know, this is already, there are bills in the House and Senate right now that have been filed for this upcoming legislative uh, session supporting the expansion of Medicaid in the state of Florida. So we hope that this resolution will show the state legislature that county level officials and constituents support this policy. Thank you so much. And Thanks. I appreciate your time and your, you know, dedication to our county. Thanks, doctor. Appreciate it. Okay. Now we're going for a break and I'm assuming 15 minutes is good enough. Or do it. Okay. So we'll be back here at six o'clock.
Thank you for indulging us an extra five minutes to get just a little bit of food in our system. Um, so we'll start uh, with item number 37. It's a resolution supplementing fiscal year 2021 budget. Uh, Kat? So agenda item number 37 is a proposed resolution supplementing the fiscal year 2021 budget for unanticip unanticipated fund balances in the Star Center, Surface Water Utility, Capital Projects, Solid Waste Renewal and Replacement, and Water Renewal and Replacement Funds. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay, do any board members uh, desire a presentation or do I have a motion? Approval. Commissioner Long made the motion and Commissioner, uh, uh, Commissioner Gerard, thank you, uh, made the second. Um, any questions on this item? Okay, I don't have any public comments. Uh, can you check, please, Kat? And Mr. Chair, I do not have anybody who has pre-registered on this agenda item, but at this time, if there is anyone who wishes to comment virtually on agenda item number 37, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone. And Mr. Chair, nobody has raised their hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 38. Agenda item number 38 is a proposed ordinance establishing Chapter 42, Article 15 of the Pinellas County Code related to an infectious disease elimination program, including syringe exchange and providing program definitions, requirements, and operational guidelines. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay. Um, any any questions or does anybody want a presentation or do I have a motion? Uh, Commissioner Peters made the motion. Second for Commissioner Gerard. And... Um, I do have one comment, uh, one comment card uh, from Diane Clark, if she's here. Nope, come on. You're waving? Okay. Thank you, Diane. Um, I don't have any other comments. And Mr. Chair, I do not have anybody who has pre-registered to speak on this item, but at this time, if there is any member of the public who wishes to comment on agenda item number 38, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. And Mr. Chair, I do not have anybody who has raised their hand. Okay, thank you. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. <laughs> well, good night. <laughs> All right, um, on to item 39, please. Agenda item number 39 is a legislative petition to vacate submitted by Christopher D. Muller, Laura T. Muller, Raymond B. Bennett, and Deborah J. Schaefer for the 80 foot wide right of way of Illinois Avenue, lying between lots 6, 7, and 8 of block. 135 and lots 9, 10, 11, and 12 of block 130, the map of Sutherland. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Letters of no objection have been received from the appropriate parties, and all interested parties have been notified as to the date of the public hearing. We have received four email comments in opposition to the application. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think probably it'd be a good idea for staff to come up and, and give us an um, update on where we are. Uh, this has been a ongoing project. Good evening, Commissioners. Andrew Bucky, Division Director of the Facilities and Real Property Division. Uh, I have the presentation uh, queued up for you, uh, however, uh, depending upon your choice, we can just hit the highlights since this is the same presentation that was presented to you back in July. Go ahead and just kind of walk it through uh, just so we can get caught Certainly. up to speed. Thank you. Certainly. 
So what we're talking about here is the vacation of an 80-foot ride right away, right away known as Illinois Avenue, uh, 920 Illinois Avenue in Palm Harbor. The applicants are requesting the vacation to increase property size and to retain unpermitted improvements made on the county right of way. This is the general location map and the uh, hatched area in the center is the area that we're referring to as Illinois Avenue and the area that is subject of the petition to vacate. The petitioners own the property to the south of that in the blue color if, I, if I'm getting the color correctly. This is a general location map of the area. Uh, the property in that area borders the Pinellas Trail. This is a larger community view and the area in question is here where I'm highlighting it with the uh, laser pointer. Again, the trail is to the, uh, the east of the property. This is Illinois Avenue looking east. So this is the platted and opened right away, which dead ends into the trail. The Pinellas Trail is on the either side to the uh, far end of that picture. The, the street in front of you is 9th Street. The petitioner's property is on the right-hand side behind all of the foliage. And if I may go back to that, the, uh, the, the hatched line on the right hand of the screen as I'm looking at it is where the uh, property line is. So everything to the left of that is encroachment into the right of way. This is on the opposite side of the right of way, again, along Illinois Avenue. Uh, in the foreground is 9th Street. Uh, the yellow hash line to my left is, again, the approximate location of the property line. So the 80-foot right-of-way runs from one yellow dash line to the other on the previous slide. This is the trail access at the end, east end of Illinois Avenue. Uh, it's somewhat difficult to see because of the overgrowth of the palms, but it uh, ends at the Shell driveway and then proceeds out. The other side would be at the Pinellas Trail. This is looking south on 9th Street at Illinois Avenue. And again, the dashed line, yellow dashed line indicates the uh, property line and everything that is to my right would be encroachments into the right of way. Those improvements are encroachments into the right of way. And you might also notice uh, the blue uh, circle designation there in the shell driveway is the county water line. This is again looking towards the east. Uh, what you see to my right is a, a former garage. I don't believe that is, is there anymore. The petitioners have built a new house, but again, that uh, dashed yellow line indicates the approximate location of the property line. So everything towards the shell driveway away from the garage would be encroaching into the right of way. Another item just to note behind that stand of trees towards the trail uh, is a koi pond that was built within the right of way. This is on, ninth, excuse me, on Illinois again, looking to the west this time. Again, that's that same driveway to the former garage on my left behind the, the square of the yellow line, the dotted line, and it indicates looking towards the west uh, how the encroachments are on the right of way portion of the property county property. This is going back uh, in the history that we have previously shared with you. This is the home back in 2006. And you get an indication of some of the improvements as it relates to vegetation, particularly towards the trail uh, at the, the east end of Illinois Avenue. This is 2007. Some things are starting to appear along uh, Illinois Avenue there, close to 9th Street. This is 2010. Again, you see a substantial increase in the amount of improvements that have been uh, encroaching now into the right of way, both on Illinois Avenue and on 9th Street. So in regards to the petition, county departments have been queried and have objections to the vacation request. Uh, we have also received the 
requisite uh, notifications from the other utilities. Most of the utilities are located on the north side of the Illinois Avenue right of way. Uh, and we can go into further detail about that when Kelly comes up. This is a um, schedule or a history of where we've been since the beginning of uh, the discussion about this particular petition to vacate. Uh, important to note on this particular schedule is that uh, since our last meeting before the board on the 21st of July, at the board's direction, we did meet with the applicant's representatives three times. You'll see in August, October, and December. And although those, those conversations and meetings were very congenial, uh, we were not able to reach an agreeable resolution with the petitioners or the applicant's representative as it relates to the items that the county is still objecting to. So again, the staff recommends denial of the request to vacate the 80-foot right-of-way because it provides public access to and from the Pinellas Trail, has existing county facilities within, in the area, and is intended to be used for in the future to resolve ongoing stormwater issues. And if I may just add to that uh, on the issue of stormwater, uh, Kelly will go into this in more detail, but you will hear from the applicant. They have presented a plan to install a drainage system uh, at the, the applicant's expense. However, we have reviewed, the county has reviewed uh, this proposal and we do not believe, one, that it meets county standards. And we also believe that it will result in increased maintenance costs in the future for the county. Kelly will speak to the, the drainage, to the stormwater, and also to the potential for utility conflicts. Uh, Blake will address the uh, trail access. He will also address the encroachments on Ninth Street, those that need to be removed because they are a hindrance or a concern for the traveling public on Ninth Street. And he'll also address from the Building Development Review Services perspective uh, how we're going to, going to go about uh, issuing a CO or a certificate of occupancy to the petitioners related to their new home. If the board decides to grant the petition to vacate, the, the accompanying resolution would ask for a number of things. Those things would include uh, a full width, 80 foot drainage and utility easement uh, for the county for future use. That the petitioner would be solely responsible for all costs that would be incurred when the county comes to a point where they are ready to install that drainage system. That the petitioners would not add any additional structures or improvements to the area between now and that time that that project went underway. And then also that the petitioners agree to improve a, a trail access to the south, which is currently unimproved. It's at the corner of Ohio and Ninth Street. So those are the conditions of the resolution. So should the board agree to grant the petition? And I'm happy to answer any questions for you. Yes, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So. <clears throat> Thank you for your thorough presentation, both at the last meeting and this current meeting. Um, from the viewing that we had of the trail access, um, it wasn't cute or, you know, it was just trail access. Mm -hmm. So why would we ask that they improve the trail access if we haven't done anything to it as a county? Sure. The reason we're asking for that as a condition of the resolution is that if the petition were granted, then it would no longer be a right of way. We would have that easement, the drainage and utility easement, and the public access to that trail access would no longer be there on Illinois Avenue. So as a consolation, if you will, uh, we spoke with the representatives from the applicant and asked if they would consider improving the unimproved trail access to the south at I Ohio and Ninth Street. And they agreed that, again, if the board agrees to the petition, that that would be a condition that they would proceed forward with. And for our request to improve the drainage situation there, we don't have a proposed date or timeline in which we would want to do that. It's just 
at some point in the future, whenever that might be. Yeah, and I'm going to ask Kelly, if I may ask you to, sure. to hold sure. on to that question. Sure. I, w I can handle any further general questions, but I'll ask Kelly to come up and answer the specific questions related to drainage and then Blake <coughs> correspondingly on the issues. Um, <clears throat> the trail access, why is it not going to be available on Illinois? Well, if the right-of-way is vacated, then the, the trail access would go away because it would no longer be a right-of-way. It would be an, an easement. So we couldn't use that? I mean, the, the, the homes are going to be using it to access their homes, uh, that, that easement. Right. So, My, Go ahead. Yeah, no, just, I mean, why couldn't we just extend it and access the trail there? Or is it just your preference, staff's preference, to do it in another place? I'm going to defer to the county attorney, but my understanding from conversations with our county attorney is that uh, public access is one of the uh, elements of a right-of-way. If you take away the right-of-way, then you take away the public access. So it becomes a different, it's a, it's a different element, if you will, when it becomes an easement area. And, and what you have in your, um, I guess I'll call it the alternative staff recommendation if you choose to approve this um, in reading your resolution is that there would be a retained drainage and utility easement, which is not necessarily the type of easement that would provide, you know, ingress, egress, for, for instance, to the trail. Um, and I, and with some of the improvements and things there, I'm not sure of the logistics and whether it's realistic to, to maintain that. It could be a logistical issue. Um, but as, as proposed by your staff, it, the easement would simply be drainage and utility. Well, it's got to be for access for those homes on the north side too, right? That's my understanding, yes. Correct. So that, that access is different than people walking on it to the trail? Yeah, I believe that access is specific to the, the rights that are granted to those homes to the north as ingress, egress to their property. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, I understand the, the, the move to the other end, which we have already, that it would, I think, do we have the other one already on the, on, the, on the south side of the property, the access there? There is an unimproved access there. Okay. Uh, so, it, so, so we're giving up a public access to the trail? Well, it's not an improved access, Commissioner. Let me be uh, a little more specific. It's, I, it's an opening in that, that area of foliage that leads out to the trail there. There's no sidewalk. There's no uh, bricks that lead a path to the, the trail. Okay. What's being proposed down at the corner of 9th Street and Ohio would be something that meets with county standards. So we would, if you have seen trail connections, which I'm yeah. sure you have, yeah. to other neighborhood streets, that would be what the uh, applicants would be willing to uh, agree to as part of the resolution should you grant the petition to vacate. Yeah. Well, maybe that's just another topic for another day. Okay. as to unincorporated county accesses to trails just seem like there, there's a couple right there that could that need to be improved right so not for another day okay um any qu other questions for mr pupke i like just to preserve some of my questions for the speaker who's going to talk about the stormwater yeah drainage. yeah okay. that's fine thank you anybody else okay kelly thank you commissioners i'll defer to kelly thank you kelly Thank Hi, you, Kelly. Uh, Kelly Levy, Public Works Director. Um, so just a little revisiting, um, you know, one of the things that we look at when we're considering petitions to vacate, our, our code has criteria. And so we look at those and we make sure that we're consistent in what we're recommending bringing forward to you. And one of those elements is whether or not there's a present or future need for the right of way. And this is, includes um, specifically stormwater improvements. So as Andrew stated, uh, we met with the applicant's representative on three occasions uh, to discuss the proposed improvements to address the ongoing drainage issues in the area. And unfortunately, with each meeting, we were largely looking at the same design without any resolution to the issues that we had brought forward. There was one change to the design. The actual pipe material was originally proposed to be PVC, which we do obviously do not allow them in the right of way because of vehicular traffic and the loads. Um, they did adjust that, but the rest of the outstanding items were left unanswered. So one of those was where the discharge pipe actually would come into the county drainage system was sitting a foot below the, um, the ditch bottom. And so if you can imagine the pipe is down here and the ditch bottom's here, the water has to fill up 
until it can flow. And so what we're looking at is called a sumped condition where water will actually be stored in the pipe and become a mosquito issue. And so while we were talking about that particular situation, um, the you know, discussion was that, well, the county can dig that swale deeper. And well, again, these, these types of roadside swales, we like to keep them shallow. Um, it is a very low lying area to begin with. The groundwater table is very close to the surface. So minor grading would be about all we could accomplish anyway. Not to mention the fact that this is not something that was discussed with the property owner on 9th Street as to whether or not they would be happy with a, a change condition in front of, of their home. So between um, that design constraint and looking at us having to maintain a higher level of service in that ditch just to make sure that the water flowed properly, this was not a condition that we could accept. Um, the other part was that the, that the um, discharge pipe where, where it enters the ditch comes in at an angle and that's not a preferred option because basically the water will shoot out, hit the bank and it'll cause erosion. And so there was no resolution to that item either. Um, so we left with that. Um, one of the other items was um, typically in our, our right of ways, our, um, our, our, our graded inlets um, have a 10 foot, 10 square feet on the bottom. They're proposing four. Um, it's something that we could look at, but again, further analysis would need to be done that was not completed in order to really fully evaluate the system. There was um, some safety issues with regard to the proposed grates. They were, the spacing was too wide and, and could catch a bicycle tire or other smaller things. Um, the proposed inlet layout and the grate, the top elevations of the grates uh, would not in any way address the flooding on the north side of Illinois. So that's part of the challenge there. And then there were some minor issues related to the concrete driveway and the trail access that needs um, better dimensions um, on the plan so we can better see what that looks like in, in bollard locations. Um, there are also, the plan kind of calls out a potential conflict with the water line, but there's also a reuse line and other utilities in the area. So after an additional evaluation by our engineer, um, Basically, the Muller's design did not consider impacts beyond Illinois and Ninth. So if you're gonna bring more water into an existing drainage system, you have to look and make sure you're, that you're not causing another problem. So we don't go from having this problem to having another problem to having another problem and kind of kicking that can down the road, if you will. And this was discussed with the applicant's engineer that they needed to analyze the proposed improvements all the way to where the system outfalled to its endpoint, the tailwater conditions, the elevation of where that water discharges, and that was not completed. A high-level assessment, you know, conceptual assessment was completed by county engineering staff that basically looked at the entire neighborhood and various improvements that would that would need to be conducted. And one of the things they determined was that we would need additional conveyance system. Um, in order to accommodate this water coming over. So we would have to make additional improvements for this to work, uh, Kelly, our, our for, design for, to work. For what to work? For our design to work. Okay. So um, we proposed something a little different. Basically our analysis, we, we also looked at, let's step back a little bit, we also looked at um, some of our older LIDAR data. So that LIDAR data, we're able to look at the land elevation and we have a, an older data set that um, was collected before all the improvements were put into the Illinois right-of-way. And what that showed us was that both the north and the south side of the right-of-way were almost at the exact same elevation. And so when we talked last time about the water coming across the trail access and going to the north, well, that's, that's, why, that's what we saw with the LIDAR data is that before all those improvements were in place, both sides of the road were about equal. And now they're not because the south side has been built up with all the improvements. So considering that the applicant, you know, our design basically um, included regrading of the um, south side of Illinois back to its original elevation, um, including pipes and drop inlets coming across Ninth and then going across the North Street there 
and into the drainage system. And then it brought the water across into another system into an ultimate outfall. But it did include more improvements than just simply bringing the water over to ninth because that, was, that did not resolve the problem entirely. Again, that was a high level conceptual design, but it was completed. So considering that the applicant one did not address the remainder of the design comments that we brought forward, did not evaluate the full extent of the impacts, including the tailwater conditions, um, and did not, um, uh, did not include those two elements. You know, we are concerned that vacating the right of way significantly impacts any future alternatives for us to address this. Um, Commissioner um, Flowers asked on a time scale. This was a, rate, a ranked project. It is in our stormwater plan, but it doesn't have a date yet. And so Blake is going to talk about some alternatives that don't require, if, if um, the vacation were not to be approved, uh, a, a path forward that doesn't require immediate removal, but would allow for removal when we're ready to construct. Um, there was some additional information that I wanted to comment on. Um, the presentation that was provided by the consultant, um, the Miller's consultant to us, um, was that there, are no, that there is no flooding concerns out here. And they used Tropical Storm Ada as the, um, as the reason why. And Tropical Storm Ada was largely a coastal flooding event. It was storm surge driven flooding. It was not rain driven flooding. It was not a major rainfall event. Um, our gauge, we have a gauge at B Branch at Omaha. Um, it received approximately 6.82 inches of rain of over about 15 hours. And according to NOAA, that equates to less than a 10 year storm. So it wasn't a significant rain event and that does not dismiss flooding complaints in this community. There was also a comment about the pond at the corner of Ohio Avenue and the trail and the comment was made that the pond functioned without overflowing to the north. Well, yes, this is what we would expect because this was not a significant rain-driven event. Um, there's also some uh, comments about swift mud and compliance in that pond. They, they did submit a complaint against the uh, functionality of that pond and, and whether it was actually maintained to its design plan. Um, in addition to that complaint, our county engineers went out there as well to inspect the pond. They found very minor maintenance concerns. And we did check the Swift Mud Record compliance case. Um, the two elements in that compliance case included the transfer of the permit to the new owner, which has been resolved, and that they have to submit a new statement of inspection, um, which is in progress as of January 12th, 2021. Um, the applicant um, did have a third party statement about, about their design stating that it would work. But again, that, that statement didn't address the design issues that county staff brought up with regard to our standards and with re regard to the maintenance obligations that it would place on the county, the sumped conditions, the outfall issues, um, and didn't address the uh, assessment of impacts to the 9th Street drainage system. So with that, if you have any questions for me regarding the stormwater piece, I'd be happy to answer those or I can defer to Blake so he can come up and talk about um, the trail access, some of the, um, the conversation about the um, access from the other property owners and to their, to their homes and um, some of the conditions surrounding that as well as options to uh, consider the the CO for the property and uh, future use for drainage. So, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, so when we are talking about any potential, potential stormwater sewer improvements that the county would like to do along this 80 foot wide section, you would need to increase the elevation or decrease the elevation? We would need to drop the elevation on the south side. Something that I, I, I should have um, uh, just brought up. The north side of the right of way is completely encumbered with utilities. So there's, um, there's reclaim, there's gas, there's Verizon, um, there's water, sewer, 
Um, we've got all kinds of utilities. So there really is very little option to do anything on the north side. So we have to stay south of that in order to do any, anything at all. And um, we would be you know, bringing that elevation back to its, where it was before all of the unpermitted work was done. And then I, I just for clarification, in the presentation that um, Mr. Putkey gave to us, he stated up on the slide, it stated that there were no uh, issues regarding other um, organizations needing to utilize uh, their, that easement area, but I think you just said there were or are some concerns. Mr. Puckett, can you bring that screen back up, that slide back up? Or am I, did I see that wrong? No, that, that um, the north side is, we have a lot of utilities there. <laughs> so. I think that was it. It was one of the slides with just several bullets. Can't see it over there on the right. Right. So I think that if I may answer your question, we get no objection letters from the utility, so that's different. They don't have I'm any sorry. objection to yeah. the vacation. They understand that there would be an easement that would be required for the utilities within that space. They're not objecting to the vacation based upon what they already have in that space. That's why I asked for clarity, so thank you. Sure. Can you go back to the slide, though, that shows where the um, public um, access would be for that trail? It was like the little bushes, and, and you saw the little shell. Sure. Um, there. Yeah, Oop. I went by it, sorry. Yeah, there. So that's the trail access, correct? That is the current trail access at the east end of Illinois Avenue, the current right-of-way, correct? So, um, Commissioner Eggers, in regards to your question, I don't see why they just, the community couldn't continue to um, access it if they're going to improve it, if the request was for them to improve it. I'm just saying I don't see why it would be closed off to the public. Yeah, that that is um, the improvements there. See the, the block and the palms and stuff. See, that wasn't there. That is all stuff that has been put into the right of way. So it, it's kind of privatized that access, if you will. The proposed, if this were vacated, the proposal was to move the trail further south and have it improved there, the trail access. There's kind of a goat path, if you will. Um, I don't know if you can. Not sure if you can see what the pointer. This is uh, mm -hmm. Ohio Avenue is at the very bottom of the screen as it turns, does it, so if you can see, it's hard to make out the laser pointer, but right about here is where the unimproved trail access is. It's really just a dirt path. This is the area that the petitioners have agreed. If the petition is granted that as part of the resolution, they would improve that trail access to county standards as an alternative to leaving the trail access on Illinois open, they would close that trail access then. So the trail access would move down to the corner of Ohio and 9th Street, and it would be an improved trail access based on county standards. Uh, Jewel, just want to comment real quick on... Sure, and, and if I can add, um, I do have my attorneys watching these um, meetings while they're in progress, and um, the attorney that routinely works with Andrew and his staff um, has shared with me that in her legal review of this, um, keep in mind, um, public right-of-way, the primary purpose of public right-of-way is ingress and egress. So if you are to vacate a right-of-way but maintain an easement for public ingress and egress, legally you have done nothing. Because if you're vacating a right-of-way where the primary purpose is ingress, egress, and maintain an easement for that same purpose, the legal effect of the vacation, it really has no legal effect. Thank you. Whereas maintaining an easement for the other purposes, the drainage, um, utilities, dra drainage, 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 utilities. Sorry, it's not. It, it is fundamentally different than ingress and egress because you are not inviting the public into that area. Commissioner Peters. Yeah, and I, you know we're talking about their proposal, and we haven't really seen it. So 
I haven't seen what that's going to look like. Is there any way we could see that stuff before we continue with more questions? Because I think it's only. Well, I just want to make questions. sure. That, yeah, I hear what you're saying. But yeah. any more questions for these folks? Um, and then I think we had one. I think Blake wanted to just make a, pres a short presentation, and then we'll get to the applicant. Because okay. we're jumping back and forth, and I'm having our time. I know. Yeah. Thank you. Blake, go ahead. Good evening, Blake Lyon, Director of Building and Development Review Services for Pinellas County. I'll keep my comments really brief. Um, the, the primary issue that I was asked to evaluate after we were here in July and spoke with you a little bit more was, uh, we made mention that they, the applicants or the petitioners were rebuilding the home on that property. And that home is anticipated to be complete somewhere in the order of March of this year. And so the concern was when we had originally identified this issue of the encroachments into the Illinois right of way and 9th Street right of way, we have put a condition on that home to withhold the certificate of occupancy until these issues were addressed. And what that effectively would do is prevent the Mullers from moving into their newly uh, built home. And so the concern was that since we didn't have a drainage project currently identified to your comment, Commissioner Flowers, that that would be maybe an unnecessary burden that we placed on them. Given that this is an existing right of way, we have the option and we've proposed this uh, solution to the representatives of this project to bond for the removal of those permits. So what that would effectively do is allow us to um, trade the withholding of the certificate of occupancy if a bond is in place. That bond allows us the ability to make sure that it covers the full sco scope of work for removal of those improvements, and that bond can be exercised when, uh, or the duration of it would be maintained until there was a drainage project identified, and then we would give them the opportunity to put them on notice to say, okay, you would, you would need to remove those improvements in the Illinois right-of-way uh, and if they don't do that, we can exercise the bond and have the work performed using uh, county consultants to pay for, for that effort. Now, I want to be clear, that is specific and was intended solely for those improvements on the Illinois side. We have maintained the position that those improvements that are on the 9th Street right-of-way need to be removed, in large part because that street does maintain constant vehicular activity and there are safety concerns associated with it. There are some hardscape and landscape improvements and they encroach into what we refer to as a recovery zone or a clear zone. So as vehicles are driving north and south on that street, if somebody were to lose control of that vehicle, they don't have the appropriate recovery area to, to correct and they could potentially um, strike some of those improvements. And knowing that those improvements are in the county right away, puts us in a position of liability as a county. So what we're suggesting is that um, consistent with the certificate of occupancy that the, the improvements be removed off of the 9th Street portion of the right-of-way. We use the bond to cover those that are in the Illinois portion of the right-of-way up until the point in time as to which the county has identified a drainage project and then they would be asked to remove. Our preference would be for the property owners to remove that. They happen to own two properties on the west side of 9th Street, so if they wanted to utilize uh, you know, those hardscape and landscape improvements, they could certainly relocate them elsewhere. If our, I can't guarantee you if our contractors were to go out there and do that work, they would be as gentle. So we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to remove it themselves. With respect to the trail access, what we're trying to do is ensure, again, uh, and Kelly's comments were, I'd reiterate, is that it's been kind of, with the improvements, it's been privatized. If somebody doesn't feel like they're inherently welcome to walk through there. It's overgrown, it's been encroached upon. So what we're suggesting is um, that we would go through and, and scale that landscaping back, open that back up and make it a visibly, uh, visually and visibly available for the public to access the trail. Oftentimes when you look at urban design theories, you, you wanna have a clear view, line of sight to, to where your destination is to get out to that trail. It makes you feel safe and more comfortable uh, in that. And, um, in that aspect. So we would want to open that up a little bit. Again, that is our preference. That is our recommendation. Should you disagree with that recommendation, then we've put forth the alternative of the Ohio improvement. But again, the preferred would be to maintain that and, and reestablish that on Illinois. So that's uh, the comments I have for you this evening. If there's any other questions, I'm happy to entertain them. 
Go ahead. So w w for the bonding issue component piece, would that also uh, <clears throat> stipulate that no further encroachment could occur either on the 9th Street side or the, the uh, Illinois side once that bonding was taken out based on what they have there? I'm not talking about the new structure, okay. just where they would be taking so that the, bond. In, bond the bond would be intentionally focusing on the improvements on the Illinois right of way side because we would we would ask that all of the Ninth Street be removed prior to the certificate of occupancy to address those safety issues. But because the Illinois imp uh, improvements are specific and impacting the drainage and the county doesn't have the drainage uh, project identified yet, there's no imminent need to remove those. So the bond gives us the ability to relinquish the certificate of occupancy, but still have some means of affecting that change when it's necessary. And so it gives us that opportunity. So we would work with the uh, project engineer to do that estimated cost work, bond for that work, and hold that bond until until the county has identified that drainage project and the timing of that, that drainage project. Okay. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I guess, um, not sh sorry, <laughs> not sure I have a question. I have a couple of comments. Uh, well, I do have a question. How far into the 80 foot right away are they already? Approximately 30 feet on the Illinois side. On the south side? Yes. Um, okay. Um, I guess uh, in response to your question, Commissioner Flowers, I, um, I can't say that I would feel real confident that they would not continue to expand if we gave them the right of way. I mean, they've been told before that they, they were already into the right of way and they've expanded that more and more and more. So I don't, I don't know, is that something you even write into a bond? Because not, I mean, the, just from the pictures that we saw, from one year to the next or one decade to the next, even if they hadn't done any more planting, those plants that they put in there, the trees that they put in there are massive now. <laughs> and, you know, if you put in a bond today and 10 years from now you want to dig everything up, how do you estimate for that, for one thing? I mean, how do you we would have to estimate the cost of removal and, and again, oh, to I your know, point. Oh, I know, you're talking about big trees by that point. Absolutely. they're already big trees. Yeah. Um, and I guess just to put it in context, we had a, a situation probably a year and a half ago now where somebody was asking for a right of way, uh, I think it was like a 10 foot right of way at a, probably the same width, and I forget where it was, but they wanted to be able to get into their driveway. And well, they couldn't, it was all dirt. They wanted to be able to construct a driveway. And we said no, because people could walk back and forth through that right of way to the next street. And it was a public access issue. And we turned them down. Yeah. And I just wanted, I mean, when I look at that, I, it just annoys the heck out of me that we're talking about moving the trail access because it's already overgrown with the stuff that they put in there. There was a trail access there once. You know, and the people that are north of there now have to would have to go down two, three more blocks to get onto the trail because otherwise it's private property. You can't cross over private property to get on. Even if they had an even if we had an easement, people can't walk through there. Or you could call the police and have them trespassed or whatever. And I think it I becomes think private. We're we're actually giving them when we vacate the right of way, we're giving them that property. Mm -hmm. Just just to put it in context. Mm -hmm. And I think your most of your comments were that if we turn it down, here's some things that we could do to work with them right away and then in the interim kind of thing. What you know, open it up, well, leave this stuff there for now, get the bond to cover it, and then clear up uh, Ninth Street. One of the clear takeaways that we had in July was the concern that we didn't have a drainage project currently identified and, right. and scheduled. And so the bond gave us that ability to address the lack of immediate uh, programs. And Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Um, all right. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Seal does have her hand raised. Oh. You can't see it in the screen. Oh, I certainly can't see that. <laughs> so. But uh, Commissioner Seal. 
Uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> I'm using that great Zoom feature so that I can always raise my hand. Um, so, Blake, um, thank you. did you say that um, they have not done the removal that they need to um, on Ninth Street no, there, yet? There has not been any removal to, to this point. Okay. Um, I did drive out there the other day and looked around the property again the second time I've gone to try to take a look at it. While I was out there, I noticed that, <clears throat> and you can see it in the aerial, um, the other properties they own across the street on Ninth has huge boulders on it right there. Do you see it? Yes, these these properties here. And a pods unit. Is that within our code for this to be allowed? So we had uh, one of the other uh, requests that we made of the applicant is those boulders uh, that were placed were also extending into the Ninth Street right of way and posed again another safety issue for the, the traffic recovery area and clear zone. So we requested they move those out of the right of way and they restack them a little further back on those private properties. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, and so that has been addressed. The pods are something that we typically allow for as a temporary improvement. They've used the property um, that is, I'll say at the corner of Illinois uh, and Ninth, the southwest corner, um, as kind of the construction offices as they've been building the new home. And so they, a lot of the contractors park over there and they use some of that. So the pod is associated with the uh, current construction of the home. And so that would be temporary in nature and, and ultimately be removed. Okay, but I mean, how long has this property been under construction and this particular, um, the boulders and the pods unit the boulders Perfect. have been there, and I, I won't be able to be exact for you, but they certainly have been there probably the better part of five years or more. Um, the pod has not been there that long. I believe the pod's been primarily focused on the duration of the home construction, which a home of this scale and size is not uncommon to be in the order of about 18 months. Okay, thank you. That's all for now. Hey, hey, and Blake, on that, on that picture right there, where is the right-of-way that we already vacated for them? That we uh, the, the Millers own, this is the where the home is being constructed, and they also own this uh, property and this residence here. There was an alley that was along in here, at the south side of that kind of light purple line, and so that was the portion that you all vacated back in So July. that's already been done, so one access point is gone. Yes, so that alley terminated into the trail and so in your July meeting, we, we move forward with that. Okay, that thank issue. you. Anything else for Blake before we bring the applicant for, or applicant's representative forward? Yes. So you said there's a, a safety issue on 9th because uh, for traffic, but since they own all of the property across the street, can they not build in and kind of shift the road so that that's not an issue? So one of the things that we look at from a traffic operation standpoint, when you, especially when you have an uncontrolled intersection like Illinois and Ninth is, is making sure that those travel lanes line up. So if the, if the interest was to take Ninth Street from Ohio, which is down here on the southern portion, uh, the section of Ninth in between Ohio and Illinois, and that were to shift over here further to the west, and occupy the pieces of property that they own um, certainly is something to consider, but getting that realignment and those correcting. So typically what you're trying to minimize or avoid to the extent possible is oncoming traffic facing one another with those offsets. So you either want it offset great enough where they're not facing one another or you want it aligned so it's a continual flow of traffic. And so that poses a little bit of the challenge um, to shift it within the existing right-of-way. The only other alternative would be to actually realign the right-of-way entirely and push it even further over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, um, <clears throat> probably a good idea. To, let's bring the uh, applicant's representative forward. Um, 
uh, Kat uh, has 20 minutes for presentation. Is that right? Okay. So we have a clock. Oh, Kat, a clock all set up. Kat, thank you. Huh? Yes. Go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Todd Pressman, 200 Second Avenue South, number 451 in St. Petersburg, Florida. We appreciate your time here this evening. We have, I have with me today our engineer who will speak in response to a lot of the staff comments and also Mr. and Mrs. Mueller, Dr. and Dr. Mueller who are here. So we're here to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I think you've had quite a background given to you, so I'll proceed with a presentation and then Tom, the, Tom Radcliffe, the engineer, will speak as well. Uh, as staff has indicated, we move forward with direction from the last commissioner's meeting to have a number of conversations with the staff and present plans to them and try and work out those issues which we were not able to do. Uh, oh, there we go. Primarily, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we're here to address a wrong in the past and to make good on it and to make sure that we go above and beyond what the county needs, what neighbors and residents need to make sure the county's whole and the residents and citizens are whole. And we believe that we made a very good effort to do that. I think everyone is well aware of the vacation easement area that we're discussing tonight. To clear up any confusion, because uh, there was some confusion, um, staff came forward and wanted to eliminate this access point on Illinois. But I want to be very clear, it's only two lots to the, north, to the south where there's an existing trail access. There was no access in this other area that was vacated. That's never been an access to the trail. That's not been something that the public has lost. So moving this access point and closing it to this trail access, and we will be creating the Taj Mahal of Fred Marcus trail access points. Again, just two lots to the south, not two blocks. So staff's main concern, or one main concern has been stormwater, which it clearly is something that is gonna occur in the future. But we look closely at Tropical Storm Edit as one example that came through. And as staff indicated, there were six plus inches of rain. But the interesting thing about that storm is that it came in two spikes. That makes a huge difference in terms of talking about 10 year or 20 year floods that Tom will talk about. Those are inundations rather than a period of days of constant rain, which affects a system much differently. We went out and took pictures immediately after, and this is what we found, which was no problems of any kind. This is on the trail, and this is on 9th Street. And this is the vacate area immediately after Etta from the other location, or from the other side. Now, the, st the staff raised concerns about this pond, which Tom has looked at and Swiftman has looked at, and it functioned beautifully. There's an overflow feature, uh, which you can just make out there a little bit, which acted beautifully and functioned beautifully. Now, what we brought forward to the county is through Tom Radcliffe, our engineer. Tom has 30 plus years of hundreds of drainage projects and experience to bring through a pipe through the trail, through the vacate area to 9th Street. This would be a cost of approximately $80,000. Now, we know staff had concerns about this. So we put this out to a third party review, an experienced engineer which is John Landon, some of you may know him. He's had another 30, 35 years of drainage projects, hundreds of drainage projects that he's done. We asked him to review both conflicts with utilities and to be sure that this drainage design would function if it's needed. And he responded to us in a letter that it would function beautifully and did not see any conflicts with utility lines. Now, in regard to the trail access, this is the current trail access to the south. It is yours. It doesn't function very well. Clearly, it's all dirt, as you can see, and broken up a few uh, concrete uh, pervious pieces. 
So what we're gonna do, and you can see this is a little closer, some of the uh, current status of it. So what we're gonna do is we're going to do a, a double access point, steel bullards, gonna concrete it over, sod it, and take all the overgrowth, cut it all back, make it a beautiful location. Probably about 20% of what you see here, just give you a rough idea. That's an applicant cost of $10,000 if we approve the vacation. So this will be a dramatic improvement to what the public has seen and what's out there. You've seen the existing right-of-way improvements. And I think it is important to say or to note that no one has ever complained about the improvements. Uh, there's never been anyone uh, on the county record that complained about them or had a concern about them. They're certainly a beautification for the area, clearly over the right-of-way line, they shouldn't be there. The Mueller's will speak with that. So in summary, Mother Nature showed us no flooding issues. County, because of circumstances, how they're proceeding, which is not a, not a negative comment, but a drainage project eventually is gonna occur at some time, it leaves us in limbo. We're trying to go as far as we can to make sure the county and the citizens are whole, and the applicants have a substantial fee that they will be paying for public projects. I will make a couple comments in regard to staff comments. Um, the uh, boulders across the street were moved at uh, request of staff. Those were taken care of. We've held off on 9th Street. Uh, the direction we received from the commissioners was to try and work through these issues and then move forward with whatever your result is. And um, the condition the staff is asking for an 80 foot wide drainage easement if the vacation is approved is, is unacceptable simply because we're here seeking a vacating of that and then giving back a 40 foot easement. So that's a condition that would make uh, this request uh, unsubstantial in any regard. Um, I'll leave the uh, next few minutes to Tom Ratcliffe, our engineer, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Thank you, Todd. Sure. Uh, my name's Tom Radcliffe of Aris Barnes Stevens. Uh, do you need address and all for the record or? Uh, use 3046 Kevlin Court, Safety Harbor, Florida, which is my home address. I'm going to correct the record on a couple of points. The first one, uh, unfortunately, Todd has it incorrect. I've been practicing drainage here in Pinellas County for 45 years, uh, not 30. Uh, worked on many hundreds of drainage complaints. This, the the uh, second thing I want to correct staff made the presentation that the petitioner owned the property to the south of Illinois. That's not correct. The petitioner includes the property owners north of Illinois. So uh, again, I wanted that to be legally correct in this meeting. The petition is by parties on both sides, both, both the north and the south of the right of way, as it should be, as would be required by law. Uh, the next thing I really want to say is I'm frustrated. For months and months and months, we've been meeting and we've been discussing, and I've asked the same question repeatedly, please identify the drainage problem. Because if you identify the problem, that's what I do. I fix those kinds of things. I design solutions to those problems. And what have we gotten? We're told about a water puddle on the north side of Illinois. And what that, when I go out and look at it, invest my client's time and money to go out and see what, what this problem is all about, it's an area where one of the petitioners scraped dirt to build a house on the adjacent lot they owned and they left a hole. Yes, it puddles water. And no, it's not a drainage problem. It's a water puddle. Uh, then I'm told about a detention area that's overflowing across the trail and flooding the trail. So what do I do? I invest my client's time and money. I research the records. I find the plans on it. I contact Swift Mud. My gosh, the county is saying there's a problem here. And what do I find? I find a, a pond that's been designed for a 25 year storm 24 hour duration in accordance with the law that's functioning properly. I don't find an issue. 
I'm told, okay, we've got water coming across the top of the trail and it's gonna gather on the, on the west side and we need to drain it. So what do I do? I go out and I find a solution to the outfall problem so I can take care of that little bit of drainage. I propose some piping. You all have seen the plan. Uh, we all discuss it. And by the way, I selected PVC, A2000 PVC pipe rather than concrete pipe, just strictly because of the depth issues at the other end. I can lay it a little shallower. I don't have the sump issues that are being uh, pointed out now as a problem with, with, the, with the concrete pipe. I recognize it's not generally used in the unincorporated area of Pinellas County. Many of the cities do use it. DOT approves it. There's no reason why you shouldn't approve it, but it's not approved. But the whole purpose was to make it easier to maintain, but that's okay, it could be concrete. Anyway, to some degree, I've been given the mission of fighting a cloud, solve a problem, but I can't point and tell you where the problem is or what it is. The second thing that I'd like to address is the maintenance of utilities. One of the things that's been said is if we vacate, the, vacate this right away, we won't be able to maintain the utilities. We've, from the very beginning, we've said, and stand by it, if you vacate the right of way, you'll be given back an easement to maintain the utilities. There's a water line out there, it's a small service line, it's serving basically the houses owned by the petitioners. It needs to be maintained. There's a sanitary sewer line, it needs to be maintained. There's a reclaimed water line, it needs to be maintained. There's a Duke Energy line, it needs to be maintained. And these things are maintained in private easements every day. There's nothing magic about it. Uh, I have a plan here that you all have seen, staff has seen. It shows exactly where all of those utilities are. They've all been field located. There's no, no issue with maintenance here. We can see outside of the fact that the uh, little two inch water line that serves the houses is gonna be underneath the driveway. And all someone has to do is ask and we'll relocate that too and get it out from under the concrete if, if need be. Anyway, uh, beyond that, I'm here to answer any questions. Not right now. Nope. I'm not, I'm not Mr. seeing any right now. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Seal does have her hand raised. You can't see her okay, in the- Okay, Commissioner Seal has a question. That was from before, sorry. <laughs> Oh, the hand raise was from before? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, no yep, question. I needed to figure out to, to lower my hand. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, Todd has just asked that I speak to the six inches of rain versus longer, longer periods of rain. When, when you analyze drainage, you can't really say how do I express this? Six inches is this given storm. It depends on how fast it happens, okay? If you had two inches of rain, but it all occurred in a few seconds, it, it would cause tremendous flooding. If you have six inches of rain and it occurs in 15 minutes, it, it'll ca cause tremendous flooding. If you have 12 inches of rain and it occurs over two days, chances are no one would notice. So, so to simply say, because it was only six inches, it's not significant. That's not correct from a, from a drainage standpoint. You have to look at when that, how long a period of time that six inches really happened, what the most intense portions were. Hello, commissioners and staff. I'm Laura Mueller. I'm one of the homeowners and the petitioners for this issue. Uh, my address is 920 Illinois Avenue in Palm Harbor, Florida. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to discuss this issue and understand that you have many other more pressing issues, but I wanted to reiterate that it was never our plan to landscape on the county property. When we started landscaping our property after we purchased it in 2004, we unknowingly planted on the easement. You know, several years later, we received the red tag item in 2008 when the reclaimed water was being installed. And when that was brought to our attention, on the, um, the staff's presentation, they showed the issue of 2010 as if we had continued years after that, but that was during, the, that was the last project that we had along 9th Street. 
the, we contacted um, the county to ask what we should do to help resolve this issue. And we were told to lower our planting beds to, uh, that were near the road down to 18 inches and to remove the boulders that were near the street. We, we did all that, we thought it was resolved because we didn't hear anything further until we were pursuing this project of the new house construction. So a few other issues that I wanted to address in terms of the trail access, it's never been our intention to close down the trail access. In fact, that little gravel path that they showed the shell drive, we added gravel going out to the trail from our, the gravel drive that we've replaced two or three times over the last 15 years of living there. And every weekend there's golf carts that come and park there and use that trail access to go to the stilt house that's right behind our property. The, and our, our goal with vacating the easement and then giving back the 40 feet is to help maintain that access and allow the golf carts to continue to come there and park and use the trail access as they have been. So, and then in, we hope that you can help us to come to a resolution to address these issues so that everyone's needs are met. Thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, we appreciate your time and your consideration. Thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead, Pat. I have a question for, for Todd. You said something about uh, giving the right away and then then asking back for a 40 foot easement is not acceptable. Did I hear that right? <clears throat> the staff is indicating a condition to, con as I understood it, to maintain and keep an 80 foot wide drainage easement. Right. We're asking to vacate 80 feet, but give 40 back. So as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, then in the future, the county could come and demand any kind of drainage project that they want, which is what we're trying to address, to be kept for the county in a 40-foot easement in the center. Well, if I understand that correctly, right now. I'm sorry. I just, just want to remind you that it is county property right now. It, it is county property, of course. It is county property, Commissioner, so and we have respect for that. And what we've done is try very hard to address the specific concerns that your staff has raised why that shouldn't be vacated. And I think we made a great effort at it. The commissioners so, may, may feel differently. So you're talking about having a 40 foot easement down hmm. the middle of the street. Yeah, sorry. That, that's correct. What's proposed is vacating 80 feet and then providing easements for the center 40 feet. But Kelly's already said that there are a lot of <coughs> utilities already in the north side of that road. Um, go ahead, Tom. You know what? Uh, yeah. Got, Todd, you've got that. Excuse me. I was talking to Mr. Preston. I'm sorry. Sorry, Commissioner. I was addressing what he said. I'm sorry. And frankly, you know, you don't work for the county. So I appreciate that you're a wonderful engineer and all that. We have engineers as well that are telling us something completely different. So we I have two stories now and I pay these people. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I, so it's already, the, the plantings are already 30 feet into the, into the easement. And so the next 40 feet would be, or into the right of way, next 40 feet would be easement and then there'd be 10 more feet of vacated right of way on the other side. Is that what you're saying? Did you want to Because I'm not sure that's, that's sure something that it, Kelly can work with. No, right. Go ahead. Basically, I don't care what you have to say. What we're proposing is we, I'm sorry, I need the microphone. What we're proposing to remain as easement area, to be given back as easement area, is that area in green. It's not really 40 feet, it's 45 feet. It extends as, uh, as large as 55 feet uh, as it re reaches the west end. What it doesn't do, Todd, can you hold that a second? What it doesn't do, it doesn't affect the improvements along this area right here, which is the north end of the client's property. Uh, basically, any of this area, that from our proposal, we'd be more than happy to see all of that easement if you want. I, I've heard different things too. I but didn't this hear is from what, Kelly that that was going to work for them. 
if they have to do a drainage project down there. So because there's already all that other stuff in there. Yeah, there is maybe a I need to be asking Kelly this question. Yes, Commissioner, there is a difference of opinion. We feel that it would work, and you've heard from Kelly and the staff, they believe it would not work. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that difference of opinion. Any? I have to, I, I have to tell you, we have not seen those plans, <clears throat> nor do I really care to, but I want to, I want to hear from Kelly. Could you bring up the presentation again very quickly? Just, um... <clears throat> I'm sorry, can you bring up the presentation? Thank you. Sorry about that. Let's see. I'm just going to go forward here a minute. Yep. Okay. So if you look very closely there, um, I'm going to see if I can highlight it. Right there is the water line, and it runs back. And then you've got sewer, and you've got reclaimed. There's gas. So the thing is, the only benefit here, I mean, to the vacation is to the molars. Because the, I mean, from here, you know, right where the water, that's the cap for the water line. From there north, is so encumbered with utilities that nothing can be constructed there anyway. So a, an easement, you know, the vacation really is to the benefit here because this is all right of way. This is where the proposed drainage improvement would be where all these planters and things are. So the benefit is here. Here is already encumbered. And that is why the gas company and Progress and uh, Duke Energy and, and Verizon and Pinellas County Utilities for water, sewer, and reclaimed didn't object because they need an easement here that, that it's already encumbered. And, and an easement would be required over here and improvements in this area would be next to impossible because it's already encumbered. But, th but that's not what they're saying, that there's room there to put the, the line in. And you're saying there's not room to put the line in. To put, put stormwater? The, yeah. No, the design that they proposed did not work. We reviewed it three times, provided feedback three times, and the only design change that was provided was to the pipe material. So our engineers reviewed this three times. They've had, they had conversations. They said exactly what they needed to see and, and the plans were not changed to resolve the conditions. The other issue that is very important is that the, there was a request to ensure that the drainage analysis included fully understanding what bringing additional water from this area to 9th Street, what happens? Because ultimately that water has to get out and we have to make sure that the system can, the capacity is there all the way to the outfall, and they were asked to look at that, you know, to the ultimate tailwater condition, the elevation of the outfall, and that analysis was not done either. So, you know, again, that's and giving us, I don't even know where it would be, that this is, this is the water line, right? There, all the way back. So there's a conflict there. There's a reclaimed water line out here somewhere. Sorry, there's no marker, gas, there's sewer. There's private. So the north, the north part of that right of 80 foot right of way is relatively encumbered with utilities. And once you look at the required offsets from any pipes that you construct, you're very limited in what you can do on the north side of this. So is it, do you all, are you all in agreement that that there is a natural flow of, flow of storm water to, to that street? Is there agreement between both sides that there, that, that, that there is a flow that would go there and that therefore there is gonna be a need for a project? 
Yes, I mean, okay. that, that was discussed at the meeting we had back in June where the, the comment was made that the, storm, the, that the reason for the surcharge, so what is happening is we have a large stormwater conveyance system that runs west down Ohio. During very large storm events, that pipe is completely full of water and it surcharges. So you've got that stormwater pond from the private um, commercial property during those conditions, it would, nor you know, under normal, like, like Tom said, that 24 hour duration storm, it would discharge to the south into Ohio. And that's what, I mean, what it did during tropical storm Ada. Um, during larger storms, when the Ohio system is at capacity, that system cannot discharge to the south. It surcharges to the north and runs up the trail and comes across there. And that is the, you know, been the complaint at that area for a number of years. And it has, it's a, it's a known hot spot. It's on our map. We know we need to address it. It's been ranked, but as you all know, we have tremendous needs and things get, um, you know, put into a queue and we do our best to address them um, as timely as we can. This will ultimately be an area we have to address, but in the analysis that our, our staff did, a conceptual plan for the entire neighborhood, it will be more than just this. And we really would like to treat this as a system versus trying to piecemeal a solution. Okay. I would also like to add just on the record that there was a, a statement made that there was unknowns. And I have in front of me right now a certified letter sent to Mr. and Mrs. Muller in, on 2018, 20, excuse me, 2011, in 2011, advising them of the violations in 2008 that still had not been resolved, more improvements that had been placed between 2008 and this, this letter, and advising them that they need to be removed. So there have been conversations over the years about this ongoing issue, and um, those letters were sent. So. Yes, uh, Commissioner Long. Yes, um, Todd, I have, a, I have a question. Maybe you know the answer to it. So, <clears throat> you know, I think we've really worked hard to try to be abundantly fair in terms of reaching a conclusion that could potentially be a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. What I'm really struggling with is why on earth when you have this kind of property, would you continue to exacerbate the situation by continuing to improve in an area that you already know you shouldn't be doing? Why would you do that? Well, if I may, with Commissioner, if I may, uh, in regard to Kelly's comment, um, there's benefits on both sides. Uh, what the Mueller's are proposing is a drainage project that the county actually is going to pay for at some point of $90,000. And they're going to improve, cut the overgrowth of a beautiful access point that the county would have to pay for. So I would just say to you in terms of benefits, what we tried to do here is trot forward what we think makes the county and the citizens whole. Um, in, regard to the, in regard to your question, um, it's very difficult for residents who buy a home and there's vacant land, there's no fences, there's no poles, there's no markers that, oh, this is a county right away, don't cross here, don't go beyond this. They just saw it as vacant lands. And as they continued to upgrade and maintain the access point as it is now, it became something that they were working with in terms of both what is the public uh, access point and the lands that they were looking at for the landscaping improvements. I mean, the reality is there's hundreds of these across the county and they're not found until there's a need for an improvement or a code officer sees it. Um, these little tiny patches of lands are, are everywhere. Um, and that's just, <laughs> It doesn't make it right or wrong, but you've asked me why, and that's the best answer I can give you. 
Yes, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pressman, is there any particular reason why, if the Mueller's are willing to put forth $80,000 to um, help, help with a, a drainage situation, why is it that they won't comply to the recommendations of the standards from county staff for the engineering specs? Well, what, what we were directed to do with the commission was to discuss and interact with their staff to see if we could come forward with some type of plan or some type of improvement. We had two phenomenally experienced engineers who, again, I'm not gonna beat a dead horse on it, who have uh, designed hundreds of projects. So our attempt was a direction from the commission which was nice enough to let us proceed for, again, another few months to try and work through these issues. So there will be compliance at some point. Certainly there'll be compliance on 9th Street. We understand that we accept that. But we move forward to address the issues uh, on Illinois at the direction, at the nice direction of the commission to try and come up with solutions. But every time that you guys came back, I wasn't here, I guess, prior when it started, but every time they came back, it, the county appeared to hold firm to what their recommendation was going to be for compliance in order to meet the standardization for the installation of appropriate pipe fitting. Now, I heard what the gentleman said about utilizing PVC pipe, and the only time I know about utilizing any of that is to use institute form when you're putting in a lining in a pipe because you want to extend the life of the pipe, but not to be the pipe. I'm not an engineer, but I've been an elected official on the city and county levels, and I'm just saying, I've never known that to occur. Um, I love that. That's great. But, but that's the truth. I mean, the city of St. Pete, yeah. That's true. I, I will say this, though, and this is no disrespect to the Mueller's. This is no disrespect to the engineer or Mr. Pressman. But when I bought my home, there were markers that told me where my boundaries were. So I know where my property lines in and begin for city utilities, the Duke Energy Pole, Spectrum, and their wires, the whole nine yards, so much so that I know my neighbor put their fence four feet onto my property, but I'm a good neighbor. So there is, I just, I'm sorry, I'm not going to buy that they didn't know that they were building in the right of way from 2008 until now, and that's what I really have the issue with. No land is free land or doesn't belong to anybody. It doesn't belong to you, so it belongs to somebody. So even if it wasn't the county, you still would be encroaching on someone's property. That's the issue I have. Beyond that, the other concern I have is if you want to make things right and if you really want to do what's needed and you're willing to put up $80,000 for a, a stormwater sewer piece, $10,000 for a... Um, piece to go to the trail, then what's, what's so bad about doing it with the, using the specs that the county is asking so that it's up to cold standard, what have you? Looking at that alleyway or that driveway, I don't see where, when you look at the average size of stormwater pipes, I don't even see where that would be wide enough. If it were that, it would still be kind of tight when you're looking at stormwater um, pipe projects and you're putting that stormwater, those stormwater pipes in for future growth, because you're not gonna do it for what the growth is right now. You wanna look at holding capacity for whatever happens in the future. So yeah. the, that's what I, I mean, I, I hear about the bonding component piece, but even with that, at some point, they're still gonna have to dig up the brush, uh, the, the trees, and take out the, the um, brick and all of that. It's cute, I mean, I'm not gonna take that away from it. It is nice, but it's just, it's. It was just done wrong, um, uh, unfortunately. So I'm sorry. No, it's okay. No, I, I think your points are, are well taken. Um, so the question here is, is that um, there's an 80-foot right-of-way, <clears throat> and we're going to have the easement on how much of the property that you currently have would you keep as, a, as, a, as your property? It, it wouldn't be the easement. Is it 30 feet, 40 feet? Uh, 20 feet go, would go to the south. 20 feet would go to the north. Okay. And so the 40 middle is the 40 middle will be the easy 40 is the middle yes yeah um, and i don't know how much property line the property they need of that 20 feet um, i'm just trying to find a compromise here 
because I'm not I'm not I'm not feeling that we're you know we're moving in this direction. So the compromise would be can if they can build it on the south side at some point, they're going to have to take some of that 20 feet. So well, that would be the bond option, of course. No, no. I'm saying, what if they take 10 feet? Only give you 10 feet. Commissioner, there is only 10 feet on the part of the property where the improvements are made. That's I thought it was, that's one of the issues. Correct? I thought it was 20. How the far does the, how, the, the, the vacation? How far do the improvements come? Because you're you're going from middle of the road out, <coughs> yet they've already encroached 30 feet. Encroach 30, and then 20 feet goes to the south. 20 feet goes to the north. I got it. I'm just trying to come up with something that's different than what you're asking for. You're not going to, I'm saying you're not going to be able to preserve all of that. You're wanting to preserve all of those improvements. That's our intent. I understand yeah. that. And I'm trying to say you can't. You're going to only preserve half of those improvements. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're happy to move forward but with any direction the commission is so inclined. If, if, that, if that accommodates the, 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 the county's efforts to put a line in when when that project comes due they don't want it on the north side they want it on the south side so what we're you know yes but in regard right? to a vacating half goes to the north half goes to the south if the commission okay. is so inclined to move forward with 10 feet and the staff is acceptable to that which i don't think they can make an immediate judgment that would certainly be a direction we would be happy to go again any direction the commission is inclined to go yeah well well, obviously, the current one is not working. Yes, sir. So, so I'm just trying to come up with the if we can move the improvements to the south side or to the south side of that right of way and take only some of that. But I don't know if we need all of it. Do we need all of it, staff? And, and you can address that. But remember, on the ninth street, those are hardscape improvements that they've addressed it as a safety concern. So a lot of the improvements re, uh, from staff standpoint need to go regardless. And then the other piece where you, you, you could see the other encroachment, you leave nothing left to put future drainage systems in if in fact those improvements aren't removed. That's, that's the difficulty, the reason they haven't been able to come up with a staff recommendation. Yeah, the fundamental disagreements are in regards to the, the design of the drainage system, which we've talked about already, that. We don't believe that the design that they proposed meets our standards or would create a future maintenance issue. The other part that we've been talking about uh, just in the last few minutes is that we have maintained that we need that portion on the south that is currently encumbered by the improvements for the drainage improvements in the future because the balance of the right of way to the north is already encumbered. There are conflicts there. Uh, there's the water line and there are the rest of the utilities that Kelly uh, spoke about. So when we've discussed in that 80 feet of right of way what we need, where we need the drainage to go is in that south side, which is currently encumbered by the improvements, because that's really the only area that is available for the drainage improvements of the future. So, so, you, so bifurcating or, or. I understand. So you'd have to remove all of it to accommodate your drainage project. Sure, because you understand, I know that you do, that you, you not only need the space for the installation, but you need space on either side for the maintenance. We've talked about that in relation to other so vacations. So that's all I was asking. You need all of it? Yes, sir. Okay. So there's no compromise there. Excuse me. Go ahead, Commissioner Long. You had it. Yeah. I, I wanted to know, for the sake of the Mueller's, if, if we do not grant this vacation, then how yes, long... How long um, would it be before you think you would be using, needing it for the storm? In other words, I'm trying to find out, like, you're not going to decide tomorrow that you're going to need it next month, are you? No, and I believe that Kelly has spoken to that, I, and she can come up and give more specifics if she has them. I would like to know that because But the, the understanding, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Commissioner, is that right. it has been identified as a need, but it has not yet been identified cool. in a schedule as a project, which is why we've talked about the bonding aspect of the certificate of occupancy, that if the petition is not granted, then as a condition of the certificate of occupancy, they would bond for the removal of those improvements when the time came for that need to occur. And then what would be the length of notice that they would have in order to get it done? 
think we would need to work with them to determine what that time frame would be. We would need to establish, of course, at this time, what that amount of money would be. And someone brought up earlier about the, the value of that over a period of time. And you'd have to, I would assume, put some kind of an escalator on that to be able to say this is a, a number 10 years out related to what's there, perhaps, as well as the growth that may occur in that time period. But that would be how we would approach it, is say this is the, the number. And in terms of the notice, obviously, we want to be good stewards and we want to be uh, good representatives to the citizens that we would give them due notice to remove those improvements whatever time we thought was necessary. So, so they've had more than a decade to enjoy these improvements. It sounds to me like we're looking at at least another decade before we that comes back up on our agenda. Maybe even more. We don't know. Correct? I, I would. That's okay. <laughs> I, I, I would doubt that it's going to be two decades or anything like that. It is, um, you know, we were looking at it in our six-year plan. But to your point about notice, there would be absolutely no problem with providing them, you know, when it is officially programmed in the CIP and what year that is for design and construction. And so that they are fully aware of our intention of when design and construction would be. And that way that would give them more than sufficient, probably give them several years to make plans to, you know, uh, if they wanted to relocate some of those improvements to that area that we recently vacated over the summer or their other properties that they own. But there would be a lot of time you know, for that to occur. And then just to be clear, so there's no ambiguity and not to be uh, repetitive, but th this, this family has known for many years already that they were in violation with these improvements, correct? Correct, yes. They're, um, you know, I brought with me the, the letter from 2008 that um, also included a series of pictures showing that it was actually during the installation with the equipment out there and everything. At that point in time, they were advised that those, those improvements were be to removed. They were not. In 2011, the then uh, manager over stormwater, Kim Tracy, um, in coordination with the attorney's office and I think Pete Yock was CC'd, so some other kind of stuff, they were again advised that during a routine inspection of this area, the encroachments had expanded and the 2008 encroachments not resolved, and they were advised that this needed to be addressed immediately or it was going to be provided to the county attorney's office for further um, furthering of the issue. Yes, it appears that that probably didn't happen. i sorry, I don't have anything more on the history of that. It kind of predates me. That's all right. But we did, we did find that letter in the file, a certified, certified letter. Commissioner Gerard, are you, you finished? I'm sorry. I am. Thank Commissioner you. Commissioner Gerard. Thank you. Uh, just a question about putting up a bond. Um, I understand you could put an escalating clause in it. So if they put up a bond, that means they would have X amount of time to remove what we needed removing. I guess this is an attorney question. Or we would do it ourselves. Correct. I, I see Blake coming up, but let me try to at least answer okay. part of your question. I mean, Bonds are typically put into place because it gives us a financial guarantee that if, um, you know, the property owners here, the Mullers, do not move forward with what we anticipate, then we would have that bond basically to, to cash in to accomplish the work ourselves. And, like, I don't know if I've got anything to add. Yeah. The only other thing I would add is that, um, to Kelly's point, we would provide ample notice Right. of the project and the schedule, we'd have to go through to Commissioner Long's question. We'd have to design the project. They'd have the opportunity. So we would notify them of our intent to have that, you know, work executed. If it's only at that point, if the work wasn't done in a timely fashion, that we would call the bond, foreclose on the bond, get the bonding agency to release those monies, and we would use those monies to contract and have that work performed okay. ourselves. And, and one thing, if I could add as well, just from, again, from a legal perspective, um, you know, say there was a different family there, you know, on down the road, this would give yeah. us the ability to know that those improvements would be removed without having to resort to litigation to accomplish that. Commissioner Peters. Thank you. I have some questions for Kelly, if that's okay. Kelly, please. Sorry, Kelly. 
You're getting in your 10,000 steps just in this meeting. You so, have no idea how much I appreciate that because all I do is sit in Teams <laughs> meetings all day. So, <laughs> Yeah, especially these days. Um, so I, I just want to be clear. Um, the Mueller's are offering to make some improvements um, at their cost. And so you said that that drainage wouldn't work because you didn't know the end result. There wasn't enough information for the end result, correct? There were multiple issues. So the first was that, so where the pipe was gonna come across, come down Illinois, a diagonal di and diagonally across to the north side of Ninth. And where it was coming into the ditch, the end of the pipe is basically a foot below the bottom of the ditch. So it creates a sumped condition. It's undesirable. The pipe stores water. We deal with mosquito breeding. The idea was, the, the request was, well, you could dig it deeper, and that is quite challenging in this area. This is why we have shallow swales in this area, because the groundwater table is very close to the surface, as is out here. Um, and also, that is, uh, you know, I don't even know that it would be feasible, but it's not something that was discussed with those property owners that are on that corner. Uh, they were not part of these conversations. Um, that was part of it. The um, the. The, set, the other part was yes, there was no um, analysis out to the tailwater, which was advised that needed to be done. Our engineer did that and found that other improvements were necessary in order to accommodate that water and get it to its ultimate endpoint. So it wouldn't be a $90,000 project, it would be more than that. Um, the other, the other, some of the other issues were that the pipe, instead of coming in at like the head of a ditch, so you see like most, End treatments will come in at a ditch, like you know, right at the end, so that your flow line is straight. Instead, theirs comes in at an angle, so it's aimed at the north bank of the ditch, which will cause erosion. Those were some of the issues, not all of them. There were a number of design issues that our engineering team looked at and brought forward that were unresolved. Okay, thank you. I just, um, I'm disappointed in that. Um a different resolution or some kind of compromise wasn't um, come up with, um, especially given that they own so much land on that area that, um, I, I, you know, where there's pictures in our, in our files of flooding in 2011, I don't know if y'all looked at the pictures in there, but um, clearly there is a flooding problem and that's problematic. And uh, is it, so is there, there, I guess, Blake, do you feel that there is no more further communications for a, an agreement or a compromise? I just want to know that if you feel that you've exhausted everything on this one, because it's quite beautiful property, you know. It's we do believe that, that we have gone round and round on this issue and, and that we're at an impasse. Probably, um, Kelly, to your point about the larger picture, whether it's their project that they're proposing or the one that you'd be proposing, you're going to still have to address that larger picture, correct? I just want to make sure I yeah. understand that incremental difference between the two. I mean, not that, you know. Yes, the, um, you know, our engineering team went ahead and looked at the entire area, and there were a number of improvements. Um, that would really be necessary to right. um, address drainage in this issue in this area, but simply bringing the water from here over to the Ninth Street ditch didn't resolve it on its own. You needed to continue it all the way to the ultimate outfall. Yeah, but, I, but my point is, is that if we do it or they do it, it's going to need more work down downstream. Correct. Yeah. It needs so, more so. work, and we are also there are also other drainage issues in this immediate area. I understand, but the point is, is that it's going to that greater picture is going to have to be done either way. You, you can't just do it. Just you wanted to look at the entire effect downstream. Yeah. Correct. So, um, okay. I, um, I the people that I had here on the list were Todd Pressman, Tom Radcliffe, Laura Mueller. Uh, I have Chris Mueller. Um, as the pr proponents, um, and those folks have all spoke. Uh, Chris Mueller didn't speak. Uh, did he want to speak? No? You're good? Okay. And then we had an, uh, one other person, uh, uh, Michael Purdy. Um, and, and come on up, Mike.
Michael Purdy, 930 Wisconsin Avenue. I'm going to deviate from my prepared remarks to state simply that drainage plan proposed will not work. I've been dealing with the drainage for 20 years, and that won't solve it. Um, Pinellas County alone should be tasked with solving this problem. Now, five agenda items behind us in July, this commission approved the updated Palm Arbor Community Plan. You can't suggest you support the principles of the comprehensive plan and the vision of this community plan and grant this vacation. They are mutually exclusive. Now, I had some slides here. Thank you. Let me just flip through these because I'm satisfied that you're convinced. Some of that drainage testimony was disingenuous. Where do I point this? Just keep in mind the time that you have, sir, if you don't mind. All just right. Well, if, uh, if you could forward it. Let me just say this right here. It's more than a puddle. You can leave it there. We all have rights in this country, but no one's rights exist to the extent that they diminish the rights of others. And these aren't property rights here. They're asking the county to grant land to absolve them of their own bad acts at deeply unfavorable terms to the county so that they may then extinguish the rights of others in closing the Pinellas Trail. All right, the comprehensive plan and this Palm Harbor plan is an implied right and it applies this vision that we have of community is equally available to all of us. That's what needs to be protected. Specifically, you need to protect the right of a parent west on Illinois that they're able to watch their child travel safely to the Pinellas Trail just as any parent on any adjacent block could. No evidence has been entered that shows cohesion with the comprehensive plan or the community plan. No evidence has been entered that refutes how the application fails the criteria for vacation defined in Pinellas County Ordinance. This isn't a 50-50 case. The evidence against it is overwhelming. You need to set precedent here for times the margin is close. And precedent says these words and these plans have meaning. These principles are protected. And it's never the case that we grant a benefit to the few at the expense of the many. Now, I was brought to this case out of necessity on the drainage, but I stand here as a member of the Palm Harbor community, an unincorporated area of Pinellas County that relies on this commission for protection, and I ask you follow the comprehensive plan, protect this community plan, adhere to the criteria in Pinellas County Ordinance, and deny this petition. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, are there any other questions from the board? Um, Um, given what we've heard, I'd, I'd, my preference would be that we, if it works out that way, do the bond issue and let the county staff design the drainage problem because they have the bigger issue of the, the larger area that they need to pay attention to. So I would not want to hand over this piece of property and trust a drainage project to a private party. Um. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not, hold on, Commissioner, go ahead. Yes, right um, I don't have a question. I just have a comment that I would uh, like to share is that I cannot in good conscience vote for this um, vacation of this property. I'm co particularly concerned about, it's been mentioned several times, the fact that the Petitioners knew years ago that they were improving in an area that they were not allowed to do, number one. And number two, I was struck by the comments about the fact that it, um, it, uh, there was a safety issue in one aspect of this um, issue. And because we are the, it's county oh, property oh, oh, oh. that makes us somewhat liable as well. In, in my head, I just think it's a right for bad things to happen. Is that what you so needed me for? I'm not going to vote for it tonight. Charlie, Thank you. you. For anything other than that. Okay. Um, j just so you, you had four minutes left, did you need to use any of your time? I just want to make sure because I didn't want to. I'd like to thank the commission for your time. You've looked at this very closely. 
you have two options in front of you. One is the bond. We're happy to move forward in any direction the commission may so incline. Okay. And thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all questions answered. Uh, sure. What is the will of the commission? Oh, Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, yeah. Commissioner Seal has um, raised her hand. Uh, sorry, Commissioner Seal. Oh, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> I. Um, are you ready for a motion? Um, yeah, I was, that's where I was going. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would move to deny the request and to um, further um, re require the removal of all encroachments in the Ninth Street right of way um, and to require a bond for the removal of all encroachments in the Illinois Avenue right of way in the future. Um, and um, that the Mullers will still have to construct a trail connection at 9th Street in consideration of their enjoyment <clears throat> of this property until future drainage is constructed. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Commissioner C. May I, may I add a bit more to it? I really want the county staff to think about the fact that the trees and this encroachment could be there for another 10 years. And as mentioned by Commissioner Gerard, we, if it continues to grow, we need to take that into account as far as how much the bond should be. It needs to be priced appropriately. Is that all, Commissioner Seal? Okay. Yes. And Commissioner uh, Long was the second. Um, anything? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, um, well, it, it, I'll support the motion, but um, and when we met, I guess, last summer, it was clear that the commission had a lot of concerns about the, the property and, and the encroachment. And it was, it was stated at that meeting in June, just give us one more chance, one more opportunity to work with staff, see if we can't find and, and we've had that time now, uh, another six, seven months of opportunity. And um, I don't believe the Mullers were like ill-intended at the beginning of this thing to mm -hmm. try and steal land or anything like that. It just kind of snowballed into where the position where we're at today. Um, I typically like to think that when a resident applies for something like this, we try and find a way to say yes. And I'm sorry, we just couldn't get there tonight. Any, any other? comments uh, here. Mr. Chair, if, if I could interject, um, I understand Commissioner's point with her motion. I would caution against requiring the construction of any sort of trail access in association with this. Um, there is trail access, it appears there at the end of, I guess it's Illinois and I'll somebody on staff correct me, um, but I would caution against requiring um, that sort of improvement with the action that you're taking tonight. And the reason you'd caution that is why? We're denying it and we're essentially requiring um, the applicants to construction improvement where we're denying the request for essentially kind of like a permit, I'll say. Okay. Um, often we see these things attached to permit conditions when things are granted, um, but here you're denying it and imposing some additional um, conditions. And it does appear, I know that the trail access that's existing may not look the most inviting, um, but perhaps you know that, that it is still there nonetheless it does remain um so i, I think would i think commissioner seal's point was that they were going to continue to utilize uh right of way exclusively for the next five mm -hmm. years ten years or sure. whatever so that was the and that would be implicit in it in it being retained as public right of way okay well that was i mean i think that was her point about okay. the access can we ask somehow that they clear a better path to the to the existing yes. access, because really? Okay. That's what I was gonna say. If they're not gonna be able to improve the access along Illinois and really clear the brush, I know there's a koi pond right there, so I don't know how they're going to make it wide enough to really truly make it accessible. So I don't know, I'll take that out of my motion, but then they may wanna work with staff on, if they still wanna keep their trees and their koi pond, they may have to work on something else. And um, as far as notification goes, um, I'm just assuming that it eventually it's going to get into the six-year CIP and so that 
the staff will staff's responsibility will be to notify them when it enters the CIP and to give them at least two years notice given the the time where you're, you're under design so so when it, we enter into the design process and they would notify them then but I know but how much time at that point at least another year after that I mean I, I it, it I think Kelly said that it would be a year or two so depending upon where they're at but it, it, it would give them at least a year all right well they need to work out the, the those debt those dates do we need to be more specific in this motion at all? No. I, I don't think so. I mean, the CIP and what I heard Kelly state is that, you know, it would be programmed into the six-year plan. So I don't know all the specifics, and I'm not going to, you know, presuppose to know Kelly's job. Um, but I have to believe there's going to be ample room in there for pretty, pretty there, sufficient notice. Well, and that's why I was saying at least two years, because if you, unless they come to say next year, six-year plan, it's in next year. You know they could do that and then you say well the design starts and now the clock starts so yeah. i'm just trying to be a little bit more reasonable <coughs> we'll but, be fair with that but you know yeah. how normally you get funding yeah, I, I, and yeah. then you get to design and, and, and if i could offer up one other suggestion Jesus you may and and i see commissioner seal with her hand <laughs> up i don't want to interrupt but she's already made part of her motion to remove the i understand i guess i'll yes. call the encumbrances along ninth avenue perhaps what you all could designate is the removal of some of the vegetation that appears to be the impediment to the trail access on Illinois on Illinois which we, which would be where the bond would be and that's what my um, amendment to my emotion was going to be is exactly what Jewel said okay does everybody get that are you clear okay yes microphone Okay, that's so I can speak to the motion. Does this motion also then give them the ability to get a CO for the new structure? Yeah, that was, yes. That is my understanding, I just, I'm and just I'll look for Blake sure. to nod. My I, understanding was the point of the bond yes. was to allow the release I just of the wanted CO. To, yeah. Yeah, the I just wanted be, to make sure. The bond would be the release for the CO, but I want to get Blake to I just wanted that. to make sure it was. And then my further understanding is that the vegetation along 9th would come out more immediately and, and, that, and that a path to the trail would be more immediate, but that the bond would be for the remainder of the vegetation on Illinois. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our expectation would be that the vegetation and, and hardscape improvements on 9th are removed prior to the CO. The bond is in place with the comment about the escalating value associated with it and that the trail access, the vegetation that is somehow overgrowing be scaled back or addressed. So if we can achieve those th three things, then we can move forward with the issuance of the certificate of occupancy once it's passed all the final building inspections. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that was still somewhere in there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you were, you were fine with the amendment. Okay, I think we've got that on the table. And we have no more comments here in house. Do you want to check? So at this time, if any member of the public would like to comment on agenda item number 39 virtually, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone. I got it. I hear you, Commissioner Seal. And the only person who's raised their hand is Commissioner Seal. There isn't any members of the public. Say no to her. Say. No. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Seal. Go ahead. Very briefly. You know, and the positive part of this is they do get the enjoyment until we build the drainage situation. So I think that this is a when we could be requiring that everything come out now. Thank you. Okay. Are we good? Is, is there okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Is there a way to restate the motion for the record? Just because there was a lot of conversation. Oh, that was e I know. It's easier said than done. I know. I just want to make sure that <laughs> well, we get was, it very yeah, clear in the minutes. Yeah. There was three requirements, I think. One was the removal of the vegetation or whatever on Ninth Street, right? Uh, removal or a bond for the improvements in the right of way on Illinois. And the improve or the widening or clearing of the area of, uh, for trail access at the end of Illinois. Um, and Blake's coming to clean it up even more. So, only point of clarification I'd like to make is that on 9th Street, it includes not only landscaping but the hardscape. So, anything that encroaches into the right of way. Yeah, any encroachments 
that's better said. Any encroachments on Ninth Street? Commissioner Seal, is that good? Yes. Commissioner Long, good. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The petition or the request was denied with thank those stipulations. You. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, thank you. Okay. And I was just wrapping it up like I'm finished. Uh, anything else from the commission? Want to stay a little longer? We are adjourned. Thank you.